and welcome to Stop Booking Around. I'm John Cronshaw. And I'm Russell Evans. We are going to be embarking on an experiment. I'm an author. I've published four books under my own name and another novel under a pen name. Russ is an aspiring author who's not written a damn thing. Um, (laughs) So the point of this show is basically I'm going to drag him through the process of being an aspiring author to being a published writer. You up for the challenge, Russ? I am indeed. I need something to do with my life. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) Let's do this. So until next time, cheerio. Until next time. Bye. to stop booking around i'm john cronshaw and i'm russell evans and um, we are here to embark on an experiment russ you're an aspiring writer you've been talking about writing a book for bloody years <laughs> so i want to get you to start writing this book you've accepted my challenge to do this we're going to make it public we're going to make you accountable <laughs> and we're going to do this we should start off by telling the listeners what you've done so far What's been your path and what has been your journey as a writer? So my writing journey so far has been a 10-year period of feeling like I've got a really good idea that I'd really like to write into a story. And occasionally when the mood strikes me, making notes or thinking about it or doing a little bit of character development, but nothing actually practical or useful that would get me really that much closer to writing a book. I've had a couple of starts uh, throughout the years, all which seem to have been in some way sabotaged by either myself or by just uh, the fickle finger of fate. So here I am with an almost fully formed idea and world and set of characters in my head, yet nothing really to show for it. Well, you have. You've got characters, you've got a world. You've told me about the idea, and it is a really good idea. I think that your issue is focus, motivation, and just having the, what's the word, the kind of clarity, I suppose, to just keep on with this project and see it through to the end. It's hard to write a novel. The hardest bit is your first draft. Hmm. And a lot of people don't get to that point. And I think what's really important for you in this process is going to be to get you to the end of a first draft, even if it's a load of shit even if it's just the worst (laughs) piece of crap you know it's it's easier to work with something that's complete that you've got to the end of than to try and flail around abandoning projects and getting into bad habits where you start something don't start something (laughs) give up on things like the worst thing you can do as a writer is abandon a project before you finished it because it's getting too hard i think my biggest problem was always one of i think a lot of people who want to be artistic or creative or any kind of project, which is, I just want to do it right first time. You know, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to draw this drawing in one go without sketching <laughs> or thinking about it. Or, you know, I'm, I'm going to write this <laughs> several hundred page book with full of characters and arcs and interesting settings, but I'm just going to do it in one go. Yeah, um, I think I've fallen prey to that sort of fallacy. It is a myth. It is a myth. Yeah, but- completely. This stuff doesn't come from nowhere. You know what I mean? It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of graft. Writing, art, anything like that, if you're going to do it well, it's a craft that you have to work on. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It doesn't come from, from nothing. You've got the ideas. Getting the ideas is one of the hardest things. Getting a good idea and then developing it, that's the challenge. And then continuing with that. And I think you have identified something really important. An artist works from a sketch you need to have a foundation. And I think that's one thing that I want to teach you to do with this process is you're not going to dive in straight away and write a novel. That's what's known in writing circles as pantsing. You know, you're writing on the seat of your pants. Yeah. No direction. You're almost writing it on the fly. Some people can do that and some people do it really well. A lot of people don't. So I'm going to teach you how to outline. I'm going to teach you how to get a grasp of your story before you sit down and write a word. I want you to know your characters' voices before you start writing. And I think if you've got that, if you know that it's working as a story before you write it, if you're hitting all the you know essential beats that you need for a story to work, I'll teach you about those. 
you'll be on a much better position than someone who's just thinking, right, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write a novel. And <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's hard. And pe- that's what people do. People do sit down and think, I've read a thousand books yeah. in my life. I can do that. Well, that's certainly what I did at first. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, because you realise, actually, this is <laughs> a lot more difficult than people think. Like, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people over the years who, you know, I've mentioned that I'm a writer and, you know, they'll go, oh, I've got an idea for a book. I, I want to write a book. And, you know, you're one of those people. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's there's that kind of thing of having the idea and the story to you know that's in your head and then a really different thing to commit to writing it yeah and you're, you know if you do follow this through then you're going to be right doing it in a really public way in a way that's accountable and i'm hoping that that extra motivation and the stuff that i'm going to kind of guide you through all <laughs> i think so giving me more structure and you know things like deadlines and expectation are important especially to me because I will idle my life away with a thousand good ideas and then be at the end go like, oh, well, at least I had the ideas. But yeah, I, yes, this is, this is what I want. This is what I need. This, this book has been sitting in my head for 10 years now and I need to get it out so that I can put other things in there. And yes, you are the man to help me, John. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I mean, I've, men- I've mentioned, you know, mindset and mm. kind of having the right focus and the right attitude is, is going to be really important in, in this. Um, so I'm going to give you some homework for next week. Okay. There's a book I've sent you. It's on the way. It's called The War of Art by okay. Stephen Pressfield. I want you to read this book and then we'll talk about it next time. Okay. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Excellent. I want to thank you for listening. You can follow me on Twitter. It's at JL Cronshaw. You can find me online. It's johncronshaw.com. That's J-O-N-C-R-O-N-S-H-A-W. I'll put some links in the show notes, and I'll put the link to the Stephen Pressfield book so you can read along. So until next time, cheerio. to stop booking around i'm john cronshaw and i'm russell evans and we are here today to talk about your homework russ last week i got you to read the war of art by stephen pressfield how did you find the book i thought it was a generally good book and i feel that his central idea that underpins his many many words on the subject is solid I recognized a lot of what he was talking about in myself and not just like in writing, but in general, but obviously we'll stick to the writing bit mostly. Um, but well, yes, yeah, not, not go necessarily. On. I, th- I think this is, you know, these mindset things do broaden out into real life. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, he's, he's kind of central concept is this idea of resistance mm. and that there's a lot of things that are essentially stopping you from fulfilling your potential or whatever it's funny because it's like you say it's a lot of things but really what it boils down to in the book is what's stopping you is you and i think that's a message that a lot of people who offer help to people in trying to improve at things um really come down to which is is that you are the only person who's trying to write the book so it's down to you to sort of overcome the things that are stopping you and then he's sort of this idea of resistance where he he's likens it really more to Freud's idea of the death wish, that part of ourselves that sort of abhors living and being positive and surviving and making practical decisions and sort of promoting emotional intelligence, you know, short-term loss, long-term gain. And I am awful for that stuff. (laughs) I have the emotional intelligence of a five-year-old and I would always rather do something that immediately gratifies me than sort of gives me a nice wry smile down the line. So uh, I am going to try and learn from your example, (laughs) practically. (laughs) Uh, But also, yeah, the the book was interesting, really. It did just boil down to this idea of resistance that he talks about, all the different examples, all all the ways that we we procrastinate and essentially sabotage ourselves. I mean, I know that I've tried to write this book, I don't know, four or five times and most of the time I've, I've written the first chapter and 
some part of me just goes, that's enough for now. You'll mm. come back to it. You've, you've written a chapter. That's enough. And then, no, <laughs> no. And then I've subsequently rewritten that chapter about four or five times because I come back to it after, God knows, like from anything from a month to a year later. And then I look at it and go, hmm. No, maybe I'll just change that first chapter again and yeah. start all well, over. And There's two things that I think we'll need to work on, and that's getting you into a routine with writing. I mean, if you wrote 200 words a day, yep. you'll have a, what, a, uh, I don't know, 60,000 words by the end of a year, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and 200 words is nothing. 200 words is, you know, it's uh, 10 sentences, and you can do that. Um, and another thing that we need to do as well is to realise that you don't look back at what you've written until you've written your first draft. So we're going to outline, yeah. we're going to build up, mm. and you're going to write, and you're going to keep looking forward. You're not going to self-edit. Yep. You're just going to write and write and write. You're going to push through to the end of the first draft because once you've got that, then you can do your tinkering. But instead of you going back over the same bit again and again, you're going to be going over a complete novel. Um, <laughs> so, do you see why that's better? Do you see why I that do. works? <laughs> well, so. it's it's sort of like when you're and you're trying to self-edit as you go, you're essentially messing around with the foundations of your house as you're trying to build it. My point is, is that I once you create a whole thing and you can see it from a uh, broader perspective, yeah. it does enable you to make probably more informed edits, conscientious decisions um, yeah. about it. Because as you write it, you don't really know where it's, well, you know where it's going to go, but you don't know what it's going to be like when it's fully formed, especially the first draft. Mm-hmm. And you might come away with better ideas or you might something that you thought worked really well might not. And you might only see that by doing an entire draft first and realising that maybe the arc of your main character actually kind of just maybe fizzles out or is better than you th- thought it would be. Um, so, yeah, very much so. I need I need to do the draft, the, f- the yeah. first draft. And, and the thing is as well, that I, I don't think a lot of people realise this, but actually creating and editing, the two very different skills are required, two different parts of your brain. Mm. Um, so the creative one you get into that mindset you get into that kind of i mean for me when i'm doing it i'm almost in a weird almost meditative state it's really hard to describe but it's like if i stop it sometimes takes me 20 minutes to get back into that zone Mm. whereas editing is more like engineering you're kind of fixing you know you're reshaping Mm. what you've got but if you're doing that at the same time as creating it's a muddle and it's not going to work resistance then i mean what's your resistance then why why haven't you written this book (laughs) the main one is trying to be too perfect and self-editing too much you know i'd write something and i'd take it to somebody a friend or you know probably a mistake to take it to somebody so close as well because normally they're they're always going to be a bit biased yeah and i'd go what do you think of this and oh they'd go well that's good i enjoyed that i'd like to see where that goes I would have my little bit of like, oh, that, that made me feel good. I, I am validated. I, I feel like <laughs> I could do this writing lark. Mm. I'll just put this here for now because I'm going to enjoy feeling good. Because <laughs> you, got, you got your little, uh, you know, I got my little fix. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it is like, oh, wow, I, I can write something and somebody can like it. Yes, mm. author is what I am. No, yeah, yeah it's, I think that's part of it. It's, this, it's definitely some part of it was pure pleasure seeking like uh try and make me feel uh worthwhile and maybe validate my own sense of if i think i'm smart or not which i know you do (laughs) (laughs) yeah well you know there's no point thinking you're dumb um and largely i mean i have other i have other resistances i do um some of them are natural and somewhat out of my control my dyslexia has always made it difficult for me but i think my dyslexia is part of the reason why i love to read and write because I felt as though if that is a natural weakness I have, then I need to combat it and maybe put in more time and effort than someone who doesn't have that problem uh, would have to do in regards to things like reading and writing and being creative. And generally, you know, other other things like I've, I've had some sort of issues with anxiety and depression and, you know, that stuff screws you in terms of trying to have a routine, trying to find motivation and even sort of sometimes in order to have motivation you have to have you have to have a greater sense of self-worth so that you imagine that what you are putting out 
is is worthwhile and during those periods where you're not exactly feeling like you're worth much you, you'd never feel as though anything you would put out would be worth much so these things have kind of come along to trip me up but i would honestly say my my biggest enemy really is just me sort of going i'd like to write something and i'd like people to enjoy it and then i get someone to enjoy it a little bit and i go mm, that's enough for now <laughs> basically there's, there's a couple of things to unpack with that really the first one is Right, we, we're not going to call it your first draft. We're going to call it your shitty first draft, okay? Okay, yeah. So that's what we need to write. We need to write a shitty first draft. Mm-hmm. Um, so then you can get rid of all these pretenses of writing something perfect or writing something good. You're not going to do that. You're going to put out a big pile of shit to the world that's going to be, <laughs> you know, something we can polish. And you can polish a turd, damn it. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's step number one. Right, step number two is, okay, if you're struggling with actual the mechanics of writing i've noticed you've got a headset i think you mentioned that your girlfriend has got dragon dictate yeah um maybe try that maybe see if you can dictate your novel i do that that's how i write my novels yeah i used to write with a keyboard but i found myself being more productive and more focused and having a stronger authorial voice and then the last thing is the mental health stuff and yeah that's that's a big ball ache you know, we've known each other for God, like 25 years, I think. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, and, you know, I've lived with depression for years. And actually, it's almost like the reverse of what you said is I can deal with my depression because it is always there. It's always lurking in the background. Yeah. But I can deal with that because of being able to focus on something in the future that I'm working towards. Yes. And that I can keep being motivated towards because I know, you know, once I've got this project done, I've got another three or four projects that I want to do. And mm. I've, I've always got something else to work towards. And I think the problem with depression is you're always looking back and kind of feeling negative about things that are. Well, you put, happened, you're projecting or, your past into the future, aren't you? You're, yeah, yeah. You're assuming that everything that was will always be. Um, and for me, the future has always been this weirdly ephemeral concept anyway. I've, I've always, I don't really know how to explain it, but I've always found it quite difficult to live beyond sort of today. Yeah. Um, each day is something new and it never feels like part of a continuous thing. Um, and I think that might be down to the fact that I don't have a lot of ongoing projects. I don't have a lot of um, things that are going to take a long time to achieve. Yeah. So sometimes I feel like my perception of the flow of time um, <laughs> is a, is another sort of part of this resistance, if you want to say, that it, it sort of stops me from making plans because I can't I can't conceptualize and uh, believe those plans will and can happen. So having someone like yourself who has and does do that, sort of there sticking your foot up my butt constantly. <laughs> Um, it will help me. And I know that, I mean, really, that's just a mentality. It's just a viewpoint. It's all subjective, really. And if I can train myself to start to see the benefits and start to look for the signifiers that sort of long-term projects are worthwhile and will sort of help me, not just creatively and as a person, but sort of even in just things like my perception of the way I see things and do things, which generally would just be very helpful for me because I know, let's say another part of sort of anxiety and depression is being sort of stuck in a rut or mm. actively moving backwards instead of sort of forging forward in hope that things can be different. This definitely helps with that. And mm. um, I'll tell you why. And it's really simple. You've got a project. You see it through to the end. You can look back and go, okay, a year ago I was here and now I'm here and I've got this to show for it. And it's almost like you, you've got something that's there and then, you know, you, you've put something out in the world that people are reading. Hopefully people like it. That is such an amazing feeling. Like you talk about this little serotonin thing you've had yeah. when you've shown it to people and people go, oh, that's good. You know, imagine when you're getting emails from people just going, oh, you know, I read your book at the right time. Like I had an email from someone who'd read my, I think it was my second novel, which is Night of the Wasteland. And a lot of that is set within a flooded post-apocalyptic city. The person who read it had just literally lost her house in the Houston floods. Oh, wow. 
reading this book and the house had been flooded and she was just like it really moved me it was you know it was it was a brilliant book and it just came at the right time and it filled me with hope when i finished it it's like when you're touching people with something yeah. that you've just kind of plopped out of your head mm. uh, like that is a better feeling than you'll get than someone going oh that's nice <laughs> you know well, what I mean? so, yeah that, that is it that's the thing like i think i'd you know, if I'm honest, you know, if we speak to ego and such, um, I want to put out part of me that is essentially mine and reflective of me. I want to put that into the world. And yeah, I want validation from that. Yeah. But I also, what I want is for people to enjoy it. And it is part ego because I want them to enjoy the thing that I have made. But I want them to enjoy it. That's what I want more than anything. I want to write a story or stories that help people not, you know, uh, f- my best example is I didn't read a book in its entirety until I was 14. I just, I just couldn't, I didn't have the stamina to do it because of my dyslexia. It was a real struggle. And the, the first book I read all the way through was feet of clay by Terry Pratchett. Uh, and I will forever be grateful to Terry Pratchett, not only because his words pulled me through that book made me want to keep reading but because every book he wrote since and before that book have made my life better i've enjoyed them and they've been a small little haven in which i could sort of feel good and feel connected to an author whose ideas i identified with and inspired me to want to be a writer and to want to understand words and literacy and storytelling more and to see and to to talk about the things that I want to talk about and want people to think about but not just in you know direct direct conversation but you know through artistic expression because I am that person I want I, I like to be artistic I like to be creative and I, I want I want my creativity to at least have some effect uh, on myself and other people. You are a creative person. You're not coming at this as someone who's writing, you know, because you want to make money off a book. We became friends because of, you know, links with music. And when we were teenagers, we used to write stories together. And then you went on and did drama. I think, you you know, you did it at university for a while. So, you know, you've always had this kind of need to express yourself in a creative way. And, I think if that doesn't get fulfilled in creative people, it's really damaging. I know myself, if I'm not working, if I'm not writing, if I'm not coming up with ideas or creating something, I get really antsy, I get really twitchy. Um, Mm. And I think if you've been doing that for several years, you know, maybe there is a part of that that is, you know, maybe does kind of link into the mental health issues and things like that. I think so. Um, I think it's like release. I think like yeah. anything, you can't, if you're angry, you need to be angry, you know, sad and happy and so forth and so on. And I think that creativity is, um, it's you trying to express abstract feelings in some way in order to sort of exercise them. So yeah, I think you're probably spot on there that if somebody is not fulfilling their nature, should we say, as much as they could be, I think that then that, that nature can turn inwards and it can become toxic. Uh, and that, that energy that would give you the motivation to sort of to do good and to express yourself instead just sort of festers, turns inward, and that's where you start getting sort of more resistance, the guy, <laughs> which is what we were talking about, resistance. Hey, yeah, yeah. Um, so we've, we've now got a term we can use, so that's good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is why I gave you that its own work. It's, there is a lot of stuff in that book that I roll my eyes at, um, yes. the stuff about the muse, you know, I don't believe at all in the muse. I think the muse is an excuse not to write. Um, there's ideas everywhere. It's about work. It's about just having a routine, doing the work. The muse is, it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's like any kind of spiritual being. It's, it's, you know, if you believe in that kind of thing, you know, all the power to you. If you don't, then it, it doesn't ring with me. I would say with the muse, I've always thought that essentially you can just change that word with the mood. Like, are you in the mood? Yeah. Are you in the mood to write? Do you feel creative? <laughs> are, are you motivated right now? Yeah. Like, and then it, past that, it just becomes, you know, how, how we abstract our feelings, our motivations. You know, some people, I feel like you are very 
you hold yourself responsible for your actions, for your writing. You don't externalize anything and go, ah, oh, I cannot do this because the moon is in the house of Jupiter <laughs> and I need to sit in my garden and have a fag for 10 minutes and then maybe go to the pub and then the muse yeah. will talk to me. It's like, no, you, you know that it's like, well, I need to write today, so I need to write. And I think that this, like you were saying, like the idea of the, of the first shitty draft, um, I think that is... If anything, it's quite a freeing idea because I was trapped by this idea of I want to write it perfectly. I want to write it in one go. And then that is still the same idea as a muse because it's like, oh, well, I want to write it in this perfect state when I feel perfectly inspired to do it. Yeah, right. There's no inspiration. There's no muse. You're not going to write something perfect. Right, just get those out of your head. Mm. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You've You know, you've got your ideas because you've worked on them over the years and, you know, you've allowed stuff to percolate in your subconscious. And then it's just, we need we need to get to the core now of what your story is. And I think this is what we need to do next. I think our next episode, I'm going to give you more homework, Russ. Mm. Um, this is actually really difficult to do. So, you know, we'll come back next time and do this. But I want to just read you something from Take Off Your Pants <laughs> by <laughs> Libby Hulker. It's called The Story Core. Okay. And it's okay, it says every compelling story has the following five elements. A character, the character wants something, but something prevents him from getting what he wants easily, so he struggles against that force and either succeeds or fails. I'll email you that, but that is essentially what you need to think about now with your okay. story. I want you to get to the core and I want you to come up with something like an elevator pitch, just a sentence or two that we can crystallize what your story is about in a really kind of simple way. Maybe even stick this on a post-it note on your monitor or something. Just it's something that you can keep referring back to. Once we've got that, we can talk about main characters and things like that. But we'll, we'll do that over the coming weeks anyway. So yeah, I'll leave you with that for now. For the first time in my life, I think I'm looking forward to doing homework. <laughs> <laughs> right, well... Remember, you can follow me on Twitter. It's at JL Cronshaw. You can visit my website. It's johncronshaw.com. That's J-O-N-C-R-O-N-S-H-A-W. You can check out my new novel called Blind Gambit, which will just be hitting Amazon right now. It's basically, it's a bit like a more up-to-date version of Ready Player One with a lot about disability and visual impairment thrown in just to give it an original twist. So until next time, cheerio. Bye. to the Stop Booking Around podcast. I'm John Cronshaw. I'm Russell Evans. Russell, I gave you some homework last week. I wanted you to give me a very, very long distance, broad overview of what your story is going to be. So I sent you the thing that was the story core from Mm -hmm. Libby Hawker's Take Off Your Pants book. And I wanted you to basically come up with a couple of sentences, an elevator pitch for your book. Have you done that? Yes. Excellent. No naughty step for you today. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm going to be doling out punishments and make them more elaborate, more brutal, the more homework you miss. So, <laughs> try, and, <laughs> try and keep these good. My book is about Theodora Rose Wishart, who must take control of her afterlife in order to save the underworld from the man she trusts the most. How did you find that exercise then? I mean, did it help you crystallize your thoughts about what your story is? Yeah, it does because. The whole idea for the story came from a music video originally. I just liked the imagery in it. And then that imagery grew and grew until it built a world. And then I inserted a protagonist. It's sort of been this uh, very patchwork approach to sort of building this world. So having these points has allowed me to sort of put the world building aside, which is what I enjoy the most, Mm. and really focus on what the reader's experience would be, even if it is fairly high fantasy stuff. I know you've got a kind of background in role-playing games and DMing and things like that. There is a a bit of a term in writer circles that's called world builder's disease, but this is essentially... (laughs) It sounds familiar. uh, Yeah, I'm sure you can relate to it, but it's essentially that, you know, we fall in love with the world we create 
And I think you can get bogged down in this. I think you can almost lose yourself in the world and lose sight of the story. Focusing on the characters and the plot is going to be really important for you. So one of the things I gave you was this story core. Did you manage to fill that out? It is this this challenge of crystallizing things, because while things are still swimming around in your head, you're like, oh, yeah, I know, I've got a general idea. But yeah, just go through the points you sent over. So like, number one, a character. So yes, <laughs> I have my character. <laughs> I have my protagonist. I can see them in my mind's eye and, and how they would react and think and grow in certain situations. I know what my character wants or will eventually want. Part of the journey will be them figuring out what they want. Then the third point is like something prevents them from getting what they want easily, which is in this story it is essentially going to be the state of the world. Point four. So the struggle against that force. Now, I've always loved cartoons, anime, action, larger than life things. So you know, what came to my head when that first saw that, like, so they struggle against that force. So for me, it's like fighting, (laughs) huge, huge fights. And I was like, it really made me stop for a second. I think, well, not all struggles are dynamic and bombastic. I think it's the smaller internal struggles that really endear us to characters. I think a lot of the best authors do that very well. And some of them do it incredibly just on the nose, like uh, uh, Frank Herbert in the Dune series where you are literally seeing the internal or reading the internal struggles of each character instead of it just sort of being shown through their actions. So I know that really, in some ways, the biggest struggle the character will have will be themselves. And I think that that struggle is the biggest part of the story. And yeah, whether they succeed or fail. And I think that it doesn't matter whether a character succeeds or fails. That's really more about the plot, which in some ways is kind of superfluous to the characters because you might have an amazing plot, but if your characters are just paper cutouts yeah. and stereotypes, um, it doesn't really matter because you, I'm, glad, like, I'm glad that's the conclusion you've drawn because that's really important. <laughs> in terms of that, like the story core and those five questions, I feel like for each one, I don't necessarily have the most crystallized form of that answer yet that I couldn't really succinctly go one, two, three, four, five, here are the answers. But I know what the answers to those questions are in general, and I know how I want them to be implemented in the story. Now you've got your story core, now you've got your elevator pitch. I think we've got a foundation to build on. I think you need to keep these together mm. and just keep kind of referring back to them. You know, you can change them and things like that, but the fact now you've got something to base your story on i think that's going to be really useful so what i want you to do then is draw up a a bit of a character sketch it doesn't have to be amazingly detailed of your protagonist and just for a bit of fun as well i'd like you to think about your character's voice and maybe their actions and you can do this in a bit of a it's kind of a cheating way i guess i don't know if it is i do with my characters what I, i do a thing called casting characters where i will pick a character from a film Say, for example, you know, one of my characters might be based on Tom Hanks in Big. They're not, Mm. but, you know, that would be an example. And then that will help you think about how they look, how they act, how they might respond to things. Yes. Um, And, you know, you don't have to stick rigidly to that, but it's having points to jump off from. The character's been in my head for long enough now. If I can't do it at this point, I might (laughs) as well not make any more podcasts. (laughs) We'll see. We'll see you next week. Um, Okay. I want to thank you for listening. The thing that I want to say now is if you're enjoying this show, please help to spread the word. Share it with an author friend. Share it with someone else who said to you, I've been wanting to write a book for years and I haven't. Hopefully this podcast will give them the motivation. And then once you've done that, if you could leave a review on iTunes, just a few words, five stars, that would be wonderful. It'll help spread the word, get more people listening to the show and hopefully inspired by Russie's ongoing journey, his hero's journey. <laughs> <laughs> Validate me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just wait. Just wait until you hit your all is lost moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, just, uh, you know, part way through the uh, second act. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter. It's at JL Cronshaw. Find me online. It's johncronshaw.com. I've put some links in the show notes to some useful resources. So until next time, cheerio. Bye. Welcome to the Stop Booking Around podcast. I'm John Cronshaw. 
I'm Russell Evans. Last week, I gave you the homework to produce a character profile for your main protagonist. How did you find the exercise? I've had this protagonist in my head for a long time. It was nice, actually. I found it a lot easier than some of the other tasks to write about her and to boil down in some ways who she is. And I think that that made me kind of get to know her a bit better and think about her in some ways that I hadn't before. That's good. I'm just having a look at your file that you've shared with me on uh, Google Docs and I've noticed you've got a picture of Anya Taylor-Joy. Who's she and why is she your casting? Largely, it's, I think her look is, is the main thing. She's somewhat waifish. She's one of these faces that can appear to be very neutral, uh, in some ways wide-eyed. She has a semi otherworldly look, but she's not some elfin beauty. It's not really it's not about her being attractive. It's not about that sort of thing. If you were to just see her in a crowd, you're not gonna go, Wow, oh, that person stands out. She's been in several different films, playing several different roles. I think the two most notable that people might know her for is that she's the protagonist in M. Night Shyamalan's Split, and she is Essentially, the protagonist in uh, a recent film called The Witch, with two Vs instead of a W, uh, in which she sort of plays the daughter of a Puritan family. (laughs) If some time down the line, if there were ever to be a film made of this, then, yeah, her or someone sort of akin to her, you know, the the look of the character is this, she's sort of somewhere between 18 and 25. So you've got role protagonist, and then you've got demeanor, uh, angry, sarcastic, moral, pedantic, nihilistic. I did ask you to write a character profile, not an autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, nature, kind, anxious, insecure, depressed. Yeah, yeah. So age 21. Just based on that bit alone and the fact that you've got this kind of high fantasy setting, and it seems to me that you're going to be writing a kind of young adult, new adult kind of story. Mm. So, personal growth and development or whatever well it's like i said it's about actualization being nothing and making yourself into something which is largely part of growing up as well part of the way i'll use her character is to talk about the effects that anxiety and depression and uh, a lack of self-worth and sort of motivation where they get you and what they can do to you and in some ways what you have to do to get out of them and i'm, I'm going to be using a ridiculous fantasy setting to do that <laughs> You know, calling uh, Evan Russell might not be the best idea. I think we need no. to. No. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> but seriously, though, so you know, you've got the name, what is it? The- Theodora Rose, Rose Wishart. Wishart. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the naming convention of my characters are, are going to be indicative of the fact that this is, this is a fantasy book. And I've always enjoyed well-made fantasy character names. Um, I've always been a, you know, a huge fan of Terry Pratchett's names for his characters, um, ranging from Samuel Vimes to the sort of somewhat ridiculous like Moist von Lipvig, um, <laughs> who are all brilliantly realised characters. And, you know, after a while, you get over the name. The name is an interesting thing. You know, Moist is a brilliant name for a main character. Um, but after a while, you don't keep thinking, ha ha, Moist. You just know that that's his name. And I think that the characters are, are well written enough for you to just accept that. And you stop kind of just looking at thinking the name is ridiculous and you just accept it and you focus more on who they are and what they do. Yeah. Um, it, it will. Her name will eventually be shortened in the story to sort of, you know, Dora. I mean, her background is not special in any way. Her own opinion of herself is literally that she's nothing special. Um, she lived a dreary, boring life. No, no great joys. No great, no great sadnesses. Very sort of cookie cutter. And now she will be injected into this situation. We mentioned last week. I'm just trying to think back now. The core for me with stories is to work out what the character's fatal flaw is almost, what their thing is that they need to work on, that they need to get over in order to progress as a character, in order to have an arc and a story. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you've got that, if you've got your kind of central theme or central core of this character that needs to change. She's just waiting for everything to spin down. There's no real dynamism in her. There's no motivation beyond the basic needs of get up, eat, go to the toilet, drink. Yeah you know, exist. She's allowing herself to just exist. So at this point, I would say your character sounds really boring. <laughs> like, yes. why, why, why would I care? Why would I want to read on with this character if this is what you're presenting? 
in and of herself at the start, it's not her that's interesting. She's like a Harry Potter. Harry Potter as a character isn't particularly interesting. What no, happens not. what happens to Harry is interesting. Mm. She is forced to go through experiences beyond her control and she has to learn to take control. And what I want is to develop her from this sort of almost inanimate object that the world throws around to someone who starts to take control. It's essentially the, the character arc is Dora needs to take control of her existence, of her life. Otherwise, is it a fate worse than death, basically? Yes. There'll definitely be a fate worse than death for her, and it could have further implications for those around her. Okay, so she's got the motivation to do this. She's got the kind of the push. So, yeah, I, I think you've actually come up with a, an interesting thing there because within this character, because you're building from these flaws, you've built in a conflict already. And mm. that's, what, that's what it is. You know, story's about change. It's about conflict. And if you don't have change or you don't have conflict, you don't have a story. So, yeah, we've got that. We've got that built in. That's fantastic. Uh, we mentioned this, I don't know, it was last week or the week before, um, about having... DM syndrome. So I, you know, over my years of playing Dungeons and Dragons or the role playing games, you know, you think up, you think up interesting names for your characters because um, you want those names to, in some way, um, represent them, like the way it sounds or the what maybe nationality it sounds like that um, name comes from. The you know these these things all evoke certain images in people. That's just the like, way sort of like like work. a Herc Braveman, for example. Yes. <laughs> exactly, like the brave spacefaring hero Herc Braveman, um, available uh, at Amazon. <laughs> so, in terms of naming conventions, I was curious with you in ter- and your characters. Do you think of the character and then think of their name, or do you think of a name and then try and think of a character to fit it, or is the truth really more somewhere in between? It depends on the project. I mean, with my wasteland stuff. It, it was about finding the voice of the character more than anything. The voice is really important to me. I want every character in my books to sound distinct. And I'll come up with a name later. You know, mm. sometimes it's my main character in the Wasteland series. When I first started writing that, my first draft of Night of the Wasteland, which was the second Wasteland book, but it's the first one that I wrote, the character was called The Old Man. <laughs> So all the way through, I was just writing the old man, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then I think it was just because of really liking the kind of biblical imagery and the kind of symbolism with Abel as a character that I changed it to Abel. Yes. Um, so I had Abel as the character, but that didn't come first. I had to really write in that character. I had to get to know his voice. And he wasn't an old man. This is the thing. It's like I wrote him as an old man. Yeah. Calling him an old man, but he wasn't an old man. He, you know, his actions spoke of someone who was maybe in their 30s. <laughs> so, yeah, I, that changed, and I think it changed for the better. The one character that I had in mind for the series, who's a bit of a mentor figure for Abel, I did come up with the name first. Her name's Sal, short for salvation. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's his naming for like on the nose. And so she's a priest, and she helps him to get through drug addiction and to kind of find a purpose and hope in this terrible world that's a post-apocalyptic wasteland. And as the series goes on, that kind of develops more into a romantic kind of thing. Now, with my Blind Gambit books, the names were drawn up as kind of brainstorms because a lot of the names are handles. They use names like in a video game because Blind Gambit's set in a video game world. And so I've got names like Rhymed with Peanut, which is a <laughs> reference to... Princess Bride, and I've got Aerith Lives, which is you know, Final <laughs> Fantasy VII. I've got Epona, so it's like E P W N A. Yeah. So it's you know Epona, as in uh, you know the mythological horse and Zelda, and then obviously Pwned, which is you know it's all kind of yeah mashing, mashing together cultural things. So and then from that character, you know, because of that he dresses like Link, and he kind of speaks in a very particular way, and my main character i had his username straight away i had new romantic but it was neuro spelt as in like neuro oh romantic. yeah <laughs> so again you know i like the pun and i like the play of that you know he likes 80s music he likes william gibson so mm-hmm. yeah, that all kind of fuses together so i want to give you some more homework Ross. <laughs> <laughs> next week i want you to do the same thing for your main protagonist now I- i'm just trying to think last time we spoke we talked about your kind of story core you were 
vague on what your protagonist is or was. It seemed that it was kind of society, maybe. I don't know. But you need to come up with some kind of central bad guy. It can be someone who becomes an antagonist, you know, over time, but someone who can be a bit of a focus for the series or novel, whatever you're writing. I mean, we'll Mm. talk about that. (laughs) What you're actually going to be writing once you start getting down to the nitty gritty of things. Thank you for listening. If you could share this with an author friend or someone who you think is interested in writing a novel but doesn't have the motivation or is looking for an excuse to do anything but do that, point them towards this. They can follow along with Russ's journey. If you can leave a review on iTunes, that would be really helpful. Help spread the word about this. And you can follow me on Twitter. It's at JL Cronshaw. My website's johncronshaw.com. It's J-O-N-C-R-O-N-S-H-A-W. Now, if you want to email me, it's john at johncronshaw.com. So if you've got something you want to say for me or Russ, just email me and we'll talk about it on the show. So until next time, cheerio. Bye. Stop Booking Around podcast. I'm John Cronshaw. I'm Russell Evans. Last week, I gave Russell some homework. Are you, are you on the naughty step or have you, have no, you done I the did, homework? I did my homework. Yay! Well, <laughs> I think you've done more homework here than you did at your entire time at secondary school. So, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> well done, you. Well Thank done you. you. We went over your protagonist last week. This time, we want to go over your antagonist. So, this is your bad guy. This is, you know, the person who is going to be pushing against your protagonist as the story progresses. How did you find that? When I first started coming up with the idea for the story, I didn't have an antagonist. I had the beginning of the story. I had the the images condensed onto a page and the the characters sort of came in service of that. This character in particular became the best candidate in my eyes for an antagonist. And I feel like it would be an antagonist that would matter. It wouldn't just be like, he's the bad guy. Uh, we said before, every villain is the hero of their own story. They have, they have a purpose that they care about. And you can understand, you can, you can see their motivations, but obviously the problem tends to be their methods. Inigo Serpieri is his name. He won't start off as the antagonist, at least not obviously. He will be a mentor at first. This is interesting. I'm, I'm just having a look at the sheet you did on Google Docs that you shared. And I like this. You've got demeanor, calm, lighthearted, kind, stern, powerful, nature, suicidal, amoral, manipulative, angry, age 425. So <laughs> <laughs> this is a character I'm interested in already now. So. Uh, in Yego's experience was insanely traumatic to the point at which left him broken and very much far away from who he was. This world has a means of dealing with that and he was essentially rehabilitated and brought back to his real self, his original self. And for the longest time, that's who he was. He was this calm, light-hearted, kind, stern, and this is the person that you would want to teach you. But again, because of the nature of the world, and as you can see by his age, the natural fear of death goes away, and you have a hell of a lot of time to ruminate on the past. In some ways, he's sociopathic at this point. It sounds like a really kind of rounded character then. You know, you've done the casting as well. Tell me about this guy. (laughs) So it's uh, Javier Bardem, who I think is a wonderful, wonderful Hispanic actor. This character's a Hispanic character. He comes from Spain. He was the villain in uh, No Country for Old Men in yeah. which he played a psychopath. He, he was fantastic in that. And he was absolutely was, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, he was genuinely scary by not doing much as well. He wasn't a uh, an over-the-top character. Not at all. He, he was just, very flat and just, yeah. this is what I'm going to do and this is why. And yeah, and he's... It's terrific. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, and his, his menace came from his purpose. Yeah. And again, you got the feeling that that character didn't look at themselves as evil or good and they were just purely amoral. And they were just doing what they were doing. Um, and that's where the fear of it comes from, because then you don't quite know what they're going to do. 
really what I want for him is that he is this character where it doesn't take much for him to be seen in a menacing light, but I want the readers to enjoy him as a character so much so that they don't really pay attention to that. You're going to be doing something quite sophisticated with this in a way. One of the main things that I'm thinking is if you're telling the story all the way through from Dora's perspective and the reader's kind of along with her, seeing the world through her eyes almost, you know, they're going to experience this guy, this mentor, this then antagonist through her eyes. Like you're going to be kind of sucked along with the charm as well and you're going to like him. And I suppose when the kind of turn or, you know, the gradual development thing does come, I mean, it's that thing, isn't it? I mean, I think it's been debunked as a bit of a myth, but, you know, it still stands the idea of the, if you put a frog in a, um, yes. You know, I think of warm water and you keep heating it up and heating it up like it won't notice the transition. Like, I think that's quite an interesting thing to play with, especially with a an antagonist character where you turn around and suddenly you're like, when did you become like this? When did this happen? And I'm hoping there should be a point within the story mm. where that realisation is going to dawn on Dora and something is going to flip where she realises actually this isn't right. I'm the only one who can do something or... Yeah, I think it is. It's because you, you buy into them and you buy into them because the main character buys into them. And if you can, if I can write that well enough, that that will be one of the main crooks of the of the yeah. story is the sort of the relationship, uh, how it changes between the protagonist and the antagonist. And I, I, I find myself inspired by a lot of uh, Japanese fiction the Japanese have a very interesting history of writing stories about the struggle between the mentor and the student. Uh, I've seen so many great works where the mentor turns out to be the bad guy and because of the way it's written and the way it's done, you don't see it coming. And I know I'm, I'm giving it away now, so anybody that it listens it to this... It doesn't matter. In a way, this isn't about your story. This is about you getting mm. your, your book written. So the people who are hopefully listening to this We'll be along with you. They'll be cheering you on. I'm cheering you on. I want you to do this and we want you to finish the book. I think you've got a solid main character. I think you've got a solid antagonist. I'm actually going to give you some homework now for next week. You're going to do some writing. We've spoken about what do you need to do with writing? What's the key? It's getting to the end, right? Yeah. Okay. So just, I want you to basically finish a piece. Now this can be a short story. It's essentially a scene that you're doing. Yeah. Right. You've got your antagonist. You've got mm. your protagonist. Yeah. So you've got Inyego. And you've got Dora, they're trapped in a lift together. They can't get out. Right, that scene. Okay. It doesn't have to be used with anything. We're not doing this for this. This is so you can get the characters' voices fixed and so you can get their reactions fixed because people in who are trapped in a lift will react in different ways. And if you're trapped in a lift with someone else together, you know, one person might be panicking the other might be going, look, let's sort this out. Or there's uh, so many different ways you can frame this. And I want you to think about these characters, how they deal with that. And then I want you to write something that's at least 500 words, preferably a little bit longer, but just write it, finish mm. it, and then go back and tweak the words if you want to. But the key is to get to the end without looking back. Okay. So does that I think sound good? Do that. Yeah, I think it's going to be a weird experience because, as we mentioned before, I have this, I really do have this habit of like editing as I go because yeah. I don't want to look at what I've written and cringe, but I think that the cringe is an important part of the process. The cringe is the <laughs> bit that you do when you're finished. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, <laughs> instead of it being like this, oh, I'm not, I don't want to look back on what I've written and cringe, which yeah. is sort of an ego thing, really. What I need to be able to do is, like you said, just write it get it done don't don't worry about how it's going to make me cringe because it probably will but it's better yeah. to just do it all in one go and then <laughs> get all the cringing done after that yeah um, so then you can improve it and you know what when you don't need to show this to anyone this isn't going to be in your book but this is a necessary exercise because number one you need to learn what your characters sound like you need to learn how your characters react you know when you're writing them you might find something about the character that you didn't know about that was buried within your subconscious that'll come out when you do exercises like this. And most importantly, you need to finish something, right? So you mm. need to finish this. You need to get this first draft of this written by next week. So that's your homework, Russ. Okay. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Excellent. Remember, if you are enjoying this show, please do share it with one of your friends, an author friend, or someone who's an aspiring writer who maybe needs a bit of a kick up the backside to get their book done. 
If you've not done so already, could you please leave a review on iTunes? This will help spread the word about the podcast and get more people cheering Russ on. You can send messages to Russ by emailing me. It's john at johncronshaw.com. So that's J-O-N-C-R-O-N-S-H-A-W. I want him to feel encouraged. I want him to feel motivated. And I want him to feel accountable. Because if he doesn't get this done, he's making everybody else down. <laughs> um, feel, feel free to tell me you're disappointed with my yeah. progress and I'll try harder. <laughs> or you can tweet me. It's at JL Cronshaw. So until next time, cheerio. Bye. To the Stop Booking Around podcast. I'm John Cronshaw. And I'm Russell Evans. Last week I gave Russ the challenge to basically start writing. We looked at your antagonist, your protagonist. My thought was, let's put these characters together and see what we come up with. The thing that I chose for you to do was to have them trapped in a lift together. You know, it's the way they talk to each other and respond is what I was looking for. It's not a thing that's going to be in your novel. But it's just a nice little scene to get you used to writing something, finishing something, and to have your characters' voices and the way they react to each other coming through. How did you find the exercise? It was kind of difficult at first, to be honest with you, because the story isn't set in any kind of particular modern setting or even real-world setting. So when you said elevator, I was like, well... How do I write these characters into this setting for just purely their sort of responses? And I I honestly found that difficult. So I instead still kept the same scenario, but I set it in the fiction. I was writing it and I was like, oh, yeah, this could actually be like in the story. I don't know if it will, but it's a it's a kind of like a little moment, a sort of a crystallization of how the two characters look at things and the main problem that the protagonist has to face, which is obviously her effect on her surroundings because of her sort of inherent nihilism. Yeah. So I think one of the key themes that's coming out here is the idea of trust. I mean, mm. is that, I take it that's a kind of big thing within your story. For the main character, it is because her sort of life previous to this She didn't find a lot of trust. She wasn't greatly betrayed by people, but she never felt like anybody really gave her a a reason to trust them. The writing is fine. I think, you know, you've got a lot to work with here. I'm just looking through it now. And one thing that has struck me is you're a new writer. So the idea of head hopping might not be a, a thing you're aware of. And I know basically Frank Herbert does this and... He's about the only person who can do it well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, like, you know, in, in you, it seems from the start, you're from, um, is it in Diego's perspective? Mm-hmm. Because you're talking about what he knows, and then later on, you're from um, Theodora's perspective. And it's like, basically, you need to pick a side. You need to have it from one character's perspective. Now, you can do what someone like Terry Pratchett does, which is you'll have a scene. And you'll come to a scene break and then you'll switch perspective. But if you notice what Terry Pratchett does, he'll always stick in every scene with one character's perspective, their thoughts. Mm. And you don't hear what the other person's thinking. Um, okay. Now, you you might do in the next scene. You might do it after a scene break. But it will muddy it. It will make it confusing for the reader if all of a sudden you're... Because you're like, oh, I thought this was about him. Or, you know, it's like establishing who your point of view character is and making it a strong voice, that's going to help your story more than kind of hopping around, keep it simple. I've mentioned this elsewhere. You read one of my early attempts uh, a few years ago now called The Slip, which when I was writing it, you know, it had like 13 point of view characters and it was a bit of a mess because it lacked the focus and lacked that kind of central thing. And I had all these different stories and different ideas that I wanted to throw at it. And I ended up having a, a realisation moment where I said to myself, right, I need to write a story that's got one point of view character that's told in a linear way. I didn't have the skills to write what I envisaged for the slip. I wanted to write a Game of Thrones, basically Game of Thrones in space. Just, <laughs> you know, and had all these big ideas and I couldn't handle it because I wasn't that good. And I'm still not that good. It might be a story I come back to in a few years, but 
at the minute I'm now just kind of venturing into flipping between two different major settings you know I'm still at an early phase even though you know I'm about to embark on my fifth novel and I think the more I get through and complete projects the more I can kind of start experimenting and start expanding what I'm doing. I think for me when when I was writing this it was partly the brief you gave me but it's also partly, I think it's the, the want for readers to understand your characters. Um, yeah. You know, you don't always have to see the internal workings of a character to understand them. You know, it's, it's their actions, really, that can really define them. And also, if you're trying to, I suppose, like I'm trying to do, where I'm sort of writing a character that's going to take a major, uh, well, uh, an antagonist who, you know, is going to take a major heel turn at some point it's better not to maybe signpost how they think and feel too much so that when when it does happen you've got more of a chance to talk about it instead of it just be like oh yes i saw that all along what you want really is there's a there's a great term that's used in film and it's surprising but inevitable it's yeah. like you don't want it to be oh, i mean what's his name the guy the guy who did the sixth sense and films like oh that, yeah you know M. Night um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like, I find his way of doing the twist, the surprise, like, really heavy-handed and really clumsy. <laughs> it's not story to me. That's just like, oh, look, it's a thing. And then when you go back to it, it might reward a second watch, but then there's nothing else to it beyond the twist. Everything he seems to do does seem to, like, be about leading up to the twist. Like, the heel turn again, it's kind of a, a bit of a, a clumsy way of doing things, like the shock <laughs> oh no, he's really the bad guy, kind of yeah. pull off the mask or whatever. You need it to be an inevitable thing. So it needs to be, if he carries on in this direction, and it could happen like this, or it could, like, it, it's got different branches that it could go on. Yes. And there's got to be a point of no return where, you know, maybe the character has a realization that, oh dear, they're going down this bad path. You know, it's like people tolerated the Nazis in Germany. And, okay, if you follow this through with what we know now, then, yeah, we know that it does inevitably lead to the Holocaust. Yeah. But people didn't know that and wouldn't have been able to see that in the early 30s. It's the same way you need to think about your antagonist is the seeds have got to be there. Mm. And it could be a thing as well where, okay, a careful reader will see them maybe a quarter of the way through. You know, it's obvious there's no doubt at three quarters of the way through, something like that where you need it there, you need it to build up and yeah. not to be just a good sudden flip of a switch because then you're just going to have an unrealistic character. You need this kind of depth and mm. uh, progression. Progression is really important. I have Inigo's arc as a character planned out, not in detail, obviously, because there's going to be certain events along the way that he will use or take advantage of to further his agenda, which is going to be ending the underworld because he still continues to exist when he doesn't want to. Have you watched Breaking Bad? <laughs> I, I have indeed watched Breaking Bad. Um, okay. He's not quite a Walter White. He's no, not. But, but the, the kind of, you know what I was saying about the surprising yet inevitable, his rise from being a school teacher who needs some money and makes mm-hmm. a bit of cash on the side to being, you know, basically a drug overlord. And each little thing of shedding his moral fibre, making compromise, making sacrifices or something against his own person. You know, if you can get even close to that level of storytelling, you're going to do something good. So, <laughs> well, let's take Walter White as a character. Like he does what he does, obviously uh, out of desperation. It also becomes like an ego thing as a character because he's been quite trod on. But then there's also the question of like, well, did he allow himself to be trodden on? And you know, a lot of these decisions actually his, and he's just bitter. Whereas with Inigo, he's had hundreds, like literally hundreds of years for this feeling to fester, and it's not until he meets. Theodora and witnesses what she's capable of and then realizes that maybe there's an opportunity here for him to to change things and using Theodora he sort of will, he'll ga- he gains political power and eventually sort of um, takes the the highest position of power in the underworld and from there he uses that power to enact his plan and as much as I do love just a straight up like evil villain, good people that end up doing terrible things are better villains. They're more um, interesting, aren't they? Because yeah. it's it's all of us and we've all got that potential, we've all got that darkness within us. That's what stories are for, they're lessons and you know, it's like <laughs> you can choose this way or you can choose that way and 
this is what happens when you choose this way. Yeah. But, I mean, with these exercises, then, do you feel now that you've you've almost got closer to your characters because you know you've almost put some flesh on the bones and you've got them to talk and you know you've actually done something with them rather than them just kind of floating around in a nebulous form in your head? Yeah, but yeah, I definitely sort of wrote out some dialogue and i was like no no that, that's just it just feels like a conversation it just feels generic and then i thought more about dialect you know in Diego being he's being spanish being from like the time of about halfway through the the inquisitions and then sort of thinking about that and then adding x amount of hundred of years of him being around the culture of the underworld his language and his choice of words there's not much abbreviation order in which he uses words so i had to stand there in my head and sort of think about like latin or spanish characters i've read or watched and think about how they speak the order in which they put words then in comparison to that you've got theodora who is from the modern era who does abbreviate her words who says yeah instead of yes and and things like that so when i gave them their sort of voices and they started to speak properly with the right words and the right dialects, the interplay between them became sort of more more obvious. And it's you know it's something you've seen time and time again. You've got the the formal master and the informal student. I, I've literally just, I was just thinking here, it's that sort of in Kill Bill Two when you've got um, Beatrix and and Pi May, and they're they're another sort of example of this situation or slightly more abusive but um in the so far that she's sort of like a modern woman and he's like this almost ancient chinese guy who according to the stories that bill tells could be you know x amount 100 years old he's just kept alive by kung fu magic well like when two characters contrast they end up i feel like learning from each other or picking up things from each other which tends to make them more endearing as a pair and then so obviously when something comes between them uh, or one decides to sort of move in a direction that the other doesn't there is i think there is more of a conflict i mean it's good that you're thinking along the lines of okay this is his background this is her background it's going to affect the speech and really you can get rid of all the dialogue tags you can get rid of all the actions and when you know you've got a strong character voice you can just literally put lines of the character and go right that's him that's her that's him that's her and you should be able to identify them without having any of the other signifiers. So I think I think that's really effective what you've done with that. So for next week, I think we need to think about who this book is for. I do apologise that we're not diving right in yet to write in your epic, but <laughs> I think I hope what you're seeing is, you know, what I'm doing now is I'm kind of giving you the groundwork just to give you a firm basis for your story. And I think other authors can benefit from doing this kind of thing as well, where... You know, you've thought about your elevator pitch, you've thought about your story core, you've thought about who your main characters are, what their motivations are, what they sound like, and you've not written a word towards your story yet. You haven't outlined yet. You haven't done anything like that. But it's all slowly starting to solidify what you need to do. Uh, so next time, I want you to think about your audience and I want you to do this in a way almost like you did with your character profiles. I want you to make a character profile almost of who is your ideal reader and i think once you've got that it will help you on a deeper level think about who you're writing for because you need to get out of this mindset of i'm writing this book for myself because when you do that you will drift into self-indulgence and you'll probably end up writing something that's a bit crap (laughs) Um, so when you start thinking right i'm writing something that is going to touch someone it is going to entertain someone who is that person think you can do that for next week I think I can. Awesome. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter. It's at JL Cronshaw. If you want to email the show, it's john at johncronshaw.com. That's J-O-N-C-R-O-N-S-H-A-W. We now have a Facebook group. Just search for Stop Booking Around. We'll have some writing stuff and have some banter on there. Maybe ask Russell questions, give him advice, that kind of thing. So until next time, cheerio. Bye. to stop booking around. I'm John Cronshaw. I'm Russell Evans. 
I gave Russ the task of working out who his ideal reader is. One thing that's important, I think, for authors, and I think a lot of authors do miss this out, is we need to know who we're writing for so we don't write self-indulgent crap. Mm-hmm. So how did you find the exercise? I was like, who's this for specific and who's this for in general? So I, I started off general and I thought about the age range and I thought about my protagonist and you know her age is never really fully given, but it's obvious that she's probably in her sort of early to mid 20s, but she's not a particularly mature character. She's not like a young go-getter or anything like that. Someone on the sort of the cusp of what we'd consider maybe like proper maturity or adulthood where they're responsible and they're working and this and that, whatever. Mid-teens to sort of early 20s, I was thinking of the age for the target audience. So Um, so firmly within the kind of young adult. mm -hmm. If you're going to write it for someone, a type of person I also thought about as well. And, you know, because the main character in some ways is going to be a exploration of anxiety and depression, but in an almost abstract way because of her environment and how her her issues sort of externalize themselves in somewhat beyond her control. And I know, you know, things like depression and anxiety are on the rise. And I think there are a lot of people out there at a young age who are feeling the effects and don't know how to take control of their lives. All they see is how what they do sort of has a negative impact on themselves and others. And, you know, sort of along with depression and such like that, you often get ideas of low self-worth. And I wanted Dora to be emblematic of, of that journey and that struggle. Obviously, though, in a sort of crazy undead fantasy world instead though just you know a little bit of levity so we've got well obviously fantasy fans to start with and from what i can gather about your story i think we're talking at the almost like the philip pullman kind of style yeah is it, is it pu- it's not purely going to be a young adult book is it? it's it's going to be able to work with different age groups i feel if we reference philip pullman's books his books contain dozens of characters from different like ages and different backgrounds and they're all written well and they can all be identified with i feel by people maybe in similar situations and of those ages and so it's going to have concepts in it that are maybe older and more mature than the target audience but i think that they are ideas that anybody of of a reasonable age can look at and identify with so we're kind of looking at maybe a female reader yeah maybe with issues or things to do with mental illness we've got the fantasy element yeah obviously the age is coming into adulthood yeah you know you've got a few different things there that are useful to aim at i think that's really useful do you think it's useful now to almost have that picture in your head of this is the person I'm writing for. I do. I think it could also be a bit of a rod for my back if I'm not careful, because even though the story is aimed at that type of person, I'm loath to say it, but that demographic, I feel like it's a somewhat demeaning word. I don't want it to just be written for that person either. Like The hardest thing is to sort of know when to inject something that I want to inject because I feel like, you know, or it's a good bit of writing or it's a good set piece or or good bit of dialogue i don't want to narrow the horizon so much so that it's like okay so what would this 18 to 25 year old female reader want to happen in this scene it's don't give people what they want (laughs) because i don't necessarily always want it to be an easy read and i don't want the protagonist to necessarily be perfect because i don't also want to paint people with mental health problems as perfect or beyond criticism or question I want it to be empowering for people, but not in a general way, not in in an almost childlike way of sort of like, I'm going to turn my my weaknesses into my strengths. And it's like, whereas that is completely possible, I think that it's also you need to show that they are weaknesses in the first place and they do have repercussions and that like character growth and personal development as a person requires facing those problems. And I think that that's part of what makes a good story as well the perfect hero is a boring hero i've always thought that if you have a perfect hero in a story that they are almost begging for sort of to be corrupted or to be defeated something to bring them down a peg something to make them reflect upon themselves we see more of ourselves in the flaws of the characters we read than in maybe their sort of greater actions i just want to go back to a point you made you've got this reader in mind but then if there's something you want to do that doesn't fit with that 
then you just want to do it anyway. Now, I would urge caution with that. The reason I'm getting you to think about a reader in this kind of vague sense is it's almost like um, thinking of it in terms of genre. Like if you were doing a post-apocalyptic story, then to suddenly have a really long bit about bioterrorism or cybercrime or something like just kind of slap bang in the middle because you thought it was cool because Mm. you wanted to write that but it doesn't fit the story and it doesn't fit the audience then you're going to be doing a disservice to the story and the reader it's just about having a balance and doing it carefully and realizing you know there is a phrase in writing where sometimes you have to kill your darlings Mm. yeah i mean there might be a bit of dialogue that you just say oh this is just so good this is beautiful this is the best thing i've ever written but you know what it's not right for this story so put it in a file use it elsewhere that's something as well that i'm trying to get you to move away from is not to be too precious about this i know Mm. it's your baby i know it's your story (laughs) this is why we're focusing on writing a shitty first draft there's no room for being precious about it you want to write the best story you can, and that might not necessarily be the story you thought it was going to be. It might be that, okay, there's things that you'll do in service of the story that will make a better story that might not necessarily be what you originally intended to communicate. And maybe those things that you originally intended to communicate, hey, maybe you've thought about them and you put them aside and use them in another project. But the point is, by finishing a project... And doing that, you know, you'll be able to use these things elsewhere. So <laughs> don't get precious about it and just focus on your reader. Um, yeah, I, you are right. Um, I think for me, much like you said, it is about ruining the balance. When I was writing the elevator scene you got me to do for homework, at first I was very sort of conscious about what I was writing. And then I sort of, I thought oh, it's just an exercise and it's words that can be edited and changed. So I just started to write and then I felt like, you're right. I think that if you contrive too much, it doesn't work. And also on the other side, that if, you, if you're not honest with yourself about situations, if you don't actually look at, at your work and go, well, as much as I like that, it doesn't really fit here. Yeah, it detracts from the story on the whole. Which I think is going to be one of the hardest things for me. But I'm I'm glad I have your frank appraisals to sort of keep me <laughs> <laughs> to keep me on the uh, the straight and narrow, or at least on some kind do, of. Do you know what? It, do you know what it is, Russ? Is I wish I had someone telling me this stuff because I have had to learn all these lessons myself. <laughs> and the hard lessons is galling <laughs> when you <laughs> yeah. when you realise like I love this scene, I love this character, but they're not not adding anything they're not doing anything it's like but you know what because you're writing this story there's spin-offs there's sequels there's short stories you can write in the world there's novellas you can write in the world you don't have to see what you're doing now as the final product what you're doing now is potentially the start of a number of stories or a part of a bigger set of stories a part of a bigger world so you can tell a different story within the world, but it might not be with these characters or it might yeah. not be at this well, time within the story. So. It's like opening up different windows into the same world, isn't it? Um, and enough, once you've opened enough of those windows and you maybe can you stand back and you look through all of them at the same time, you get a be- better view of the world. But it doesn't mean you'll necessarily use the view from each of those windows to tell the story. Yeah. 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 So one one thing I want to do now is, I mean, you know, we kind of having a bit of a reflective moment, and I, I do want to kind of go back a little bit over what we've done so far. Well, we were talking earlier before we came on, and I think you you are starting to get a bit frustrated that we, we're not <laughs> writing yet, and that's fine. You know, it's understandable because obviously this process is you want to write your shitty first draft. You know, if you think back to our early episodes, we were looking at the things like resistance and motivation, and the things that block you as a writer and then kind of getting to know your character getting to know your world and now kind of getting to know your reader so i think you've now got all these little building blocks in place that will allow you to start thinking about how your story is going to look and i hope you found that useful i mean i, I found, have I, I found it useful just to get my head around what you're doing and what your pain points are and you know weaknesses or whatever and things that we can work on and things that we can do to get you to finish this thing i've been trying to write this story for like 10 years and every time i've come to sit down and write it when you know the planets have been in alignment and i've I've felt i've had the 
the spirit <laughs> to do it. Um, it's always been start at the start again, rewrite the first chapter and I always get to the same point and go, oh yeah, that's enough. I've done enough work and then I'll walk away from it and then I won't do anything. And I realized largely I haven't had a foundation. Everything's in my head, but I've not had essentially reference material that I've created for myself. And what we've been doing over this period of time has, has been building a better foundation for the story. Things that I can look at and go, yes, I, I, I know I want to do that. More so than ever, because of these bits of groundwork we've been doing and because you've been getting me to think about setting and characters in maybe different ways that I'd been initially thinking about them, it's giving me that sort of urge to write and not just because I feel like it, if you know what I mean, but because I want to, I feel an urge to build upon these foundations that you've been helping me make. So yeah, I, I really do want to start putting pen to paper or mm. finger to keyboard. Because I feel like it's working, I'm, I am happy. I feel like the more we do with this and the more of a solid foundation I have, I feel like every time I go back to write, it's going to be somewhat easier than, for me than it, it was in the past i'm happy to um, say you've leveled up now <laughs> <laughs> right we're gonna start moving on we've got what i'm considering your groundwork you're not ready to write yet no. <laughs> so no. what i'm gonna do is I, I, i'm gonna send you probably about five or six youtube videos that i want you to watch yeah now all of these are about story structure and what you'll find is there's a lot of different ways of talking about story structure there's a lot of different ideas there's a lot of people who will say this is the method to use for writing stories and for me it depends on the project it depends on what resonates with me at the time yeah and what i'd like you to do for next week is to watch these videos we're going to basically have a discussion next time about different ways of thinking about story structure and how you can then start thinking about plotting out your novel great <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i think basically you're gonna to have to do probably a video a night i think they're only 10 minutes each but just to write a couple of notes about them and think about them yeah. i'll get my notepad out and i'll uh, yeah. i'll do my own work excellent remember you can follow me on the twitter it's at jl cronshaw if you've got any questions you want to ask the show it's john at john cronshaw.com i haven't mentioned it before but i also do another podcast which is where I talk about my ongoing author journey. That's John's Author Diary. So search for John Cronshaw's Author Diary on wherever you find your podcasts. And if you want to start reading some of my stuff, go to Amazon, type in Addict of the Wasteland, and you can get the prequel novella to my Wasteland series for free. Or if you're into more kind of video games, check out Blind Gambit, but you'll have to pay for that one. So until next time, cheerio. Bye. podcast i'm john cronshaw and i'm russell evans last week russ i sent you a bunch of links there were different formulations of story structure so i sent you things like the save the cat formula and dan wells is seven point story structure and dan Harmon's story circle and the hero's journey so i bombarded you with all these different types of story structure kind of threw you in the deep end a bit on that how did you find looking at all these different ways of constructing a story well, it was super interesting because it sort of made me stop and think, I sort of like, where have I seen these? I've, I've, you know, I've watched a lot of film. I've consumed a lot of media uh, throughout my life. And a lot of this stuff uh, was recognisable uh, at first, but I didn't quite, I couldn't quite put together sort of why I recognised them. So I had to sit there and try and think of films and, and books I'd read. Um, but the, the three that sort of stood out to me the most was like The Hero's Journey, which you know it's star wars isn't it it's it's mm. most most blockbusters the seven point just because it's sort of how it's its structure is broken down and you, you get some sort of films that are a bit more not necessarily complicated but they have a few more moving parts 
and then Save the Cat, which really resonated with me. I think largely just because I recognised it so much. Things like the sort of All Is Lost and the 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 dark is it the dark I can, I can never dark night remember. of the, soul. the dark night of the soul <laughs> and things like that when i looked at each of these sort of sections broken down i i recognized it the most from sort of things i'd seen in the past so um i ended up sort of really keying in on that one to be honest with you and looking looking the most into it and uh, sort of having a bit of a further read about it that's the one that works for me i mm. i love save the cat i think it's a tremendous tool for writers I think structure is a necessary thing to tell a good story. And I know that there are people who are resistant to this. And I was worried that maybe you would be and you'd be like, well, I don't want to have this kind of formula, this cookie cutter way of doing things. But, you know, you see with the hero's journey, you see with Save the Cat, you will see it everywhere and done yeah. in so many different ways that you go, actually, this isn't cookie cutter. This is just a really good way of telling a story that resonates Mm. what i would say to people who are resistant to story structure is like if you're at a point where you haven't written your book and you keep not writing your book and you're resisting story (laughs) structure then maybe consider it maybe think about why you've not written your book maybe it's because you've got nothing to kind of attach to i'll give you an example here of why restrictions are better for creativity than having an all-out freedom I will give you two writing prompts. I will say to you, firstly, I want you to write a story about anything you want. Writing prompt number two is I want you to write a thousand words story about a woman who discovers a dark secret in her past. Now, which one of those will immediately get your imagination moving? Which one of those will excite you? Oh, that's option number two, Bob. It's funny you were saying that because those were the exact thoughts. I know we discussed it briefly before we came on air. It became very apparent to me how little I'd got. Like I sort of I looked at the structure and as I was moving through it, I was like, oh, yes, this, this and this. And I got to a certain point. And I was like, no, I don't have that. Oh, no, I don't have that either. Uh, and I think that is what's helped me and why I've sort of really liked the structure. You know, I was, as you said, like for, for a long time in this, in the, in the sort of the, the dark years of uh, <clears throat> wanting to write this book, but just not doing it. Like, cause I had no structure. I had no real game plan. I just had sort of snippets and tableaus in my head of what I thought were great moments and good ideas, but they're not, they weren't tied together in any sort of contiguous way. They were just sort of great moments, well, what I think are great moments anyway. But largely, I, I think I get that a lot from watching films as well, because in films, you remember great moments. So I've yeah. sort of feel like I've been conditioned to come up with a, oh, here's a great moment. And then uh, I hadn't really thought about the, the, con- the connecting tissue between those yeah. moments. And, and those moments are only great moments because they've been built up to, because they're, you know, I said it last week, surprising yet inevitable mm. they are in their context great moments but say if you took them out of the film and they were on their own you just be like oh this is fun but it doesn't give you that emotional gut punch because you haven't followed the journey of the person yeah um and it doesn't have meaning it doesn't resonate and this is this is what the save the cat does i should just go over it actually i'm just going from my head here so if i get well, it wrong i apologize if you've got I, it in front of you let's yeah 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 so i mean it starts with an opening image doesn't it so yeah this is brilliant because what this does is you've got you see where your character is at the start of the book you know we talked about your protagonist flaws that's a vulnerability that you can improve i can't remember if i spoke to you on the show or whether this is just something i've thought about but it's like if you have a character and their vulnerability is they really struggle to trust people then you start off within the first couple of scenes showing this vulnerability at play you'll show that maybe they're use sarcasm as a barrier maybe they lash out at people who try to get close to them and then by the end of the book you know they should have got friends they should have learned to trust again exactly and it's like (laughs) they they might hold this a truth the false truth that like you know nothing good can come of trusting people yeah and that truth needs to go usually at you know he talks about the midpoint and save the cat that's the point where the worldview flips where everything's thrown aside and the person goes actually if i'm going to do this then i need to trust people um so it's yeah so it's a really useful way of getting a thematic progression and a character progression throughout your book and then what's next this will be the it's the setup next yeah so the setup so this will be you know maybe a hint of the problem like this is in star wars this will be when luke skywalker sees the 
Princess Leia hologram coming out of R2-D2. That is almost like the setup for the story. That's starting his journey. But, mm. you know, he doesn't see that and then suddenly go and fight Darth Vader. There's more steps in that. So then there's a statement of the theme. Is that next? Yeah. yeah, just, yeah. As I say, huh? top of my head here. Um, <laughs> and so this is, again, in Star Wars, this will be where it goes to Ben Kenobi and he'll talk about the idea of the light and the dark and, you know, if you go to the dark side and bad things will happen. So it's almost like you've got to stay good. That's the theme of yeah, Star it's Wars, setting, isn't it? It's kind of setting up the rules, isn't it? Throughout Star Wars, what's the theme? It's the theme, it's the battle. Well, okay. Throughout the traditional, the original <laughs> three Star Wars episodes, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was about the battle between good and evil. Yes. And so let me think next will be what? The catalyst, the yeah. inciting incident. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is the bit where Luke finds his auntie and uncle dead <laughs> the darkest moment in any star wars ever he just finds yeah, the yeah. burning skeletons of his wards he's just like oh okay and and so this is the point in the story now where he has got to act he can't go back if he goes back then hey he'll probably turn to ash as well yeah so then he's got to go and what is it this is where he's got to leave the planet and yeah. go on cool adventures and so this this is the end of the first act in your story so with these stories, I prefer to see it as four acts because I always build up to the middle at the mm. end of my second act. But, you know, it's essentially the first 25% usually is your first act. And then your middle, the big bit of the story, this is your main bit of your story now. Act two is usually half the book, 50%. And then your final third act will be the last 25%. Mm. So throughout this next part of the middle, let me think you've got the... Is it fun and games next? You've got the... What have you got? Uh, Let me have a look. I think the one I've got here is a slightly different... It's annotated slightly differently. So we've got um, the B story, which is... um, So this is the Han Solo story. Yeah, there's discussions about the theme, the nugget Mm. of truth. Usually discussion is between the main character and the love interest. So the B story is usually called the love story. Yeah, so I think the B story in Star Wars is... Well, I think you've got two. I think you've got the Luke and Leia weirdness. <laughs> yeah. um, but you've got the Han Solo story and his arc, his thing of he's all about the money. Is he light side? Is he dark side? Because that's the thing, isn't it? All of the characters in the original three films tend to sort of fall on one side or the other. Yeah. And it's a matter of are they, aren't they? Um, mm-hmm. Like with Lando later on as well. Yeah. Um, you could argue different things, but you know it's kind of, it's almost superfluous it doesn't matter yeah um, you know we're just kind of hooking onto these things so we yeah so we've got that the meet han solo the do all that and then is it break into act two is that the next it's bit? it's so it's break into act two b story and yeah. then the, the promise of the premise right so the promise of the premise what is the premise of star wars you're gonna have a guy training to be a jedi that'll be on the poster that'll be him with a lightsaber and what does he do he trains to be a jedi mm-hmm. so this might be in Rocky, this is where he's running around punching bits of meat and running upstairs. It's <laughs> it's the montage, you know what I mean? It's the yeah. training videos, it's the fun and games bit, it's it's the bit where we see the character go from being just an everyday chump to learning how to be something awesome. I don't know how that'll fit into your story, but I mean this is a tried and tested thing. This is where you'll have what we call try fail cycles. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a character will try something he'll fail at something, he might succeed at something, but, you know, something else. And there's all these different lessons that are learned and the mentor will be there. So he's learning from Ben Kenobi, he's learning about the force, he's learning about how to use a lightsaber, he's learning about the issues of the world through this kind of fun and games, through this kind of, um, yeah, the promise of the premise section. Let's see what we've got next. Then it's um, midpoint. Uh, yeah. Is, yeah, depending on the story. Uh, there's a moment when everything is great or everything is awful. Uh, yeah, and the main character either gets everything they think they want or doesn't get what they think they want at all. Um, but not everything we think we want is what we actually need in the end. This is the bit where Luke and Han, are they heading to Alderaan and they discover the Death Star instead yes. of the planet. They get sucked into the Death Star by the tractor beam, and then they get imprisoned. So we're at the midpoint, and then all of a sudden, the power has been taken away from the characters. They're trapped. They get imprisoned. This is where you know the more fun and games and the bad guys 
Closing, mm-hmm. I think, is at the next beat. Bad guys yep. closing. Yeah, so this is yep. a bit where they're running around, they're escaping the trash compactor, and they've had to dress up as stormtroopers and, you know, save the princess and all that fun. And then you have the... What then you have it, All the, Is Lost. And all that's, Is Lost, which Yeah, is that's where, when Ben gets killed, and they realise there's not much they can really do about the Death Star. This is bad stuff. Yeah. Ben dies. And then they escape... And they meet up with the rebels at that point, yeah. and then we have Dark Knight of the Soul, where the main yeah the main character hits bottom uh, and wallows in hopelessness, um, mourning the loss of like what's died. So like with Ben Kenobi dying, it's more than just Ben Kenobi dying; it's also maybe Luke's hopes of being a Jedi and all that yeah. sort of stuff. They've lost what was in in a sense sort of propelling them through the story. Yeah, and then they get the fresh idea at the end of this, and this is the thing about well, we can destroy the Death Star because we've got yeah. the plans. Hooray. Yeah. And then... And many boffins the, died. Yeah. And then the still finale... What is. The what? I still don't know what a boffin is. All right. Uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah. So then they, they go to, um, what is it, the Death Star? And, the, you know, they have the raid and yeah. they have the confrontation with Darth Vader and Luke and Darth Vader have a fight and all that. So fun. Yeah. Death Star blows up. Yep. Boom. Boom. There we go. <laughs> the end. Okay, so yeah, so we've looked at Star Wars briefly, and hopefully you'll have been able to see now that it does fit, and these things are just very useful to look at films and look at yeah. novels and things like that. It's obvious that they're in, these things are ingrained in us, though, from like centuries and centuries of storytelling. Millennia, millennia. Yeah. They are so deep. They're so yeah. deep. Why is a Canadian psychologist called Jordan Peterson? He annoyed a lot of trans people by having an argument about pronouns a year or two back. But yeah. um, he's got this series called Maps of Meaning, which is really good. It's really deep kind of look at story and meta story. And uh, he looks at a lot of creation myths and like Jungian archetypes and things like that. So it's this idea that these story structures are just so deep within our DNA and with the development of our minds and Joseph Campbell, who wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is basically where we get this uh, hero's journey idea from. Mm. You know, he, he didn't write that as an instruction guide for authors. He wrote that from his observations on creation stories from around the world. So yeah. what has become a kind of, you know, it's almost flipped on its head where people are looking to this text now to learn how to write a story. It's like these are the deep stories, the deep structures of story that exist and you know when a story falls flat or it doesn't work and we don't know why and we can't explain it it's often because it doesn't fit with these structures and we think oh you know something about it didn't work but i can't quite put my finger on it and yeah that's why it's because we're almost pre-wired for story and if we don't follow that in some way then it disappoints us i think that's really spot on i think that we all get conditioned to have certain expectations for certain outcomes and i think that if it wasn't for that, you know, stories wouldn't be able to vary and play with those expectations and outcomes if they weren't already a part of us. It would just be a series of events strung together. But because we're so used to story structures, when we either get those things or don't get those things in a story, I think that is that is when it resonates with us the most. Because like you said, for millennia, since the first time we sat down around a uh, campfire, uh, in a cave and told the story of how we hunted like a deer or a mammoth and how exciting that story was and how, how someone got hurt or but we did it in the end like if a story variates from it too hard or in a way that seems to have no purpose then yeah i think it doesn't key in with a lot of people how this relates to you then is i'm gonna give you some homework for next week <laughs> yeah. um we've looked at the blake snyder beat sheet i want you to pick a movie that you love, that you know well, and sit there with the beats and just try and map out the film as you're watching it and seeing if it does hit these beats. You know, not everything's going to fit this exactly. It's not set in stone. Yeah. But you will recognise quite a few of these things appearing, I'm sure, in anything that you watch. Maybe apart from Memento, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that for now. Do you think you could do that? I think I can do that, yes. Wow, I think you're doing very well with these homeworks, Russ. You're going to get yourself a gold star very soon. Thank you. Thank you for the positive uh, reinforcement. You're doing the thing that none of my teachers ever did. So. <laughs> Which is what, just go, just do it for God's sake. What's wrong yeah, with just, it's good yeah. for you. Here's the reason why it's good for you, instead of just calling me a shitbag. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is why I think I 
didn't do much in the way of homework. Yeah, same cool. here. <laughs> you know, knowing why you're doing something is helpful. It's more than just that. It's also it's useful. showing why it's beneficial. When you, you know, when you've got someone who you're willing to listen to and you respect what they say, you're you're kind of more willing to take on faith without so much like having to have hard evidence. So yeah, so I'm, I'm constantly willing to to do the <laughs> homework assignments you ask me. Excellent. I've written a book called Stop Booking Around. <laughs> I wrote the first draft of that in a day, Russ. I thought, <laughs> yes, it's because you are in, you are some kind of insane man machine, and the thought yeah. the thought of you writing that in a day makes me feel kind of somewhat insignificant. <laughs> no, it shouldn't. It, it, I know this stuff inside out. So, yeah. I know. And it's it, just when you told me originally, I was just like, oh right, okay. Oh, fuck, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, it, if anything, it, it shows me what's possible. Yeah, it can um, be done. So. Yeah, well, we've practiced any at all. We've practiced all processes sort of speed up don't they but i was still impressed nonetheless well, so, so was i <laughs> yeah. until next time cheerio bye Welcome to Stop Booking Around. I'm John Cronshaw. And I'm Russell Evans. Last week we looked at story structure and I got you to go through a bunch of different story structures. And I think the ones you said that resonated the most with you were the seven point story structure and save the cat. And I think it was the save the cat one that you decided in the end that most resonated. I gave you the homework last week to pick a film, any film, and see to what extent Save the Cat kind of fits with the film you watched. I'm sure to some extent it did. Maybe it didn't. Maybe you watched Memento and ignored me, but there we go. Uh, (laughs) What film did you watch? You've not told me yet, though. I chose the 1984 animated Transformers the movie. Awesome. See, (laughs) the the mistake you've made there is you've you've picked a bloody (laughs) film that's based in, uh, you know, on the... Japanese probably story structure. <laughs> yeah. No, but go on then. I'll break it down. So we've got the opening image. The Autobots are on one I of love the Earth's... music in that film, by the way. Oh yeah, the music is the music <laughs> makes that film. It's the yeah. most the most powerful eighties hair metal you've ever heard in your life, and it makes me happy to even just think about it. Um so the opening image, uh, you've got the Autobots, they're on one of Earth's moon bases. And there, you know, we're quite far into the war between the Decepticons and the Autobots. The Decepticons have taken Cybertron and the Earth and the Autobots have had to retreat to Earth. And they're sort of preparing for their final pushback. They, they want it to be the last battle in the war and, they, they, you know, they want to win. Uh, you see that the Decepticons are actually spying on the Autobots and know what their plans are. Hmm. Uh, and that they're, they're going to use this information to try and end the war in their favour. So then you've got the setup where we go to Earth. Oh, the Decepticons. So then we got the life. The setups you got life on Earth is stable, and it's shown because you've got Hot Rod, who is essentially the protagonist. But I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and then you've got Daniel, who is a new character, and he's the son of one of the human characters. So you've got a, you've got Hot Rod, who is essentially depicted as sort of like a reckless youngster, and you've got Daniel, who's a kid. So they're sort of. They're pictured as children in a way. They've got no, they've got responsibility. You see, they're fishing when you first see them, and they're bored. That's your kind of your setup for the world. You see that there's like there is war going on, but on Earth things are peaceful right now, and there's not much to do. So we've got like, themes stated. So we've got um, these are my terrible notes. Prime's the oldest, most famous character, and he's talking about ending things. And Hot Rod is completely new as a character, and he's paired with Daniel, who's probably around thirteen. Uh, the theme really is about endings and new beginnings, and that's largely, I'm not going to lie, about the fact that it was time to introduce a new line of Transformers toys. <laughs> so they, they needed a way to have a bunch of new characters where all of their character models and vehicles were kind of cool and futuristic, but they also need needed a way to do away with sort of like a lot of the older characters so the cast isn't too large so and that's where we get to the catalyst so because the decepticons know what the autobots are planning they get on board the shuttle that they that the autobots take to earth and they kill everybody on the shuttle and as a child i was like oh okay then so here are some of my favorite characters just getting straight (laughs) up murdered in this kids cartoon 
It's fine, though. It's all right. That happens. So they steal the shuttle. They kill all the Autobots on the shuttle. Uh, and then they use it to uh, sneak attack Earth. Um, and it reaches a climax when Optimus Prime and Megatron go toe-to-toe. Hot Rod interferes, and he's indir- indirectly responsible for Optimus Prime's death. But the Decepticons are driven back. Everything is in ruins, and as Optimus Prime dies... So this, this story also contains a MacGuffin. And as Optimus Prime dies, he takes out something no one's ever heard of before out of his chest, which is the Autobot Matrix of Leadership, which just looks like incredible bling from the 80s. <laughs> and he gives it to Ultra Magnus, who we have seen is sort of this quasi-leader figure, very serious, very responsible. He takes control when uh, the Decepticons attack the Earth base and such. Yeah, so it's passed to Magnus, uh, but Megatron is betrayed by the rest of the Decepticons and thrown out into space uh, because he's so like ruined and destroyed. And he through, uh, meets uh, Unicron, which is sort of the big bad guy, which is a planet that eats other planets. And Unicron tasks him with destroying the matrix and in and if he does so well his promise for this is like he gives him a new body and he gives him a new ship and he says now go and destroy the matrix that's your that's your payment for me sort of saving you from death but then we move on to the debate the autobots debate what the next move is um, but they have their decision made for them as the reborn galvatron attacks them and the Autobots are then forced to flee Earth in two different vessels. So then we've got uh, breaking into two. So as they flee through space, Ultra Magnus tries to assume the role of leader, and Hot Rod strives to continue to basically be reckless despite the need for everyone to step up. The B story really is, will Magnus become the leader that Optimus Prime wanted him to be? And like, will Hot Rod fulfill his potential? And then you get the promise of the premise. So the Decepticons catch up and the group is separated into two. One ship is shot down and the other is believed to be destroyed. Uh, We hit the midpoint where Hot Rod and Cup um, end up imprisoned awaiting execution. And Galvatron tracks down one of the groups and kills Ultra Magnus and takes the Matrix of Leadership. Also, I'm just going to go back a little bit and touch on the fact that when Optimus Prime died, some small part of my childhood died as well. Um, Because I did not expect that as a child coming from the cartoon series on TV to see Optimus Prime literally beaten to death and then dying slowly. Yeah, I wasn't ready for that shit. It was was shocking. It was shocking, shocking, but that's what made it great. That's why I part of the reason why I remember it. Um, So, yes, we've got to the midpoint. Um, what people of Game of Thrones. (laughs) Yes, everyone in the end loves to remember the death of some of their favourite characters. Yeah, so Hot Rod and Cup are awaiting execution, Magnus is killed, and the Matrix is taken, and the rest of his group are just left on the planet that they're on. So then we've got the bad guys close in. So the one group on the planet that lost Ultra Magnus are then attacked by sort of scavengers, because the planet is essentially just a planet of junk. So after they've lost Ultra Magnus and they don't know what to do, they then get attacked again and have to fight off these Junkians, uh, which is what they're called. They're, rope, they're, they're all motorbikes and their Transformers are all made out of junk. Um, and then Cup and Hot Rod are marched out um, to be executed. Cup and Hot Rod get out of their situation and they manage to get to the planet that the other guys are on and intervene at the last moment before... They're completely overrun and maybe taken apart by the Junkians. So once they're all back together, there's a sort of a, a recounting of what's happened to both groups. And this is the sort of the all is lost when they realize that their leader, Ultra Magnus, is gone. And the, the matrix of leadership, the, the, the most important like transformer artifact, the Autobots, has been taken by their worst enemy. So what, this is the point at which they just don't know what to do with themselves. And you get the Dark Knight of the Soul, where it's a quite a simple one. They all just sit there and just go, well, all hope is lost then, isn't it? Uh, there's no, what can we do? You know, Unicron can't be stopped unless we've got the Matrix of Leadership, but we don't have it. But the Junkians know where Unicron is, and the Junkians have a ship that they can use. So they set off from the planet of Junk, renewed into Act 3. So yeah, the Junkians have become their ally and provide them uh, with in- the information they need to go after the Matrix. The Junkians also put Ultra Magnus back together. 
because of their composite nature, they're uh, incredible at repairing things. So they repair Ultra Magnus and we get our leader back. But his status is sort of changed. It's almost as if he tried to be the leader and got destroyed for it. So now he's more on equal footing with everybody else. Okay, so now into the finale where Unicron has <laughs> transformed into a planet-sized robot and decides to bitch slap Cybertron because Galvatron threatened him with the Matrix but doesn't know how to use it and so is essentially insignificant. And to teach him a lesson, Unicron literally bitch slaps Cybertron. At this point, the good guys turn up and it's an all-out battle. The the Decepticons left on Cybertron are attacking Unicron and in the confusion, the uh, the Autobots manage to smash through one of Unicron's eyes and end up inside him. And obviously, because he's bigger than a planet, it's essentially like being stuck inside a planet. And we have our different moments where Hot Rod is separated from the rest of the Autobots. They go off to try and find a way out and they managed to rescue some other Autobots that had been sort of in parentheses eaten earlier in the thing and we find some classic characters that we thought were dead aren't actually dead and Daniel finds his dad Spike as well so there's some there's a bit of relief from the darkness earlier in the story Galvatron's been eaten as well at this point by Unicron Hot Rod has been separated and he chances upon Galvatron. Galvatron has the matrix of leadership around his neck. And well, they get, to get down to it, they just start fighting. Hot Rod's trying to get the matrix. Galvatron's just trying to kill Hot Rod. And at a certain point, Hot Rod has a realization. He hears the voice of the now deceased Optimus Prime telling him to basically step up and do what needs to be done. Uh, Hot Rod grabs the M- matrix of leadership and through, I don't know what you want to call it, Transformer magic, he <laughs> evolves or transforms into Rodimus Prime. Um, the Matrix of Leadership has imbued him with power, and and he's bigger now as well, physically. Um, does, does, this, does this remind you of that moment in the Matrix where Neo's suddenly <laughs> all-powerful and, you know... Yes. This- this happens all the time in movies. This is like, right, I have got like powers. And yes, yes this is, this exactly. Is like, a, I've gone from being yeah. a nothing to the lowest to being like a god now. Hot Rod, after this happens, he basically picks Galvatron up and throws him through a wall and out of uh, Unicron. He then proceeds to open the Matrix, which fulfills the prophecy when Optimus gives Ultra Magnus the matrix he talks of like a legend and he says that an autobot will rise from the ranks and they will use the matrix to light their darkest hour and in this point it is literal because inside unicron is obviously incredibly dark and as rodimus opens the matrix beams of light spear out from it and wherever they cast their light Inside Unicron, it begins to blow up and break and essentially fall to pieces. Um, So he has literally lit their darkest hour. And so the power of the Matrix essentially breaks Unicron, makes him start to fall to pieces and malfunction. And they all get out and they all escape and Unicron is destroyed. And then we get the final image where Hot Rod is now Rodimus and they're on Cybertron instead of Earth. And... As he speaks to the Autobots, it's clearly now that he is a leader and he's no longer sort of shirking responsibility and that he's he's living up to his potential. And so it's a kind of mirror of the beginning of the story where he is just seen as this sort of hot-headed punk uh, who needs to straighten himself out and, and learn how to fulfill his potential. Blake Snyder wrote that years after Transformers. I thought it was going to be a Japanese structure, but now that was a very much a western 3x structure so yeah that was good how did you find that then just kind of thinking about the film that obviously you love in terms of structure in terms of you know kind of storytelling rather than just in terms of entertainment it made me appreciate it because i love that film and i'm not going to sit here and say that it's an amazing film although i have argued for its virtues (laughs) quite a lot in the past because it does have them for what it is, it is a strange confluence of things that never should have been anywhere near as good as it was. I mean, for God's sake, you had like the voice cast, you had like Orson Welles and Leonard Nimoy and Eric Idle and people like that. And it's based on a toy line 
and main characters die and new characters are introduced and have full arcs and it shouldn't have been as good as it was and the music as well it was amazing like Stan Bush and Lion and people and Vince Dakota things like that their soundtrack make it as well full of like, uh, like 80s like montage um <laughs> But yeah, seeing it like that, I, I think I did appreciate it because I'd always had the way I spoke about it was that more it was a collection of great moments that that really resonate and are well done um, that had sort of good dialogue. But seeing it like this and realizing that, yeah, it, it, you know, it is all tied together and it mm. does have a structure. And even though it is a bit messy and sometimes like the group acts as the protagonist and then sometimes there's two separate protagonists I think that all of the main beats are actually hit, um, yeah. whether it be by individual characters or the group on the whole. They all, in some point, um, display the different things that a like a protagonist would go through on their journey through a story. Yeah, well, I, I guess it's a little bit like you know an ensemble cast. Like you'd get something like in Ocean's Eleven, where there's a lot of different main characters, so to speak. You know, you, you yeah, know, just following one person instead of multiple char- instead of one character being multifaceted, you just have multiple characters that each sort of have a a personality archetype, and then you experience different things through each of those. Okay, so we've looked at the film, then we've mapped it out with. Blake Snyder's beat sheets. I think even if you weren't aware of how story structure works and how story kind of progresses and feeds into the next thing and the next thing, hopefully you'll have seen now that all of these scenes within Transformers had a kind of causal relationship. They weren't just separate moments. They weren't just great little things. They all connected to each other. So that's a great lesson. I hope that (laughs) sticks with you now. Yeah, very much so. What I want you to do next then is the Blake Snyder beat sheet you're going to turn that now on your own story. You know, you've mentioned before that, okay, when you started looking at this, you realised that you were a bit hazy. See what you can come up with, see what you can do, and then we'll go from there next week. Okay. Um, Excellent. So if you haven't already, you can join our Facebook group. It's Stop Booking Around. Follow me on Twitter. It's at JL Cronshaw. If you haven't done so already, please do leave a review on iTunes about the show. That'll help to spread the word. And if you could share this with an author friend, that'd be really helpful. So until next time, cheerio. Bye. to stop booking around i'm john cronshaw i'm russell evans last week i gave you the task of mapping your story or at least what you've got in your story so far to the blake snyder beat sheet and um, so we've looked at the save the cat i got you to look at a film and try and see if it worked with that structure we found out it did very surprising for you at least <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a pleasant I surprise. yeah i wasn't surprised but you know that's just because i've been geeking out about this stuff for far too long have you got your own work yes excellent so tell me about your story going off this off the beat sheet so mm. we've got our opening image and if you can as i go through this if you if you feed back to me because sometimes interpretation is difficult um cool. when i was initially looking at this i think i understand it a bit better now having had time to sort of ruminate on it but opening image I'm just going to read what I've written here. So, open image. On top of a hill of ash and scissors, a blasted tree sits in stark contrast to an abnormally close golden moon hanging in a sky that graduates from black to dark crimson. Uh, in this one, I've gone for the literal, which is like, this is this is the first thing you'll see. Yeah. Uh, is a otherworldly environment. It is not in any way normal. So, uh, I'm hoping to like capture the reader with this like yes, now this is very much a fantasy story and it's yeah. not set in our world. Um so it's hoping to proc those questions of like okay, so why then like why is this? How does this exist and where is this? So then we move on to the No, set- we don't. Oh god. No, no we don't. We don't. <laughs> okay. Go on. Go on. Uh, right. Okay, you've got your world good. Yeah. I told you I don't care about your world, Russ. Mm. Right. Your opening image. 
this needs to be something where we see your main character. So we've got Theodora, yeah. right? We need to have a scene where we can see how she deals with the situation, something like yes. that, where we see something of her personality, where we see an example of her vulnerability, her character flaw, and why she's likable. Like the book Save the Cat is named after a moment in films where if you want to show a good guy is a good guy, maybe early on have them save a cat or something right. similar to that. Um, mm. So it's just a moment straight away where we see where your character is. Okay. Um, well, I think that so my I, opening image and my setup have kind of bled into one then. Okay. So what have you got for your setup? So I've got um, Dora is trapped in her dreams because she's in a coma. Um, okay, the, this, is, this is actually your opening image then, really. Okay, all right yeah. then. Well, the thing is, is that I was going to largely leave that fact out. I was going to leave it as somewhat of a, a mystery as to how she dies. Part of how she ends up in the mental state she arrives at in the beginning of the story is because she doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know that she's in a coma. Okay, um, so... If you've got this thing with a coma, she's in a coma. I mean, what does she she die at the end of the coma? Is that the she does? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when you write your novel, it might be that your starting point is when she starts in the underworld and she's right. in a weird state. Now you've got a couple of ways you can deal with this idea of the coma scenes. Either you have it as a prequel, you have it as a separate story, yeah, that is before, or you can have it as a prologue. These are kind of, eh, I'm, I'm not a fan of prologues because they're usually just a bit boring. Or you could write this scene and then have it almost flashing back throughout the novel. There's different yeah. ways you can handle it. So, I mean, sorry, carry on anyway. So yeah, you've got yeah. this, this scene then. What's this opening, opening okay. image? She's in a coma. So she's in a coma, but we're not seeing her lying in a hospital bed or anything. That's just sort of more of a, uh, a setup for when I was just writing this description. So her actual situation is that her dreams that she's been trapped in because she's in this coma have turned into nightmares because of who she is, because she is, because she's smart and she realizes that something's wrong. Mm. Um, and that leads to sort of worry and anxiety and so forth and so on. And because she suffers from depression, it, everything ultimately sort of, she loses control. And the world in which she's inhabiting starts to reflect dark and uncomfortable environments and imagery and such. But where we find her is that she is actually, she's out of breath at the bottom of the hill that are described in the uh, opening image. Yeah. And... The one continuous element in her nightmare is that she is pursued constantly by a horse, a huge black horse with hooves like forge heated metal. Every time it finds her, it will knock her to the ground and begin to trample her. But it won't do it like a wild animal. It does it methodically. It starts with her feet and it, cr it basically using these burning hot hooves and its strength it just slowly crushes her legs and it starts to move up and up and up and up what normally happens is she gets so panicked by this situation that it's almost like uh like a defense mechanism kicks in and she is relocated to somewhere else and the horse isn't there and her body begins to knit itself back together again this is the setup that she's uh, the way i'd looked at it that she's lost control of herself and she's losing her sense of self and will pretty much soon descend into madness what you're saying about like this having this as a prologue or a separate thing or flashbacks i think that will work better now mm. i think this as i wrote this it kind of evolved into that idea anyway so we've got a yeah. uh, theme yeah. stated so in a moment of hopelessness uh, she makes a choice and she demands that the horse finish the job and kill her so she's yeah. tired of running away she's let go of her fear and she in a sense takes control of her situation but she does that without understanding it and that's yeah. the point at which she dies, okay. uh, yeah. where, like, I don't know, the, the plug is pulled, something like that, or she just dies in the coma. Yeah. I think that you, you will need to redo this. This will be your starting point now, the story. Mm. And when you've got your theme stated, you know, we've talked about this before. You've, you've mentioned that if your character doesn't do anything, then she will die. It's almost like your theme is stasis equals death. Yeah. And it's like she needs to find that out at this point in the story. This is obviously going to be influenced by a lot of Japanese storytelling just because of the things I like. Yeah. Um, and I, I've gone for the idea of early on, the main character taps unbeknowingly into 
their ability, their power, their whatever you want to call it. And the rest of the story, there are moments in which they reflect upon this moment still, and it's like a it's like a splinter in their mind. They're trying to, there's something important about that moment, something that if they could grasp it consciously, you know, they, they can self-actualize, they can take more control of themselves because it's her dreams. And ultimately, if she wanted to, she could take control. So when she tells the horse to finish the job, the horse kind of stops and is confused because up until this point, the horse had essentially been programmed by her subconscious to do this to herself. It's mm. you know a manifestation of self-loathing and, and, and self-punishment and such. I think you could do something very clever with this scene, actually. If you had it almost so her dialogue wasn't her speaking, but the voices that she was hearing maybe in the hospital. And so you could go, we need to end it. We need to pull the plug. Or, you know what I mean? And then yeah. that's when, you know, that's so kind of having those echoes of conversations going on outside and then the reader will no. get the clues kind of thing of what's going on. Mm. Um, that could work. I mean, I still might never, ever reveal that fact. Like, obviously no, people and you, don't, you don't need to. There's a lot of things in my books that I know, <laughs> but mm. I don't, I don't reveal um, within the books. Like there's a big thing within my wasteland books, which is that, the wasteland isn't the world. It's yeah. just a very small corner of the world and the rest of the world's all right. <laughs> it's like, it's a post-apocalyptic landscape within a country. And then, hey, at the end of book four, maybe they'll come across a big fuck-off wall that yeah. divides the land into a protected zone and a lawless zone. And <laughs> <laughs> my main character doesn't know this. So yeah. that's going to happen and it's going to be great. It's going to annoy <laughs> a lot of readers. <laughs> I've known this since the start. So yeah. And it's, it's kind of annoying me because I've had a few reviews where I've almost held a lantern up to these inconsistencies on purpose. And people have gone, oh, well, three stars. If you didn't have this, then it would be a consistent world. It's like, no, it's meant to be inconsistent. That's mm. the point. And you will find that out if you read book four. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. oh, dear. Um, so, and the, yeah, I've just written here, like, the themes will be, like, making choices, um, self-actualization and like you said the idea that stasis equals death moving on to the catalyst so Dora dies that is essentially the biggest catalyst really yeah. um, her existence changes so she dies in her coma and is remade in the underworld she's found by Inigo, uh and starts to learn about her new condition on the journey yeah. back to like the city she's acclimatized and pushed to make a choice about what she will do now Life has changed for you now, and there's no going yeah. back. So you have to make a choice. Her waking up in this weird world can be your opening scene. And I think that you can have the almost, you know, your theme stated is get into this idea of stay sequels, death kind of stuff. And then the setup is where you find out a bit about the world, and maybe someone literally shows them around and gives them the pitfalls you know you can almost yeah. have but doing it in a way where it's not just hey look at this bit of the world isn't it scary it's like you need to do it in service of something yes. like you know i'll show i'll show you where you can stay or you know mm -hmm. if Diego's taken her under a ring look come with me i'll show you where you can live we'll we'll sort you out you don't have to be like this or she needs to in this early bit see the results of what can happen if she doesn't follow the theme of the story which is stay sequels to she needs to see what's at stake if yeah. she doesn't follow Inego's advice. That's pretty much what I had planned because it's going to be a sort of, there is going to be like a mentor student arc yeah. and it's that going to be that sort of like, you will, you will be introduced to the world through Dora's eyes. She's new to this world and so is the reader. So yeah. uh, Inego will be, uh, at least at the start, the sort of de facto guide and sort of uh, authority on the way things work. So after the catalyst, we get the debate, the sort of mm. the moment of will she, won't she? So Dora's overwhelmed by the situation and the gravity her decisions now have. We really need to find this out. We really need to clarify what this is. You can't, you catalyst. She needs to almost be offered a job or something, yes. you know, like you've got to do this and maybe in the scenes following, she goes, yeah, no, I don't want to like, I don't know if she's going to be like a uh, a Grim Reaper or something. It's like, right, you're going to be the Grim Reaper. And she'll go, look, I don't want to do that. That's not for me. Yeah. And then she sees what happens to the people who refuse to do that. And it's like, oh, my goodness, that's terrible. And then it's like she's almost forced to do it or die. So you need something more obvious as a catalyst. Well, just it's funny world. you should say that. Um, <laughs> I didn't mention it when I was writing in the catalyst here, but um, essentially Inigo explains his job. 
which is that of a ferryman. And ferrymen in the underworld, obviously you've got the, the classic sort of idea that they were guide, you know, the ferryman was a guide, yeah. um, but also a judge uh, and so forth. And that's kind of what the ferrymen are. They mediate situations. They're, they are judge, jury and executioner, although in this world nobody can essentially be outright killed because of the nature of the world because uh, everyone's already dead anyway. So in Yego, propositions are say like, well, why don't you be a ferryman? Really? Yeah. There we go. We've cut yeah. your catalyst. That's yeah. your catalyst. <laughs> um, after that, like he, he presents the idea to her and she's still overwhelmed. So the way I'd sort of seen it is that she kind of just goes, yeah, no, because she's still holding on to her old sort of personality trait. He says to her like, well, all right, I will come and find you at a certain point um, and you'll have had to have made your decision by then. So there will be a, sh- a brief period where we get to experience the city through Dora's eyes with no guide and no safety net against the weirdness she's going to experience. Okay, so with, um, within this bit, you almost need a, a subplot, a kind of a mini arc. Don't have a meandering. Mm-hmm. Don't have a just doing nothing, you know, like wandering yeah. around and going, oh, this is weird, this is weird. I don't know, have some kind of purpose to her going into the city. You know, maybe she'd go, look, I don't want to do that. I'll find a job in the city. You know what I mean? That kind yeah, of that's, thing. Yeah, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be her yeah. rejecting the perceived control of others. What I was thinking is her, she's not going to be meandering as such. She will have a purpose. She wants to know what the city's about, but she will become so overwhelmed so quickly uh, yeah. that she'll realise that she should have made the choice there yeah. and then. This would be a really good place to introduce a third character, mm. a friend or relationship character, just another character who can be a sounding board, who can maybe give her advice, who can maybe, I don't know, maybe warn her against Inego in some way or, you know, because what, what you don't want is to have your antagonist protagonist and then get to a point in the story where your protagonist has got no one to talk to. <laughs> yes. And, and no one to almost, you know, sacrifice in the act three just to go, oh no, my best friend's died, you did this. Mm-hmm. Like this. You know, it's almost like you need dialogue, you need to have these different parts of the story. So putting these characters in position so you've got people to have conversations with and to reveal bits of your character that, you know, won't be revealed in front of Inego or something like that will be really helpful. So yeah, you probably need to do another character profile for a relationship type character friend or even a love interest if that's the way you want to go or you know that kind of thing yeah i've already got sort of some ideas for that think of it in terms of you know his dark materials lyra always has pantomime with her she always has a sounding board she always has someone she can talk to even though it's just it's her on her own but it's not really you know what i mean yeah i think the idea that stands out most to me is that when she uh, she's assigned essentially like uh, somewhere to live, but she gets basically given a friend, and it, the friend is odd. Some denizens, shall we say, of the underworld, uh, they can't uh, they can't make themselves look normal again. They are very much dead. They look like zombies, even though they might have fully functioning sort of cognizant personalities. For whatever reason, they can never return themselves to what they looked like before whatever killed them her roommate is one of these people. So when she first encounters him, she walks into her new room and there's just a corpse in the corner and she's just like, oh God, what is this? What's happening? And then the corpse is like, hello, nice to meet you. I'm John or Bill. And she's sort of having to process that like, oh my God, this is not, <laughs> this is not the real world anymore. I was thinking like Korg in Thor Ragnarok, who was a giant rock man. It looks as though he could crush your head, but he's like, oh, hello, my name's Korg. Uh, it's nice to meet you. So like he's got a very sort of like broken, soft voice. It's that sort of where the uh, the image doesn't quite match the personality. So in terms of a sounding board, I was thinking like a character like that. That's almost yeah, kind of yeah. comedic in a sense because of the nature of it, that it's an absurd sort of character that would normally be maybe presented as a monster or a threat, but is instead really friendly and really nice and goes out of their way to help Dora. And maybe Dora doesn't really treat very well, but still sort of that character maintains being friendly and being there for Dora and that sort of uh, fedora. One of the the things that you could do is have, you know, the trust has a main theme running through it is if she's reluctant to trust this person, reluctant to trust in Ego, and then she learns to trust. And then you've got the kind of two prongs of, there's a trust and the betrayal maybe with Inego, but then mm-hmm. the kind of continual friendship and trust with this roommate character. That could give it more depth and more nuance with the theme 
And then it's like, well, where do I stand at the end? Do I live with trust or do I shut everyone out? Like that yes. might be a, a question that you answer. Break into Act Two. Dora makes a decision and she begins to train as a ferryman properly. And then we really begin to learn about the world yeah. because uh, her first experience is colloquial, should we say. Um, whereas when she begins to train with Inigo, she has then access to higher learning, in a sense, about the nature of the underworld and about how things work in terms of the laws and maybe social structures and such. Mm-hmm. And she's learning this from someone who is an authority yeah. uh, and has been trained to essentially be a custodian for this world. Now it's time for your adventures in learning how to, to be something else. Um, this is the Jedi training. This is the yes. Harriet Wizard in school. This is the, the promise of the premise bit. This is the fun and games, the montage, you know. So this is, yeah, this is good. And then so the B story there is sort of Inigo takes Dora as his ward, which is something he's, uh, it'll be mentioned that he's never done it before. There's always been a bit of a lone wolf. This is where I kind of realised that apart from sort of the broad strokes and abstract moments, I was a bit lost because I was like, well, I know what my larger overarching bad guy is and what the larger overarching threat to the world is. But now I need to start world building more. Uh, (laughs) Thinking of like in her adventures and learning to be a ferryman, like what will she come up against? What I imagine is that, you know, this montage essentially is going to be her being in different situations where she's forced to make a decision. could be that it's a series. It could be that you're writing something bigger and maybe the storyline with Inigo is too big for this single book. It might be that you, okay, I know the point of this podcast is that we're going to write a novel, but, you know, maybe not. Maybe what you do is you write a, a series of novellas. Maybe you write maybe three, maybe five novellas that are maybe about 25,000 words each. So they're more digestible, they're smaller. And say in the first one, you introduce Dora, you introduce the world, you introduce her training. Maybe that her first kind of real job that she's got to make a judgment on is actually her roommate. And that's going to be really difficult for her because she's just starting to trust this person, just getting to be friends with them. And now she's got to separate that and she's got to kind of make a decision on that. Mm. This is a decision you need to make now. Is what <laughs> is your story? Yeah. How big is it going to be? Is it going to be a sprawling epic? Is it going to be that, okay, there are all these stories within this world that I can tell, but I'm just going to focus on this one. I think you've come to a point where, I mean, you tell me, is this a point where you're realizing actually what I thought I had in my head as a fully rounded story of all these things is actually not what i thought it was i think that's what it is it is um you know you are when you're just thinking about these ideas um that's all they are they're not a story really you know yeah. no matter what you might say about the ideas you've got for it you haven't put that story down yeah you haven't told it to anybody really you know you've got some beats and you've got a loose structure but it's not a story you know yeah. a beginning and end and maybe a middle like does not a story make necessarily it's like we've spoken about before it's it's the connective tissue it's easy enough in some ways to have big grand ideas and invent a world full of interesting things i need to start getting my sort of really anchoring down the important parts of the story and then coming up with a general idea of like, okay, so this is what's going to happen between point C and point D. What we've got so far, we've got a person going into the underworld. She is going to be a ferryman. We need to see what that is. We need something that's going to happen where something bigger is at stake or she's got to make a choice about something. Like we need almost a first story, whether mm. it is, will become a no- novella or whether it will be, the first act in your story, something like that, you need to really think about now what it is you want to create. Sometimes it's easier to work from a midpoint. It's like, what's going to be the big thing in the middle of your story? What's the big flip? Now, in terms of your series arc, I think your midpoint needs to be the betrayal of Dora yeah. by Inigo. I think that's a really key it, moment. It is, yeah. If you're going to be doing novellas, that could be, you know, we get that as a cliffhanger at the end of book two. Mm. or at the end of book three you know <laughs> yeah um, i think this might work actually having the novellas for you might be a better way for you to focus on 
individual story arcs in a smaller way, in a more of a compressed way. I think that maybe doing novellas, instead of trying to look at the big picture constantly and maybe losing my way, it'll allow me to focus uh, on certain things. And sometimes the beauty of novellas is that if you were to just stick them all together into one binding, there'd be a book. That's how we should think about it. As a series of four or five novellas, having a sense of completion of your first novella will be really good for you. In his book Story Grids, Sean Coyne refers to what he calls his five commandments of storytelling. These are every story has to have a inciting incident. So this is your catalyst. This is the thing that gets your story going. It has progressive complication. So this is where things get more difficult. And then you've got your crisis. This is, you know, this might be the midpoint in your book. This is the point where something really, really, really bad happens and you've got to deal with it. Then you've got your climax. It's like hitting the iceberg, isn't exactly. it? Exactly, yeah. So that's your midpoint. That's your crisis that's the moment where you need to deal with stuff you've got your climax which is basically your final act this is where you go head to head with whatever your antagonist is and then you've got your resolution which is the point at the end of your story where you get your chance to breathe and this is the bit in i don't know lord of the rings where they have a bit of a party or yeah. where they have the medal ceremony or you know that kind of the story's finished but we just see where it's the a, it's a, yeah it's at. a repose this is the sort of it's like the after image, isn't it? Yeah. Like it's the wind down, the sort of bringing things back down to a more sort of stable yeah. reality and creating like the creation of a new status quo in a way. Yeah, this is where you should be able to get a nice contrast between your opening scene and your final scene. They should almost try and mirror each other if you can. So it can be a return. It can be a, okay, this is the point where they get their move into their new palace from their hovel in the first chapter, you know. This structure, you know, I've talked about the acts, I've talked about the scenes. This structure is fractal. So every act should follow this structure. Mm. Every scene should follow this structure. Now I'm going to add an extra one, <laughs> an extra commandment, which is <laughs> set up. I think you need a set up for every scene. I think you need to know where the character is, what they're doing, which kind of comes naturally anyway. Sometimes you can do a thing with, you know, the resolution is almost optional. So if you end on the climax, yeah. of a scene, you've essentially got a cliffhanger getting you into the next chapter. So if you do this too much, then you'll end up with something a bit like a Dan Brown novel where <laughs> it gets exhausting and it's just kind of cheap trick after cheap yes. trick after cheap cliffhanger trick. Cliffhanger after cliffhanger. It's almost kind of like the um, parallel to M. Night Shyamalan's film where everything is a, about a twist. Yeah. Um, it's reusing the same techniques should i say over and over again it, it wearies you as a reader or as a, a viewer as a consumer of media um, <laughs> it does get exhausting because you're like i oh, just you know let's see something different you can have a bit of a chill out scene you can have a bit where the character reflects on what's just happened they've seen a mm. big monster appear and instead of just going ah let's get the monster uh, you know it might be like a scene where actually they reflect on it and you know they have a bit of a chill from yeah having this really traumatic thing happen to them. So I will send you these commandments <laughs> because they will fit your story. They'll fit your acts. I did the outline from a book, Blind Gambit. Mm. And what I did is I've basically got marked on it, the beats from the blank Snyder beat sheet. And I've got each scene has these commandments going on. So I've broken down every single scene into basically five sentences, six sentences. They hit the beats, they go through the story and then you get the satisfying ending. Hopefully. And hmm. I've got a theme running through it. And, you know, I, I think it's the best thing I've written. I, I really like the story. And early reviews, it seems to resonate with people. So that's good as well. So, yeah, I think for next week, then I'll give you the homework of, you mentioned that scene with the horse. Write that. Kind of try and structure it so you've got yourself a bit of a setup. You've got a inciting incident, progressive complication, going through to you know, your crisis and a climax and a resolution. So you're following a kind of very simple structure, write it as a scene, you know, it could be a short story, it could be a prologue or something like that to a story, but do that, just say you've got something written, try and make it more than a thousand words. Do you think you can do that? I I think I can give it a bloody good go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good, that's good. We'll do that then. All right, cool. Thanks for listening again. Remember, you can join our Facebook group and help us along with this. If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at JL Cronshaw. 
could you please leave a review on iTunes, help spread the word, or if you could share it with an author friend, that would be awesome. So until next time, cheerio. Bye. around podcast i'm john cronshaw and i'm russell evans last week i gave russ the homework to begin outlining his first novella how are you getting on with that um i've decided to spend a week basically just brainstorming essentially just allowing these ideas in my head to to naturally grow and then you can sort of help me maybe condense it a bit crystallize it other words that mean make it better or realer um but my vocabularistics are real good you see um this is, this is why you want to be a writer yeah? yeah obviously so that i can tell people things with words and stuff the way i'd imagined it was it's sort of like a soft intro to the world because the reader is still not getting a lot of explanation it's still largely you're getting to experience sort of mm, the wonder and the 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 bizarre nature of things but you're still getting to ponder about it it would essentially run that you know you got your prologue which I've, I've kind of obviously written out in rough and such um and then once once that's happened and she's shall we say moved on she would then appear in the underworld the sort of conceit if i think that's the right word i'd come up with was that inigo part of his job or part of what he's asked for his role to do like the nominee people asked to do is to essentially do tours of duty outside of the city looking for stragglers looking for people who have sort of been remade but need to be sort of found and brought back to the city so is there going to be a story in this or is this just going to be exposition basically because that's what it's sounded like to me so far is that you love your world and you just want to show it off yeah i think it's 50 50 because i'd had this idea that there are kind of nomad groups that live outside the city as well and have essentially rejected city life you know the counterculture that always exists to the norm and so they sort of live this raggedy existence outside uh, it's a bit mad max part of the reason why this job that inigo does exists is to try and stop the more should we say amoral of these groups from basically just finding people and using them to their own ends i'm imagining things like bandit kings and road warrior warlords and huge mishmash of that kind of stuff so my initial idea would have been that dora would spend a night or so with the caravan which is sort of the name of the group that inigo would lead to sort of go outside the city and then she would maybe have a freak out or she'd reject it and she'd be like no 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 this is all still a dream i'm still dreaming i've got complete control of this or you know what i mean i, I don't believe it i don't think it's real i'm rejecting this and i'm i'm just going to walk off i'm not going to buy into this because i don't trust it still feel like i'm dreaming which is going to be part of a problem in terms of how she transitioned over into this world because it's not like she was aware of how she died so she basically went from one dream state to what essentially equates to another kind of dream state i'm not letting the dream control me i'm not taking your advice i'm not doing what you're saying i'm gonna go and so she does go and then she gets picked up by another one of these groups through that she learns a bit more about the world i wouldn't want a huge expedition dump at the beginning expedition (laughs) um like i said my vocabularistics are real good like it would more be like a short little adventure where the hero the protagonist finds out that actually they are wrong that they actually better start accepting that this is the way the world is yeah. um, and learning how to function within it it's almost like a princess leia jab of the hut type situation except i'm not going to be putting her in a gold bikini or anything like that it's more of a well you're mine now like some nomad king conscriptor or something yeah. like that if she stays with this warlord or whatever it is then it's going to be devastating for her and there needs to be a real reason for her to get away so i'm just kind of thinking about this in terms of save the cat structure unless you've got more to add to this i'm thinking that this bit now could make either an opening first act or it could be 
a novella. Mm. What you'd need is almost the realisation by the end of this that it's not a dream. So that can be the learning arc of the story and the thing of her knowing who to trust. This could almost be structured in a bit of a hero's journey thing where Inago comes to her with the call to adventure and says, look, you need to come with me to the city. You need to become a ferryman and fulfil your destiny or whatever it is. Yeah. She'll refuse and go off into the forest to kind of seek her own quest. So that would be Act 2, which is in the Save the Cats thing. This would be the fun and games bit. This would be the promise of the premise where she is moving in with these warlords and things. But then by the midpoint, she realises that, oh my goodness, these warlords are terrible. If I don't do something, yeah. if I don't kind of take control and get away, and actually this Inago guy was right, and that would be a midpoint kind of flip. And in Act 3, you know, the bit after the midpoint, bad guys close in and all is lost. So you'd need to have something really bad happen to yeah. Dora when she tries to escape. Maybe it seems like actually she's going to be now killed or sacrificed or something. And then in the final act, she'll escape. She'll realise stuff's real and she'll find an ego or something like that. But she's got to do this kind of by herself and have this realisation. My idea was that it's like everything that's metaphorical that we talk about, how people affect other people, becomes very real in this world. So let's say she ends up being taken in by one of these nomad kings. And at first, it all seems very benign. It's like, no, we have chosen to live this life outside the city and not prescribe to their ideas and their beliefs. And we've got our own ideas about what this world is. But the leader has such a strong personality that by just virtue of that he essentially enslaves people Hmm. and the more people he enslaves it kind of becomes not so much a hive mind but it's almost like if if we were to say that someone's opinion in this world has a power level shall we even say to make it a little bit anime so you know the average person let's say they've got an opinion power level of three And then you'll have those who are more informed or in higher levels of position and it goes up and up and up. But you can also like augment your own opinion by having other people agree with you. And and it's more than just metaphorical. It creates a a persuasive force. It, It denotes reality and starts to sort of essentially... Um, in the minds of those who experience this opinion, it starts to just go, you know, this is correct. It's like saying that up is, you know, that up is up and down is down. You can't disagree with that, if you know what I mean. And so when people's opinions are backed up on large, before that, there's a sort of somewhat hard to accept as opinions and easier to accept as facts. And the trap will be that Dora will become a part of this group. And at first it won't seem awful because it'll seem like everybody gets on and everybody agrees and they've got synergy and it's actually quite nice but soon she'll start to realize that everybody just constantly echoes what the leader says and sometimes almost completely verbatim and so she starts to become suspect of it and this is where the conflict and the fun and games and everything starts to begin and in the end i would have inigo turn up to help her and in doing this inigo would be it would almost seem over the top because he would just turn up and if needs be slaughter these people do you know what a deus ex machina is i do indeed so you don't want inigo to be a deus ex machina yeah this is what foreshadowing's for so you can foreshadow this early on He maybe dropped something like, you can trust me and I'll prove it, or something like that. Yeah. But you can foreshadow that, but you don't just want Inego appearing like the cavalry at the end. It wouldn't be super contrived. There would definitely be a means by which Inego would be like, well, I've been looking for you, and I've been, you know, it's it's not just a simple matter of he's going to turn up and like, I'm here to solve your problems. Yeah. Um, It would actually, him turning up... It wouldn't really be about the fact that she would eventually need rescuing. I feel that she, as a character, and by ne- by uh, dint of what's happened to her in the dream, she has abilities and resistances that most people don't, and that she would have been actually okay. But it's more him turning up is not so much about him rescuing her, but it's also an attempt to show the reader that, like, I don't know, what morality is like in this world, and that, like, this, what this nomad is doing is essentially is slavery and is seen as um, one of the most amoral things you can do because you are literally wiping people's minds. You're not just physically enslaving them, but you are taking away 
the vital essence that makes them them and they are just becoming batteries for your opinion and that is seen as like a huge huge crime and so the idea is is that Inigo would turn up, but I believe I think that like Dora would be most of the way through rescuing herself anyway. When Inigo turned up, it wouldn't be so much to be riding like a white knight. It, it would be to like, well, I'm actually just doing my job here as well. And then it would you'd get to see the sort of the swift and somewhat black and white judgment. You know, you'd spend the first you know a few pages of the book within a go thinking like oh he's really nice cool laid back guy who's going to help dora out but then you also see him doing his job which sort of will give you another side to him which is not this nice laid back sort of friendly paternal guy who's but he's also like basically a cold efficient ferryman doing his job to the absolute letter i would say with this then you know you want him there for the first 25 percent yeah and then the next 50 percent you almost want him absent yep maybe having the people who are part of this tribe or whatever talk about Inigo. So you're always remembering him. You're not like... You're kind of like the boogeyman in the yeah. in, uh, in the wildlands sort of thing, yeah. Again, you know, going back to Save the Cat, the midpoint, you have almost like a public thing where the truth is revealed to her in some way. She has a big realisation, public shaming of some kind or... Yeah, yeah, something that reveals the sort of the, the deeper philosophy that informs something and then the main character realises that it's probably morally bankrupt or that, you know, that superficially everything seems to be fine and that it works, but deep down something is, is very wrong. In the Save the Cat thing, this is like the false defeat or false victory kind of thing. I was actually reading Save the Cat again last night just to kind of uh, go, you know, because it is really helpful and I'm kind of thinking about my current work in progress and... He uses the example of, like, Legally Blonde, yeah. where the girl turns up at what's meant to be, like, you know, a bit of a costume party, and she turns up in bunny ears and all this, and she's, like, publicly shamed, and then her boyfriend goes, I don't like you, Harvard doesn't like you. This happens again and again. The person assumes that she is this, and then it flips and it isn't, and by doing that, the truth is revealed, and then new ideas can come. And if you're going to do this one, I would do the mapping of it to Save the Cat, think of your midpoint think of your fun and games like with the fun and games stuff you can learn about the world but have a a mini subplot that okay we need to get x or y we need to get the golden fleece or you know some little or whatever mm. um, so you can learn about the world like because you're doing a novella you'd have 20 scenes say each of around a thousand words and in that way you get you know a twenty thousand word novella which is a nice amount for a novella so first scene would be I don't know, Dora waking up in this new place and then almost work backwards if you can. So you've got your opening image, you know, mm. that's going to be, she's waking up in this strange place and then write what is going to be in your last scene, which is, it's almost like the flip, isn't it? So we, we talk about the opening image and the closing image. In Save the Cat, he uses the example, I think it's of Sleepless in Seattle, where in the beginning, the guy is burying his mother and yeah. he's literally underground at the deepest depths, full of mourning, he'll never be able to love and all this. And then the final scene is him literally on the top of the world. He's on the top of the Empire State Building. He's love and all this. So the opening image is her, what, lost and alone. And then the closing image almost needs to be a flip of that mm. to show that kind of progression and change. And I think having the Inago character going, right, we're going into this other world, we're going into the city... Do you know what I mean? You, you've almost got a hook then for your next book. Of like, yeah. Wow, well, there's a bigger world, you know, this is just the, I'm just on the outskirts of something good. So Yeah, yeah, that's, I really like that idea, sort of just the idea of like the, the reveal of a much wider world. I always love it when they do that in like ongoing series. Yeah, so I think of computer games like Oblivion or Fallout 3, where you literally start in, in this underground world and you're there and you're going through it and, you know, you, you spend about an hour in the vault or in the dungeon before you actually see the real world. And it's just like, it's massive, especially in Fallout 3, where the main character didn't know any world beyond the vault. They live there their entire life and don't know anything else. And it's like the Plato's cave thing of... You yeah, know, the shadows, yeah. yeah. So you only know a little bit of the world in a weird way. And then all of a sudden, what you are at is just a tiny little piece and the world's yeah. much bigger and much more complicated than you initially thought. As much as a storytelling mechanic as that is, that's a gameplay mechanic insofar as it's almost tutorialising something. And that 
I feel can cross over into books as well. Obviously, it's not yeah. it's not quite tutorializing, but it's like here is a this is me getting you you used to a part of this world. Yeah, um, starting to lay the groundwork for you so that it, and it's not just like oh cold start in the city with all of this stuff that it wouldn't be like a ramp up it would just be like boom here's all this stuff blah 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 exposition exposition oh look at all this stuff look at the way the world works and yeah try and write this without doing any exposition without doing any explanation yeah things things happen and you react to what's going on around you 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 know there might be loads of things in your world that you want to talk about but you might not come across them in this story well, so one of the one of the things I, I, one of the things I'd wanted for Dora is <laughs> sounds uh, cruel, but you know, um, is I wanted her to be disfigured in in some way, not to reflect on the character, not to make the character be all like, oh no, about it, but to have a reason for it later in the story. So I'd had this idea that this nomad king, this warlord, whatever. At one point, near the, say, should we say, the end, the, the end point, the conflict of, of what's going to happen and when it gets resolved, because Dora isn't towing the line, he can't seem to exert the same influence over her because, again, of what's happened to her previous to this and the way her mind is sort of the state it's in. He takes her hand and he doesn't just sort of like, he doesn't cut it off or anything like that. He literally, he takes her hand, intertwines his fingers with hers and just closes his fist. And because he has a greater strength of will than her, he has more control over the matter that is her, that constitutes her. And he basically just, as if her hand is Play-Doh or anything, he just squeezes his fist and ruins her hand. I think that would be really good at the midpoint as well. Yeah. You need to build to this. You know, it could be like a shaming ceremony or something. Mm. Like, and maybe she sees other people in the tribe with crushed hands and maybe she talks to them like, you know, maybe in the second scene of the act. So then we're almost foreshadowing that there's these people and she talks to them and they can't articulate it or something. You know, well, I was thinking they all give the same message like it's not safe or like this is a hard world to live in or something really generic and something that's really like it's no real explanation. It's essentially just fobbing someone off because it's a generic answer that this leader has created which propagates through the minds of these people. Um, so that's why they're willing to accept it. And I imagine this scene where she's in sort of stocks or something um, and it was maybe uh, one of the things I was thinking is that maybe if it's both hands then at some point she can lash out at him and hit him in the chest with her ruined hands and she at one point tells him to give her her hand back and as she hits him in the chest her hand sort of partly goes in and when it comes back out she's got her like her hand is whole again Mm. Um, but she only manages to do it for like one hand that would be almost like one of your climax scenes Mm. so that would be you know your final battle almost maybe having an ego come in at that point so she's she has kind of done the necessary things she needs for her will yeah um and she's done it herself and then there's almost the moment of this guy kind of looking down in shock going how did you do that kind of thing yes and then so it's almost like she might have defeated him mm-hmm. and she's not just being rescued you know as you say by the knight in shining armor she is almost at the point where she's got enough will and the strength to do it. But this is where Inego comes in and he has to witness it as well. So he can go, right, you're definitely the person I'm seeking or something. Yeah. Like you could be could, like, you could have it that he's been watching her. He's been watching this whole thing go down um, yeah. and sort of waiting to see what actually happened. But yeah, that was essentially like you see, you get a hint of the weird shit that's, cap- that's possible in this world. And also you start to, and you know, maybe the astute reader would start to understand that a lot of it is about willpower and a lot of, about, a lot of it is about projecting your wants and so forth onto this reality. And, you know, to a degree, it allows you to have those things and act those things out if you have a strong enough will. Because Get it's almost like a portal fantasy where you've got a kind of fish out of water person in a weird world like this might actually work best to write it from a type first person perspective so you're you're literally in dora's head and going through as she's going through it 
and seeing what she's seen. And all this stuff's really weird and she's trying to make sense of stuff and you can have her thoughts about why is he doing this or, you know, your character's almost a stand-in for the reader. So yes. Dora doesn't understand the world, the reader doesn't understand the world and, and you're kind of there trying to make sense of it, which is where you can get some good misdirections in and good misunderstandings mm-hmm. because you're going from her assumptions and it's obvious that it's her assumptions and not just a kind of third person, more of a nebulous. Yeah, it's not just like a, ooh, what's this, said the writer, but more of a, like, like so you, you're empathising with the main character in that you're both sort of lost in what the hell's going on. Yeah, you can have a drawn to the little world building touches, but I mean, try and not bombard too many of them at once and not kind of relish in them. Like, whenever you're doing world building and where, whenever you're doing exposition, you need to try and have it do double duty. So it needs to be in service of the story and be as part of the action that leads to something and not just a list of things and a list of histories or whatever. Well, it's almost so. like the, the facts, should we say, or they're not going to be facts, but should we say observations or incidents? Yeah. They're not, the, the story isn't going to be written around them. Like mm-hmm. they are going to, they will spring from the experience of the main character. So uh, again, I don't, as much as I like the world I've built, I don't want it to just be, oh, look at this cool thing that I thought up, because it's really obvious when, when authors do that, I feel. Um, yeah, yeah, there was, um, I, I think it's called something like the Malazian Book of the Dead, the fantasy series. I started to read, and that was, there was too much of that. They love their world too much. They love their magic system too much. And Yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get you. I know what you mean. You know the magician series, like the Rift War stuff, like Darkness yeah. at Tethanon and stuff like that. Like I, I always felt that that was a great example of a really, really interesting magical system that was not just exposition dumped constantly throughout everything. Yeah, um, done well. And like yeah. Name of the Wind as well. Don't know if you've ever read. No, I didn't read that. Oh, Ross, read that. It's like <laughs> one of the best fantasy novels ever. Uh, yeah, Name Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, really good. And it's got like two magic systems. It's got like more of a mystical one and one that is more of a, um, like a mathematical one, which is, and they kind of both play off each other. Which is really That's cool. cool. Robin Hobb as well. If you've, have you read any of her stuff like the Farseer? No, I haven't, no. Oh, yeah. Just read them. They're great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think you could actually, I think you should read Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb, which is the first in the Farseer trilogy. Yeah. Because she deals with world building and this kind of first person thing really, really well. And magic as well, because there's different types of magic systems in that. There's like one called the wit, which is where he can bond with animals and things like that. And then there's one called the skill, which is almost like you're in this kind of spirit stream. And so there's a lot of really cool magic. There's a lot of really interesting world building. And it's done from this first person perspective. So even if you don't read it all, just, you know, read the first chapter and just see how it's done because it's it's really effective. And I think that could be a really good kind of, almost like a style guide for you. Yeah, I'll have a look. Hmm. Uh, Robin so- Hobb. Yeah, Robin Hobb. Oh, yeah, and I am aware of her. I've I've seen that she she has written books, and I have seen their covers, and thought, huh, maybe one day I'll read those. So it looks like I've got a good reason to actually start reading them now. Maybe, maybe do the audio book, just because you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cause time is a time is a commodity. Um, so what I would suggest then now is use the save the cat and look at your beat sheet. You know that your second act is going to be all about the fun and games bit within that tribe thing. You know that the midpoint is where she's going to have that public shaming and lose her hands. Yeah. Um, you know, your finale is going to be where she's getting her hand back and then the last bit, the resolution, is going to be her kind of going with Inago and almost on the hook of we're about to go into the city now. I like it. I'll, I, I feel... It's the thing. It's it's One of the things I have to say about this whole process is that, like, it, it's been, it gives me confidence because I have structure. Instead of feeling like these tasks are daunting and like, oh my god, I've I've got to go from having no words to having oh, like twenty thousand words. When you when you look at it like that, yeah, my my brain sort of cries a little bit. But yeah, it's it's the build up, learning this stuff from you. This you know the bit by bit by bit, the like layering it upon its each other and breaking like anything. Like everybody, like everybody who's ever tried to teach me anything in my life has tried to say it's all about breaking it down into manageable pieces. But my brain has always wanted to just do everything all at once, and I, you know, I've got to learn these good habits. I've got to learn to take my time. You know, yeah. Rome, Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah, go from scene one 
What's your opening scene? You know what that's going to be. She's waking up in the underworld. Where are we ending? So basically, you're going to be going backwards, <laughs> right? So what's your ending? And then you'll get all your causal links better yeah. than... It's weird. It's like if you work backwards, you get to think about cool causes that you might not necessarily have thought of that will lead you to this. So scene one, got that. Scene 20 or 24 or whatever. This is, you know, she's almost going to be at the edge of the city with an ego and him going, this is going to get real now. <laughs> yeah. If you, you know, what you think you've seen before, this is nothing. And then you've got a hook for the next bit. Yeah. And then, yeah. So working backwards, working backwards. You know your midpoint. You can write what your midpoint's going to be and almost building around these different beats. You don't have to do it in the order. And it's almost better not to and have this kind of different kind of progression and... As long as it kind of goes back to your opening scene, it's all good. Mm. And you've got your midpoint, which you know, which is that big moment where she is being publicly shamed and got all that cool stuff. I will <laughs> leave you with that. Um, how does that sound? Think you can do that, that? Sounds, that sounds good. It sounds very doable. It sounds, it sounds like I'm looking forward to doing it. Excellent. So do that. 20 scenes, 24, whatever you want. You know, If you think you need an extra scene here and there, it doesn't matter. Just add them. Try and stick to the Save the Cat structure if you can. I think once you get kind of near the end and the resolution bits, you are going to be leaving it open for another story, so you're not going to have that closure that you would with a full single arc, but you are going to be having a story that's finished, basically. You're going to be having it about her joining this warlord thing, things going well, things going wrong, and then her having to escape. That's kind of the main thing. So if you're enjoying this show, please do share it with a friend. We've got a Facebook group, search for Stop Booking Around. You can read the Stop Booking Around book. So if you are struggling with procrastination as an author, you can read that now. That's out on all good ebook retailers. You can follow me on Twitter. It's at JL Cronshaw. And if you want to email the show, it's john at johncronshaw.com. That's J-O-N-C-R-O-N-F-H-A-W. So until next time, cheerio. Bye. Stop booking around. I'm John Cronshaw. And I'm Russell Evans. This week, Russ, you sent me a text. So I'm a little bit concerned. I hope you're okay. You said you'd really struggled with this week's homework. Basically, I wanted you to start outlining your first story. And I'm just wondering whether you actually managed to get through that and what challenges you found and if there's anything we can do going forward to kind of help with that. It has been a struggle, to be fair. More so than the previous weeks, largely just because... To put it bluntly, I am a mental and I do have some, I do have issues from time to time that hold me back from, should we say, achieving or even just like sort of functioning at times. And, you know, it's just been one of those weeks. So I was, I was honestly really worried about whether I'd get it done, what the quality of the content would be, so forth and so on. Because, you know, you can get stuck in your own headspace, you know, and it's hard, like, you know, I think some of the prime advice you've given me is just don't look back. Just keep going, keep going, keep going until you've got something that has a beginning, middle, and end, and then look back and see what it is. And it's just difficult. Like when I was, you know, this last week when I'm when I'm in that kind of mental state, you know, everything is an over examination. Everything is a, a critique. You know, when in regards to myself and, and my view of myself and things I may do or make. So I think it's been especially hard this last week to follow that advice, but I have followed it because. I think this is important. This podcast is important. I think that if people are listening to it, then I am obliged in some ways to sort of to follow through and to make something of this. Works. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just... Now, so, so have you done it then? Have yes. Long story Excellent. short, I've done it. Yes. All right, that's, that's fantastic then. So you've known me for years and yeah. I've lived with depression for a long time and I almost use the writing and things like that and having things to aim for as a way to get through this. 
and it works for me. There's a thing that I always think about, which really helps. And it's almost about reframing fears. Because I think one of the things with depression, with anxiety, they're both fear-led, aren't they? They're both about fears. Yes. And they're both about kind of putting fears in the wrong place. Or maybe they are genuine fears. You know, you can be depressed because, hey, I've got a disability. It's degenerative. And that can be really hard to deal with. Yeah. You know what I mean? But my fear isn't I'm going blind and I need to live with that every day and it can only get worse. My fear is if I don't do what I need to do, if I don't produce these stories that are in my head and in my heart, then I'm going to regret that. So the fear that drives me isn't the fear of degeneration. It's the fear of my future self regretting yeah. what I didn't do. You know, my biggest fear is being one of these people and you, you live in Wolverhampton and there's a lot of people I know who live in Wolverhampton still mm. who hate Wolverhampton, who've spent their life going, I hate Wolverhampton I want to move somewhere else and they never do and they regret it and they're unhappy and they die I got out of Wolverhampton and I do not regret it and I'm glad that I did find that kind of drive for you if you can mm find out what it is that will drive you as a bigger fear than your fear of being perfect or doing something good. Your fear should be something that if you don't do this, then you're going to have this idea in your head and it'll just be an idea. <laughs> yes. Idea Ideas are cheap. Uh, yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah, they, they're, so, they're 10 a penny. But, it's but I mean, want. yeah, so early homework <laughs> for <laughs> next week is to figure out, and you don't have to tell me about this, you know, keep mm. this to yourself, but Try and work out a fear that you can set against your existing fears that you can kind of use to battle whatever it is that is pushing you into these darker places. The fact is, as well, Rush, you've gone through it and you did the task that you were set. And as hard as you found that, you've done it. I think that's a really positive step for you because I think in the past you would have just been like, oh, forget it. You know, I'll do it another time. You will have put it off, but you've pushed through it like a marathon runner, pushed past that wall and you've now achieve something even if it's really bad even if it is a <laughs> shitty outline yeah we can work we can build on that that's it, the point. it's still an outline though isn't it that's the, exactly. that's the point yeah it's a sketch it's a sketch and it's gonna be bad it yeah. might have plot holes it might not make sense but you've now got a little thing you can build on so focus on that that is really positive yeah i've just got to build up the muscles is the thing i've just got to get that muscle memory you know what yeah. i mean like as much as i enjoy the idea of writing the practice of writing right now is still a little bit alien to me still yeah. a little bit unnatural and so occasionally my my self-doubt and my self-criticism gets the better of me instead of just like just get through it get it push through like you said push through be like a marathon runner it's not it's not a sprint it's not yeah. about getting it all done before i run out of breath mm. And let's be honest, how difficult is it really going to be for you to produce something that's shit? Do you know what I mean? That's, that's what you're aiming for. Thanks, John. <laughs> so, Thank you. No, it is. You, you, you've got to remember that. That's really yeah. important. You're not producing this amazing thing. No, you're right. I'm yeah. just I'm just doing the most bare bones right now. Yeah, the most you're, bare you're, making, bones. you're making a minimum viable product yeah, mm -hmm. of your story. We'll be able to know what's going on, and then we can make it make sense and, and that's going to be the name of my tea. autobiography by the way <laughs> minimal viable <laughs> product <laughs> yeah but you'll have to write it russ so. oh fuck <laughs> <laughs> yeah i hope that makes sense i don't know i, I mean yeah it that, does that's just, it, yeah it, does. Know, it really it, does <laughs> it's just coming you know that's just coming from how i deal with things and my issues are obviously different to your issues and everyone's issue is going to be different and I think this is the point where I should say, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychiatrist. <laughs> no, we're neither of us are. Yeah. We're just talking about our personal experiences. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, mental health, if it does get in the way of creativity, then, hey, maybe it's not writer's block, maybe it's not these things, maybe you do need to get some kind of medical intervention or therapeutic intervention. As a small aside, if you are out there and you are listening and you do find yourself suffering from similar problems, talk about it find somebody to talk about it there's a lot of good services out there that will help you and believe me as, as someone who spent a long time dealing with this and spent a long time thinking that i could just logic my way through it or philosophize my way through it it's more than just a mental thing it is it is chemical is to do with your biological makeup it's something that you don't have a lot of control over but you can mitigate and recognize a lot of the problems it can cause you so you can get through it so but 
that's dependent on you. You have to make the effort to try and get through it as well. And best thing you can do as well, I found really helped me was getting up at the same time every day and having a good breakfast. So one <laughs> fat and protein, lovely stuff. <laughs> lovely stuff. <laughs> scrambled eggs, perfect. You know, scrambled eggs on toast, cut into quarters. <laughs> anyway, anyway. We've, we've gone on a bit of a tangent. Plus here. we're doing a podcast, aren't we? Yeah. yeah, yeah right. So okay, tell me about your outlining. So you've done it. That's fantastic. Yes, I did it. I followed the um I followed the twenty sort of chapter idea you set me um i don't know how closely it follows any structure right now i have given it what i consider to be sort of up troughs and peaks so it's it's got a dynamic um but i'll just basically i will hmm? does it progress it does progress yes um it has a beginning middle and end so, that's a good start. Yes, <laughs> really it is. is. Really is. Because <laughs> you, you remember, you were just saying about the scenes, that yeah. you, you know, moments that you liked. Like if this has got a causal progression or whatever, then yeah, you've already stepped up. Mm-hmm. So go on and tell me what you've got. Okay, so it's very basic. But what I was thinking is that we, you know, we could talk about each little scene and it'll help me sort of crystallize that. Yeah. So, so we get the first. We get the first scene. It's this is say like after the uh the prologue uh in which you know dora is still in her dreams so she wakes up in the in the underworld she's sort of no idea where she is completely lost she has no she has no control over her surroundings anymore as far as she knows she can't interact with them in the same way at this point dora is is picked up by inigo so inigo his job that he has taken essentially for himself is that he goes in a, a small caravan, um, not like a static caravan, but like, no, you know, I understand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he just rocks up in a 1970s beige unit and it's wonderful. Um, yeah, just moves. Flary, flary curtains. Yeah. And, uh, it's just like yeah. a giant version of the luggage from yeah. the Pratchett books. It's just got loads of feet. Um, uh, browns and creams everywhere. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so he has like, I envisioned it sort of like a, a traditional sort of gypsy caravan type affair like almost like a circus caravan. His, his role is that he spends time outside the city looking for stragglers, people who have we say, manifested or been created maybe too far from the city to be able to make their way to it naturally and are at, at risk of sort of losing themselves or being subsumed by other things. So the first scene is him picking her up and obviously the, you get the initial like wariness of like, what the fuck is this? Why is this happening? I know that. And obviously to an extent, Dora will still be like, yeah, this is a dream, but this is new. Something's happened. I've actually probably gone fully insane now. So we get a scene of an introduction to Inigo slowly, but surely I want each scene to be another little piece of snippet just to help the reader alongside Dora sort of pick up things about the world. So that's like the first initial scene where she, you know, okay, you get that introduction, she accepts what's going on, and so they they set off. The second scene is kind of this, this road trip-esque. It's almost to show the passage of time as well, like the 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 continent, the, the, uh, the landmass is huge is is absolutely gigantic uh, because the city itself is the size of a country so the the landmass which it sits on is like is like the size of a continent so they have to travel quite a distance to get back through you know different environments and and sort of landscapes they don't vary that much but uh, the point is is that everything outside the city is kind of flat and gray because there's nobody there to proc anything to sort of be there but there are still pockets of weirdness and flora and fauna the flora and fauna in the underworld is largely defined by things like mythology and snippets of uh, superstition and so forth and so on so it's not like there are greek myths living outside the city but it's the idea that you know people's there's folklore through thousands of years and these things get passed down through people and then in the underworld, all these sort of supernatural things, all these boogeymen and all these kind of ideas. And it's not always just naturally just like the boogeyman, but like it has created weird pockets of um, flora and fauna outside the city. So, you know, they will, they'll travel towards the city. There'll be more sort of ex, not, it won't be heavy, but it's again, it's about Dora learning and also being cynical. It's a, it's a, it's a chance for me as a writer to present ideas and then also as a writer to make those ideas look stupid through Dora's eyes, um, which I think will be fun. So it's almost like somewhere between opening an image where we're getting a 
snapshot of the character and maybe you know we could even have the statement to the theme here so we'll have inago showing her the ropes kind of thing give, telling her a bit about the world and you've got the literal progression from not knowing where she is to with a target of heading towards the city so yeah, yeah. It, it starts it's, it's the first it's the first thing it's like this is the first step in the story to like we're moving towards a place where a story can happen and now we're learning about the realm in which it would happen the kind of things that may be possible you know as i as, as i try and sort of fill in the little bits of the world for the reader i'm hoping that it would like spark their imagination as to the kind of things that could happen in this world so you'll have that sort of section that would be like a couple of i think that would be like two chapters one would be sort of the the initial journey and explanation and then the other would be leading up to sort of like a greater revelation that Inigo doesn't volunteer but is sort of forced upon Dora which is that she witnesses Inigo do his job and she also witnesses his true form so in terms of Inigo doing his job there would be a point at which they see a body and so Inigo stops and he, he goes to do his job which is to see if he if they can be reclaimed if they can be helped or anything like that and at this point they get sort of swamped by they are essentially analogs for zombies but there's something a bit more sad and tragic to them it's like the mind the mindless dead who are people who have died in terrible ways that broke them before they died and so when they appear in the underworld there's just basically the vestiges of life that are left there is a sort of something there driving on their form but they are by all means sort of mindless and the only thing they have the only drive they had have is to be closer to something else like there's a an innate want to be part of something because they've lost so much of themselves and so far as what's understood about the mindless dead so this happens and he is sort of dispassionately deals with it like a professional, but it's a fairly horrific scene because he's essentially hacking what looks like, like humans or humanoids to pieces, um, like butchering them because it's the only way to stop them. Like with a zombie, you could cut its head off and it would die, but these things, they're like, they don't have brains. Like they are just a, a, a body. They are matter. So even if you cut their heads off, they still keep coming and so forth and so on. So, he literally has to butcher them. And she sees it as like a very violent and dark thing um, because it's not anything she's ever witnessed before. Whereas Inigo is completely and utterly nonplussed by it and in some ways very cold and detached from what he's doing. Um, So that instantly sort of makes her wary of him. And it, it's this initial sort of like, okay, well, who is Inigo then? Like, because he's he has presented himself as this, but I'm now seeing this, and so that puts some doubts and some thoughts in her head, and puts the fear into her about what this world is. So then we move on to the next scene where night falls, and Inigo explains that it's very rare that night falls, and even though in the underworld you don't really need to sleep, a lot of people still do. When the night finally falls, a lot of people will sleep because it's sort of like a treat almost. Again, because night and day are decided in a sort of random way by the general consensus, people still do like some vestiges of being human. So it's kind of almost like a celebration when it gets dark. Uh, Like in the city, there'd be events and so forth and so on. But most people take it as like, yeah, it's almost like a religious holiday in some ways because it happens so little. So Inigo is like... If you're going to sleep, now is the time. He retires to his caravan and he leaves Dora essentially to her own devices. And at some point she goes into his caravan to wake him. But before she does, she sort of has a look around. And this is where she sees the painting of his... I don't know if I've spoken much about Inigo's backstory, but he has a painting of uh his his lover when he was alive um in the underworld you you know you can't take photos or anything like that but there are certain people who have the ability to draw out memories and sort of create art from them he has this painting in his caravan and so so, so she looks at it and she's trying to figure out like what it is because it seems very real if for a painting and it but she can see that it's fading as well she looks at that and then she wanders over to inigo to sort of shake him and wake him up and as she does he is like she looks at him and he's lying on his bed and he's just a mess like he's a he's he's got no nose his face is is cut and 
torn open. He's like missing fingers. His his whole body is covered in scars and lesions and open wounds and so forth and so on. And at this point, obviously, she, she screams. She like she jumps back in fear. She doesn't know what's going on. He wakes up and he's still like he's like what's wrong? But he's talking to her normally. But he still looks. Well, it looks like hell. He looks like he's been tortured to death, which is what happened to him. So she, at that point, she sort of, no, she backs away in fear and she like, she puts her hand out to steady herself and she puts her hand on his paddle. And one of the things that paddles do is that no one else can lift them. Like if you're not the owner. So if you try to pick it up, it <laughs> kind of works a bit like Thor's hammer in that it becomes impossibly heavy. Um, so you can't pick it up. And as she touches it it becomes heavy and falls through the bottom of his caravan and shit goes everywhere and it's like this huge panic and she flies out of the caravan and like he comes out afterwards and he looks completely normal now and so it's another bit of a chance to give a bit of exposition about Inigo and what happened to him and that he was alive during the Spanish Inquisitions and his lover was accused of being a witch and she was and he was tortured to confess and say that she was and then um, you're, not, you're not going to give that stuff away now, are you? No, in no, no, not not completely. Okay. But uh, there's going to be hints that, yeah, like, he'll be like the uh, yeah, he'll explain that like the way you die affects the way you appear in this world. And he was tortured to death. He won't say that. He won't say he won't be explicit. But he'll, a lot of euphemism, a lot of hinting that like his his end was not the best end you could possibly have, and it had an effect on his introduction into this world, and he had to be rehabilitated and brought back round and that's kind of part of his motivation for being out here trying to find people who may not necessarily be in the best state and try to help them and bring them back so it's this thing of like she thinks you know she at first he appears to be a monster and then she realizes he's actually got good reasons so forth and so on but she's still shook by all this like all these all these revelations of the nature of the world and things like that and the the sort of the fact that everybody's origin here is death and so that has you know that has to be recognized and it's a dark subject so everybody here is tinted by that sort of darkness um yeah so with with this bit i think you've got you've got something good here you've just got to be careful with it being too going into this well this is my backstory you know yes um but having revelation as a way of doing exposition is really good. You know, not just having, oh, he was this and that. It's like having this kind of revelation and it affecting the other character in the way she sees him. That's more effective. So I think that, yeah, spot on with that. Mm. The next bit is the point at which she decides to leave. And it's another thing that's kind of traumatic to her. She's like, at that point, she's like, no, I'm done. I, I need, it's not a logical thing or anything like that. She's basically having a, panic attack she's not coping with what's going on and so the thing that happens is is that after this has happened inigo goes back to his caravan to fix it and to go back to sleep and she's just kind of left there the only person that's awake everyone else is taking the opportunity to sleep and she notices the caravan is drawn by automata of horses that don't seem to have any moving like gears or anything like that they look like mangled frameworks in the shape of horses they basically you know they pull the caravan so she's sort of wandering around the camp and she sees something she seen before which is like a giant like a big cage and as she gets closer to it she realizes that there's a a horse in the cage and it starts to feel weird because the horse looks exactly like the horse in her dream mm. And so it's the thing that was hurting her, but it's also a familiar thing now. But she walks up to it, and because she feels like it is that horse, it essentially becomes that horse. Like like everybody in this world, her will, her her mentality affects things around her. And she doesn't know it at this point, but like these things are... So the word nightmare is literally night horse, mare as in horse. And the idea was that if you were having bad dreams, it's because the nightmare had flown over your house. And it's a, the nightmare is a black horse with uh, flaming hooves and you know, breathes fire from its nostrils and it, it, it treads the air. In the underworld, nightmares are real and this is how they are personified. Again, it's like I was saying about the flora and fauna being affected by things like superstition and folktale and things like that, things that have come over from the living world. So these things exist, but they don't exist properly in the day so it's rare so they have to be caught during the night 
in the day they are essentially nothing they are they still exist but they're like perceived as like a, a heat haze if anything so she, she walks up to the cage and she's afraid of it. in this interaction there'll be some talking to herself talking to the horse trying to deal with the situation you know she reaches through the cage you know to to touch the horse and so forth and so on and as she does that the sun it's not even the sun it doesn't work like that but it starts to get light and as it starts to get light the cage starts to sort of crack and buckle and get smaller and smaller until it essentially crushes the nightmare and becomes the shape of it as the nightmare dissipates into just this energy in the day they've basically learned to harness this energy in automata like they bind it to this framework and so during the night it expands becomes a cage to house the nightmare and when it's light it crushes the nightmare and is driven by the nightmare's energy and becomes this automata um, but it's a very traumatic thing for her again as well because this she's just met this horse again that is something that's familiar and maybe a comfort to her in some way but then she sees this horrendous moment in which it's crushed and subsumed by the cage and again just becomes a slave and she feels that's, that's all that cool, by the way <laughs> <laughs> that. I think that's really cool <laughs> this is the thing as well i mean i know i've been talking to you about structure and things like that but yeah don't lose sight of having cool stuff <laughs> yeah <laughs> like that's really important especially with fantasy it's like i know when i've been planning my fantasy that i'm gonna be doing next year um the thing that i keep coming back to is like right what can i do that's really cool so it's yeah, <laughs> definitely yeah that's that's awesome cool thank you so that happens and it, it, it's like that's it she's done she can't cope the thing that she thought she'd found that was familiar and that was also in some ways an avatar of her has been crushed and subsumed and enslaved so she runs and she runs until she hits like a forest into the next scene when she's in the forest and she's obviously still lost and she doesn't know what she's doing and she has a close call in the forest like either again with the flora or the fauna i'm not quite sure what it will be at this point but there will be something again she'll be exposed to the nature of this world and be incapable of dealing with it so she gets rescued slash captured by a group who essentially lead her deeper into the forest to where there is like a township almost where there's a couple hundred people there and she sort of is introduced to their leader and, and their society and so forth and so on and so then we get another point of view from like someone else that lives in this world and it's the idea of like well this person what they're saying is kind of challenging some of the things inigo said and then obviously dora thinks back to what she knows of inigo and can she really trust him in terms of what she's seen of him and so forth and so on basically she's here now and she can't get back out the forest so she just she goes along with it because she's just so tired and she's falling back into this mentality of not wanting to make a choice which is essentially playing into the hands of the person who was rescued slash captured her. So she starts to learn more about the people around her and how they died and so forth and so on. And it's, it's kind of flavor text for what it's like to live in this world. But then she starts to realize that something's kind of off more so than just where she is right now and what her situation is. Isn't that like people seem to repeat certain phrases a lot in this place and they don't seem to disagree with each other ever. And it just doesn't seem right to her. And she's not just trying to be like cynical about it, but she's something's genuinely off. Like in situations where people should probably genuinely have an argument or a fight about something, it's almost like it gets to that point and then something happens and those people just kind of go like, boo. And then, you know, if almost something kind of go into like low power mode and become very obsequious and just very like, yes, yes, of course, no problem. And as she grows more aware of this, more paranoid of it, she realizes the only person that doesn't exhibit any of this is the leader. And so she begins to sort of talk to other people about it. And she even starts to question the leader about the nature of what's going on here. He plays it off like he's a savior. Like he's like, these are my flock and I have rescued them. And, you know, who else was going to do it? And, you know, I, I keep them safe. I give them purpose. They don't become the mindless dead because I'm here giving them something to do. And that something to do is essentially just like be his servants, build for him and so forth and so on. With this, I mean, I think this would be a longer section than a scene. I think you'd need. Oh, yeah. All of this, I'm, I'm kind of moving back and forth. There's about four scenes 
the, the sort of cover the things I'm I'm talking okay. about here. Yeah. So it's yeah. she gets there, she's introduced to her situation, begins to become weary of the situation and look at it and think about it. Then she starts to question it openly and verbally. And then she starts to question the wrong people about it, and then she, through her actions, she essentially she kind of accidentally awakens in some ways one of the other captives and that's the point at which her captor sort of reveals his sort of true nature in that he is a tyrant and these people are his essentially slaves and in some ways no better than the mindless dead and in some ways worse because they still have vestiges of humanity but it's being suppressed by this leader's force of will. And that's why they're also subservient and they don't disagree with each other because he wants this perfectly ordered society that functions based purely on his will and not the general consensus. So in order to make an example of her, he crushes her hand. He, he turns her into an almost literal beast of burden. He takes away parts of her humanity by removing her dexterity and her ability to manipulate objects. And he, he basically disables her in order to, in order to dehumanize her and, and make her weak of 20. So we've got to 10 where she has reached the, pe- the peak of causing problems. Yeah. Um, and then this is now moving into like the trough where she gets punished. <laughs> And it's sort of she, and so we're moving down low again in terms of uh, her experience. So at this point, she's like, it's like a public thing as well. He does it to her in front of everybody to teach a lesson. And the next scene is essentially, well, it's going to be her feeling sorry for herself. She doesn't have hands. She has messed up stumps that look like Play-Doh that's been crushed by a child. And she's very close to just accepting this is her fate and acquiescing to him moving into the next scene where we'll have like a little bit of passage of time where she's just doing the job where she's just a mule and she's just carrying things around about on her back and she keeps seeing the horse again like she doesn't know whether it's her she doesn't know whether it's actually one of those horses that horse from this point on it's it's her part of her inner self it's a manifestation of herself and every time she sees it it's like a part of herself stepping outside and sort of trying to remind her who she is and seeing the horse is what stops her from completely losing her mind to this person's will now in the guise of a more subservient person she begins to learn more about how this guy can do what he does she will come to a point where she has to make a choice the choice will be in that moment and it will be from that point on, she will either be one of these people or she will be herself and she will have to fight back. She does that. She confronts him again, but she does it in front of everybody to try and sort of turn the tables on him. And as she's doing it, he just reaches forward and just removes her forearms. She's just got her arms down to her elbows now. And it's again, it's this like, that's it now. She can't beat him. She realizes that and she's about to end up in the state that he said that she would end up in. And this is the point at which Inigo turns up <laughs> and like helps her because he's been looking for her. She ran off and he's been tracking her ever since. So he turns up and then we realize that Inigo isn't just some guy because when he turns up, her captor freaks out. And it starts to have an effect on the people around him. Like they all start to get like hysterical as well and then it just comes down to a good old fight so they start having a fight and the captor starts to get desperate and he starts to do something which is he starts to absorb his captors so there are some of them that haven't fled some of them just lying on the floor cowering and so forth not his captors his captives lying on the floor afraid paralyzed with fear so he he starts to absorb them he starts to take them into his body and he starts to grow and get bigger. He maintains his shape at first, but he becomes larger and larger as he absorbs the body mass of other of his victims. But it doesn't phase Inigo, and Inigo still continues to intimidate him and berate him and, and tell him how weak he really is and what he really is. And after a certain point of absorbing all this mass, the captor can't keep himself together so when he absorbs all these other personalities as well it starts to create fractures in his in his own personality and thus that sort of is manifest in his physical form so he starts to become like a horrendous chimera of body parts and so forth and and then he starts to like lose cohesion and such like that at a certain point dora has the idea she sees him taking things she gets angry and she's like i want 
to take back what's mine. You have something of mine, like you have a part of me and I want it back and I will take it from you. So mid fight, she reaches into him and pulls out her, she's got, her arms are complete again, apart from her right hand. She couldn't get that back. So that's still cut off to like the wrist, but she gets her forearm back on the right arm and she gets her own, the entirety of her left arm and hand back. And doing that is almost like, you know, when you play Kaplunk and you pull the, the last thing out <laughs> and then everything finally falls to pieces. It's like that. That last thing is like pulling the linchpin out of him and he just starts to collapse. Dora's force of will and personality is starting to come out now and she takes away his cohesion and his certainty because no one has ever done that to him before she takes back what he took from her and he starts to fall apart and in that he is defeated and he just becomes a nothing he becomes uh, an amalgamation of all these personalities that are trapped together and inigo again has to just eviscerate him because it's the only way and again dora still reacts poorly to that because he does it with such cold calculated professionalism and he doesn't come away afterwards and be like but that was very difficult and i know we went through something there he's just like there you go that's done now and Mm -hmm. she's still reeling from this awful experience you've got all that you get the reconciliation of inigo being like why did you run look at what happened look at i was supposed to be back in the city a week ago i've been looking for you for a week you get the chiding the the sort of the mentor kind of moment where he's telling her off but in a kind of parental way he does obviously care about her and he cares about her well-being but it's also she's made a massive dick move and made things really difficult for himself and her and she's caused herself to be mutilated because of not being careful and so forth and so we get the start of this relationship but at this point they leave and it's like the last part of their journey back to the city and it will end just as they get to the city gates and like this is the point now where he goes like right now it's time to start making choices now it's time time to start genuinely learning about your situation and, and who you are now and what you are and that would be sort of just like where it ends really good that's a lot more detail than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> I think I sent you one of my eight lines and I do like a couple of sentences for a chapter, you know, <laughs> so mm-hmm. you've got a lot of detail here to flesh out. But yeah, on the whole, I think it works really well, actually. I made notes as I was going along, so I'm just looking through these now. Yeah. It's the deus ex machina thing that is the only thing that I would want to urge against, but you can get away with this by, you know, you go just dropping a line somewhere like you've got to come with me what if i don't want to well whatever i'll find you you know something yeah. like that where he will say you know if you run away then you can't escape this <laughs> yes so, something little like that so when he does find you, it's not going to make people roll their eyes and go oh look the cavalry's arrived just a slight thing so it's not going to be a complete like it will be surprising mm. when it happens but not a complete surprise to someone yeah. who's paying attention. Well, and I think we need to establish a little yeah. bit of a reason why Dora is important, why he needs to take Dora. Like, because I don't know if that's clear yet. Well, it it won't be super clear at first because I'm not. I don't want heavy overtones of like you're the one. It's mm. more the fact that if this is Inigo's job. Like, yeah. this is his job, and this is what he does. And he, if he's doing this kind of cold stuff and he's doing it very professionally. Yeah. And it, then that's his motivation. And that's the thing of like, look, my job is to get you to the city. That's what I need to do. As long as he says that at some point here, then it's like, well, he's really have to do his job. Mm. Well, uh, that's that will be the reason that he presents. There will be more to it. Yeah. But that will be revealed later on. He obviously yeah. sees certain things in Dora that he doesn't reveal straight away. And under the guise of being a professional and doing his job and so forth and so on, that is the reasons yeah. he'll give. When he talks about his life, he will mention that he was like a, basically like a mercenary. And so he can do things like hunt and track and stuff like that. So that's what makes him good at this job. Yeah, as long as we know what his motivation is, which is he needs to get Dora to the city. And yeah. as long as we get to see that he's very thorough with his job and he'll, he does it to the letter or whatever. You know, as long as we kind of shown that early on, we don't have to say anything. We just need to see that if that makes sense. Yeah, this is <laughs> leading me on nicely to next week's homework, actually. <laughs> so I think you've done really well with this. I think this is a really solid outline. The story sounds like it's going to be really cool. Start writing it, man. <laughs> yeah. Just, I did send you that um, the writing program. Mm-hmm. And what you can do with this program is you can set up scenes. So you set up a document and then you set up a chapter and a scene. 
and you essentially write a scene in a single document within this bigger document. I know what you mean. Yeah. Okay, so then instead of you opening up the document and go and like, you know, if you open up a Microsoft Word document, you'll scroll through it until you get to the end. You're literally working on one scene at a time. You close that scene. You start a new scene. You've got a blank page in front of you. I can't even remember what it was called now. It's like Atomic Writing or something. Yeah, I think so. Um, So it's basically like a a freeware version of a program called Scrivener, which I would recommend for writers if you are serious about this and you've got a spare 30 quid. It's like the best word processor you can get as a writer, and it's about 30 quid. might be less. (laughs) So it's well worth the investment. And it's, yeah, it's this kind of breaking it down and having cork boards and things like that to look at you. <laughs> yeah, so, it's it's well. very it's very handy. Like, I need a lot of visual reference when I'm writing. I find it hard to keep things uh, ordered in my brain. Um, yeah. it's, it's called Atomic Scribbler. Um, That's it. For, for anybody out there who, who's interested in using a piece of software like this, yeah, it is good. Yeah, there is a paid version, which is better, called Scrivener. It's completely ridiculous how cheap this software is for what it can do. It's very powerful. Having this, because I know what you'll do, you'll open up a document, you'll be like, right, I need to write scene two. Oh, but scene one's there in front of me. I'm mm. scrolling past, and I've just noticed a typo. So I'm going to go back to that and just correct <laughs> oh, You know what, that line there doesn't look that great. I'll just, just fix that. And then you'll just get into that pattern again. If you find this atomic thing you're spending too long, just messing around with it, and you're getting a resistance from that, just do it in whatever you're writing, but do each scene in a separate document. Yeah. So you're only focused on the particular scene you're working on. So, yeah, just start doing that. Start with scene one, write that. Try and give yourself a routine or a word count per day to hit. Mm. Like 200 words is probably a good start. Do that, you'll hit a scene a week. If you do more than that, even better. But try and do a little bit every day if you can. That's yeah. that's the key is getting into this routine. I've got 20 scenes. So yeah. what I might do is if I try and try and write five of those scenes a week. That is a big ask. That is actually a big ask for us. Yeah. These scenes, yeah. Just don't give yourself such a big target because okay. you're going to miss it in the first week. <laughs> and then you're going to go, oh, I'm so behind. And then it's going to yeah. have that thing. So instead of looking at it like that, Mm. look at it right i need to do at least 200 words a day on it if you do five a week perfect brilliant you know but don't don't go for it like that because some of these scenes might be longer than you think by next week say have the first scene done yeah in the first draft form it won't be very good because it'll be a shitty first draft remember that but the point is you need to get to the end and just have it written if you've written this by monday say and you think well i want to do scene two as well go for it just push through what you can. Don't give yourself that target of I need to hit five scenes this week because you'll feel really bad when you miss it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in addition to that, because, yes. you know, we need to start teaching you how to write. <laughs> yes, that's important. Yeah. So yeah, story's great, whatever. And you, <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't actually matter that you're not going to write a perfect thing in your first draft. This mm-hmm. is the point now, getting it down. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to have a look around, find some, probably some podcast episodes that I've got in mind Yeah, that are about the first topic of learning your writer's craft, which is showing, not telling. Mm-hmm. They probably already know this stuff, but it's really useful to hear examples of this and you know okay. how to Im- implement it in your writing. So we'll learning, do that. learning it as a discipline, isn't it? It's like... It's, well, like, it's, it's a craft. It is a yeah, craft. So. It's a ten- trying to stick to certain tenants and also knowing when not to stick to them. But yeah, like <laughs> the idea of showing, not telling, it's getting it, moving away from it, just being like a concept that I've got to follow and, and ingraining it in what I'm doing. Yeah. So hopefully next week we'll come back. We'll talk about hopefully your opening scene, maybe more. And we'll talk about showing, not telling. And awesome. Does that sound good? That sounds good. Excellent. So yeah, you, you've done really well. <laughs> it's like that's a really cool outline. I think your story's solid. Just be careful with the Deus Ex Machina. Yeah, and just a little bit of foreshadowing. I mean, even if you don't put it in your first draft, we can add that later. But yeah, just get on with it now. <laughs> <laughs> right then. Yeah, time to actually start working then. If you've enjoyed this show, please do share it with an author friend. Leave a review on iTunes, all that good stuff. If you want to join the Facebook group, it's Stop Booking Around. You can check out the book, Stop Booking Around. That's how you can support the show, help pay for things like hosting, buy the book, leave a review on that. That'd be really great. It's under my real name, which is Jonathan Cronshaw. So uh, 
do check that out because I, you know, I didn't want to mix up my my brands. <laughs> <laughs> And follow me on Twitter at JL Cronshaw. Join the Facebook group. You got anything you want to plug? No, no, not, not right now. I'm not. Check I'm out, not, check I'm out not, Russ's, Russ's merch. <laughs> I'm not particularly plug worthy at this moment. I'm just a like a chicken in a hurricane right now. So, uh, <laughs> just uh, awesome. keep coming back and listening to me model through this. <laughs> awesome, and and just send Russ some support. You know, I'm sure he'll want to hear it and hear your positive advice. So until next time. Cheerio. Bye. to the Stop Booking Around podcast. I'm John Cronshaw. And I'm Russell Evans. We're here today because Russ has started writing his first novella. How's it going, Russ? <laughs> Slowly. <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know, it's difficult. It's hard to find time. I don't know, I mean, how do you do it, really? Because it's one of these things, like, I've got a job and I've got a family and I have finite time. And if things sort of change it's difficult for me to be able to sit down and, and get that sort of get that rhythm and have that time and that space to be able to sort of get in that sort of creative flow so it's it's a commitment really like and I knew it would be but it's the sort of the reality of it is dawning on me and I'm starting to realize that I'm, I'm going to have to be maybe a lot more regimented even if things sort of get in the way I'm going to have to find time so I'll just like I don't know how you do it so yeah. is, is there any, any advice you can give me? <laughs> well, it's hard. You know, I mean, I mean, I do this full time now, so, you know, yeah, it, it's fine for me. I, I've, I get the days where my son's at school, so I write when he's at school. So that's easy. The thing with balancing it with work is difficult and family and life. And I always suggest getting into a routine, getting into a rhythm. And when life kind of throws things at you, that can be difficult. Mm. Now, one thing that, I would say is I know an author who she's crazy busy. She's got, she's got a job and she, you know, she's got kids Mm. and she writes the way she writes is she snatches whatever time she's got. She dictates, she writes on a phone. She will be in the queue for a post office and type something into a phone. So she's always kind of thinking about this and, you know, she's got this crazy life and she still manages to get a novel out a month, which is insane, which mm. I can't even do and I'm doing it full time. There is ways of doing it. A lot of people just get up an hour earlier in the morning and do an hour before everyone's up. Oh, that um, sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it is a lot of work. This is the thing, you know. Oh, shit, yeah. Writing yeah. is a lot of work. Yeah. Oh. It's not easy. And it's like, you know, we were talking last week about the idea of thinking about fears and thinking about what fears to kind of put against other fears in order for you to be productive. Mm. And I think that there's also an element of, and this is <laughs> like, this is just a, a massive theme in Western civilization throughout history is the idea of sacrificing today for the future. Yeah. And so it's what can you give up or is there something that you can reduce that you do or you just have to kind of look at your life. I mean, if this week's just an anomaly because mm. you have just had stuff thrown at you, then whatever, that's life. What you can do is, and it's really tedious to do, but literally timetable, record everything you do during the day. You know, like you're on a Weight Watchers diet or something, but instead of eating, you're like, yeah. right, what did I do between one and three? Well, I sat around and just looked at my phone and, and I got onto this rabbit hole of multi videos on YouTube and, you know, when you start going, oh yeah, that's, that's where my time goes, right? And it's, it's oh, yeah, I'm just fucking around. I'm not yeah. doing anything. Exactly. Yeah, I get you. So, I mean, it, it's going to be a bit of a weird process in terms of having that kind of self awareness and then catching yourself because it's very easy, especially when you've had a long day, just to sit down and just stare at your phone or stare at the screen or 
with your writing in, how, how much have you actually done? I've done like 600 words. I've managed to, I managed to snatch like an hour or two here or there throughout the week. It was largely sort of towards the end of the night when like, <clears throat> When, uh, you know, the little ones in bed and everything and things have kind of calmed down, done all the chores and I've kind of somewhat recovered from dealing with the general public at work. Um, so I think largely I've, I've, I've done a few things as well during the day where I could, like talking about the idea of like snatching some time because we do a lot of our correspondence through like the Google Drive and stuff like that and Doc. So I've got that on my phone. So there's definitely been, I had to go somewhere to do some training. Uh, so, like, during the train journeys, I was just trying to note things down, like, do really, really bare bones things, even even more bare bones than, like, necessarily, like, a draft. When I got home and everything, it's so that I've got, I've already got something kind of there. It's a bit of a, uh, a bit of a head start on sitting down and doing a draft. So, like, I, I have found that really handy. And, I mean, obviously, that's just, that's just the blessing of technology, isn't it? It's not like I've got to wait till I get home so I can get to my, my typewriter and, you know, snickety snack, <laughs> click it all, and then <laughs> wait yeah. for the ink to dry. It's, you know, there's, there's a lot less I can use as an excuse. Or maybe it's just that I have far more opportunity because of the technology, which is, I don't know, which is, which is really good. Because, obviously, back in the day, if you were going to be a writer, then you just had to sit down and write and you couldn't really, well, I suppose you could have a notebook. Maybe I'm, I'm under sort of, what you call it, underestimating uh, writers of the past. I'm sure they had notebooks and pens, but it's just ever so much easier these days, like to be able to self edit as well. And, you know, if I'm on a train and I like something and I write it, I can just send it to you straight away. You can have a look at it. It's all, all the, all the tools are there really. I think it's time is one thing that I might not always have, but I have the ability to, to keep constantly adding to this thing incrementally, even if I can't can't sit there straight away. So I've got to bear that in mind as well. I have to get yeah. into this sort of thing of that, like, if I'm going to do this, then to some degree writing has to be my default. Um, it has to be what I go back to when I've got nothing to do. Exactly, yeah. I don't think you've tried dictation, have you? No. Just, like, dictate into your phone and then transcribe it using Dragon. It's amazing. <laughs> so like I've done that. I'll have a walk walk along the promenade or whatever and then I've done five thousand words without really thinking about it. So you know, doing little things like that can be really helpful as well. Don't underestimate a pen and paper as well. Like I always yeah. go back to a pen and paper when I'm planning, when I'm getting stuck. I just find even though I can hardly read my writing and I have to use stick pens now because of my eyes, like I still find that um it I don't know, mate, I think it's might might just be more kind of Less connections have to be made in my brain or something, but it feels more kind of instant writing it by hand <clears throat> yeah. on a page than um, yeah typing it on something. I've, I've always found that um, if I use pen and paper, it's normally more sort of like um, pictographs for planning and such. Like I'm very fond of doing sort of draw a straight line and then you have your points on the line and then you have your characters as well. And if you draw their arcs, so you understand like... Yeah. Like what you're doing, where you're going, what the end point of a scene is, and how your characters sort of move through it. Whatever works, you know. I've given you a process that it kind of came from you in a way, it resonated with you, the Save the Cat things. So, yeah. Whatever you do, you just find your way, and there's going to be things you try that don't work. Use it as an opportunity to try out different things and experiment along the way. Um, the fact that you're kind of having this thing of been as well you know you're at work and you're coming up with these ideas and almost fleshing out scenes in your head and yeah. kind of putting a bit more meat to the bones of your outline like that's brilliant don't underestimate that because that's the hard stuff coming up with the ideas that flow together that's that's the hardest part like it really is <laughs> yeah um, so basically what what you're doing is you're kind of thinking about the scenes on a more micro level than a macro level which yeah. is what you need to be doing so don't underestimate that don't beat yourself up. If you're doing that work and you're not sitting in front of a computer actually getting text on a page, it doesn't matter. You're still doing the work. You're still expanding your story from this initial outline. So, you know, don't worry about that. And the fact that you've done 600 words is 600 more words than you've done in a long time. So, <laughs> yes. well done. You know, it's progress. And as long as you come back every week and you're making progress, that's great. So, don't worry too much about that. I know you found it difficult to write, but I mean, how did you actually find the process 
of getting the words on the page and I think it's um right now I'm still getting um it's like a slow start each time uh, like I, I mean I don't know how it is for you obviously because you've been doing it more so I think you'll probably when you start writing I think you'll probably sort of at a, at a better like even pace um I think no. it's <laughs> no oh, fair enough then I'm completely wrong um about 20 minutes to warm up really yeah oh okay that's good to know um, it's I, slow going. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, then it's it's quite similar to me then. Because it's like looking for the right, um, even to like a sentence or a paragraph or a page. It's like, okay, so I need the right start. Even if it's not the start you end up with, um, it's getting that sort of, that flicker um, to get you going, to get the engine going and to start your pace properly. And it's, it's been hard because of having to break certain habits as well and certain, I suppose you'd call them sort of insecurities because I'm very prone to looking back through what I'm doing and checking for spelling mistakes because I'm very, um, conscientious of my dyslexia and i got a spell check for that and all that shit you know what i mean i don't i don't need to be sitting there going is that how you spell necessarily um so i'm doing my best to stop that now i find like i'll occasionally stop and think right what do i want to write what do i want to write next and i'll find my eyes drifting up the page to look for spelling mistakes i'm like no stay here at this point (laughs) in the page this is where you're writing you've done that bit that could be dealt with later do you know what's Um, useful do you know what's a good idea is to basically halve the size of your window so you basically look you can only see like the last two or three lines you've done <laughs> like look at it ah. like a letterbox you know what i mean <laughs> well the thing is on the other side of that though is because my memory is pretty much trash i'll write a paragraph and think and then stop there for a few minutes and go okay what am i writing and then i'll start to write and go wait a minute what did i write in the last paragraph uh, um, yeah. so it's this well, you know- uh, it's a battle against like just read it Read it for what it is. Don't sit there and be like, well, that's not very good and I need to change that. It's like, no, that is just the next step to what I'm writing now and that step can be polished off later on. Yeah. Okay, so maybe do get a notepad, a pen, and you write a paragraph on your computer and then you just put a little note on your thing, say, like a bullet point just saying, um, Dora meets an ego for the first time. Then your next paragraph, uh, Dora... He doesn't like an ego, you know, just so you've yeah. got a kind of, you can refer back to that for your progress rather than referring back to your text. So you've got your little bullet points and you know where you are in your structure. Mm. Mm. So tr- try that maybe. That, that'd be good. Yeah, no, it's good. Like little reminders that aren't too in depth so I don't get caught up in them and start sort of self critiquing before I've even finished anything. I think it's a good idea actually. Yeah. Um, so in, it's, it's all anything like that. I mean, one thing that I saw, I think this was a, Stephen King tip actually, and it's really good. Is this has definitely improved my flow and just kind of getting back into stuff. Is finish mid sentence. <laughs> so when you're gonna, you know, you finish him for the day, write the first sentence of the next chapter, but oh, half okay. of it. So you, you're literally writing half a sentence to start the next chapter. So when you sit down the next day, your brain is already locking on. Ah, that's so, really good. Yeah. So. That does help. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, I yeah, like I mean, there's, it, there's, it spurs there's you on, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, there's just different things you can try anyway that all give you, like, basically trick your brain out of this, you know, going back to way back in however many months ago it was with our first episode when we were talking about resistance. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things that will create resistance, and, you know, that kind of slow, sluggish start is part of that, and it's for really horrible feeling like oh, I'm just, like oh well if i just check an email or if i do this you know it's, and then and then you know before you know it, you've you've lost an hour so mm. um i suppose it's I, difficult. it must I'm be terrible for this. well go on terrible for this. like i i have to really really force myself like i've got into a, a pattern where i'm doing my work now but there was a while where you know i'd get back from dropping my son off at school at quarter to nine and then i wouldn't start writing until about half ten just because there was just a lot of things that i could do that felt like writing that were as important i convinced myself (laughs) yeah and it was just kind of i I just needed to get on with it and slog through it and Mm. and it's one of those things that like after 20 minutes of doing it i'm in the zone and it's great it's like i get into an almost like a meditative state with it and it's just 
that's how I get my words and that's when I'm like just flying through it and don't have to think about it really. So yeah, it's, I think it's, for me, it's about finding ways to achieve that sort of state of, uh, flow. Of, of just like, I'm just writing now, it's come in, and whether it's good or bad doesn't matter, cause I'm just, I'm there, and I'm, I'm getting through this idea and this plan. One of the things I might run into is that, like, you can't love every scene that you write. It sounds kind of antithetical to the idea of, of art and creativity, but in a book, um, and maybe in other things as well, some things are uh, purely functional, you know what I mean? Um, some things are, you know, you've got to get from point A to B. And there are some scenes that you might look forward to writing or some ideas that you look forward to sort of putting down on the page and going, like, oh, yeah, that really works. But um, I'm wondering what it's going to be like when maybe I've got to get through a, a chapter or a scene or something that I have no... And, and you're you not, to write not it, infused but, by it. Okay. Yeah, well, when you're, when you're not super infused because you can't within yourself see the uh, the benefit or maybe it doesn't... You're not, imp- and I'll say it, you're not impressed with yourself enough. Well, then um, what you do because of the idea is you don't do that scene. Yeah, you rethink that scene because that's your. To me, that is your subconscious telling you mm. that okay, this is going to suck for the reader. <laughs> so it's that's like. Point. So what you need to do is, you know, if you think this is going to be a boring scene, or combine it with another one. Like if you think to yourself, right, I've got this scene that's. You know, I've got Dora and Aga and I need to have this really deep and meaningful conversation, but they also need to get from point A to point B. And there's also a scene where I want them to get kind of in trouble with this person. It's like just have them all together, throw them all into the same scene. So you're doing multiple things with your scenes rather than just having right well. This scene is all about Dora talking about this. And then this scene is about them getting to A to B and combine stuff. Don't worry about deleting stuff. If you do write stuff that you're going to delete, just make sure you save your drafts or whatever. Don't just delete things. Yeah, like, like, I've done that once and I really regretted it because <laughs> actually that would have been a useful scene. Do you ever purposely use like placeholder stuff? Like, say if you know the, you like, know, right in here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Cool, think, cool fight scene. Cool set piece here. Yeah. I get you. Yeah. Insert cool. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, well, I know I need to have this kind of conversation bit that, yeah, I'll put it in like those square brackets and just put a little note to myself and then I'll do a control F for uh, square brackets when I'm done with the first bit, you know. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so don't, you know, don't worry about that and don't worry about writing out of order if it's going to help you, but I don't know if that will help no, you. No, I don't, I don't think it will, to be honest no, with you. No, it'll you in a way, so. Yeah, because I think I'll if I, I I've got this feeling that if I write things out of order, then I might end up contriving things so that certain of you know, so say you write a scene like ten chapters down the line and you love it, mm. but then as you're writing the rest of the book, you start having a better idea or maybe a better direction, and that scene no longer really becomes relevant or is needed. Mm. It's you know. You could be careful to fight the urge to be like, well, if I just do this and I do that, I can still make that scene work. So I think for me, if I just write chronologically, yeah, yeah, it'll be much better than trying to, because I've got all these great ideas, but I think it's, we were talking about constriction earlier, um, of, of art and, and how it can create better art. Like you were talking about, um, it's a great film about time travel called Primer that was made for, like, fuck all money, really, but it's a, it's a great film and, part of the fact that it had such a low budget meant that they had to they had to be, do better with the things that were cheaper like scripting and, and shooting and stuff like that and yet they still made like a great film and I think that um, even though it's not exactly the same I'm going to I want to try and stick to that so it's like yes if I wanted to I could just go this is a really fucking cool idea I'm just going to have that but then that's just kind of free form and it's not really in service of the story yeah. or the it's in service of me thinking that something's cool. So it's kind of like an ego thing. So I feel that if I'm constrained to an extent and I limit myself, I don't know if limit is the right word, but if I contain myself uh, to writing chronologically, keeping a sort of pattern going where I I don't jump ahead, where I, I keep these ideas in my head or I write them down and I allow them to maybe ferment and improve. And if I come back to them, I can also have maybe a clearer like less egotistical view of my own amazing ideas. Um, <laughs> you know. I'm trying to think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
well, yeah, I did give you homework last week, but we won't go over that now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we'll kind of wrap it up for today. I think, you know, we've got some good stuff to go with. I think actually getting the work done is just find the time and keep plodding along, keep pushing forward. Don't look back. You've done really well. You've got 600 words and you've been working on deepening your outline, which is superb. So this is why I think last week you said, yeah, I'm going to get five scenes written and all this. Like, <laughs> no, you're not, Russ. I'm not being funny, but you're not. <laughs> like, uh, you, what, a, yeah. what a naive child I am. Yeah. It's like, I think I can do a novel in a month. You know, that's, that's kind of what my eventual aim is. Mm. But I'm still at a novel a quarter. Which is like probably for you, you're just like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh. <laughs> And to me, like, you know, past me as well, but because I know that I can essentially do X number of words in a certain space of time. So I could I, conceivably do a novel a month, but I know, I just don't think I've got it in me. I don't think I've got that kind of level of creativity or whatever it is, that amount of stuff to do it right and do it well. And maybe, I do have that kind of arrogance of I'm an artist as well as a business person who's trying to make money off my box. Yeah. It's like, cause you know, I did abandon a book recently and I preach against that, but I knew that it was sucking. I knew that it wasn't working artistically. And I thought, well, I was so proud of the first book in this series. And I, I did originally write Blind Gambit as a standalone anyway. And then I think probably about what, 15,000 words in, I just thought, this is no good. This isn't anywhere near as good. So I, I just thought, you know what? I've got a better idea for a bigger project that's going to take me about two years. So I'll just do that instead. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I've written I, the, um, what is it? On. I wrote the first novella, not novella, novelette. I think it is technically yeah. for my, um, epic fantasy series, which is going to have 22 books when it's done. So. Um, one one down and twenty one to go. <laughs> oh, I, I I have faith that you all succeed. Yeah. Well, so basically, what you're saying, if I can drum this down into an analogy, is that there was a time where I could eat a whole pizza in ten minutes, but <laughs> nowadays, because I've kept doing that, I can eat two whole pizzas in ten minutes. Can you really? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> Okay, that's not good training, Russ. Yeah. I don't, you know, do this, but don't have it as a detriment to your arteries. Uh, okay, all right. Now, my pizza tactics won't work when it comes to writing. It kind of does. It's like it's like anything, you it's know. Practice. It's like a muscle thing, isn't it? It's just like you, you get exactly, you yeah, get faster, and you learn hacks and tricks and all that mm. kind of thing. But- so. You know, you said about ego, like, you can call it ego or you can call it um, self-determinism, can't you? Like, you, like, for whatever reason, however when, however you want to paint it, you, you find the drive. You don't just have it, you find it. And then you, and then we sort of tend to conceptualize and contrive it. But you, you have that drive and you've nurtured it. You know what I mean? You found times in which it worked and you could summon it up and you've continued to do that. And like you said, it's like working a muscle. You now know that you can summon it up out of yourself when you need to, even if you do need to have a bit of a, um, a, a time where you build up your pace. Um, and I, that's where I need to get to. And I need to do, and do need to view it as that. It's that, you know, if I keep doing it, then I'll get, well, I don't know that I'll necessarily get better, but I will become more sort of likely to be able to like summon up that um, ability to just, just get my writing down and just get it done in those moments where I find like I need to have this like hungry to write kind of attitude where it's like, right, I'm on a train or I'm on a bus or I'm waiting for a meeting or something. I've got 20 minutes. I've got 30 minutes. If I can't write, I'll just outline. I need, um, it needs to be filling in the gaps uh, in, in what I'm doing. Um, and I need to get it to that point, I feel. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So next week, homework is carry on. <laughs> so carry okay. on with me. I'm going to send you some. So now I sent you the, um, basically the a couple of writing craft podcasts last week. So yes. listen to them again. And I'm going to send you probably a couple more. So last week was about showing, not telling. Mm-hmm. And then this week, I'm going to send you some stuff probably about dialogue because I think, Dialogue is something a lot of authors get wrong. Have a look at that yeah. and probably talk about that unless, you know, we just no, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually, have another I was... chat about your, um, you know, whatever. We'll just play it by My, my pizza eating. Um, yeah. yeah, no, uh, dialogue is something that I've got maybe we call a, a worry about uh, getting into 
characters' heads and sort of the differences in their speech patterns, intonation, and the words they use. It's something okay. I've thought about. So it's going to be what well, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, all right, just before we go on, the big tip I'll give you now, mm. because you're in first draft mode, is most of that stuff you just mentioned, don't think about yet. Okay. So don't get bogged down with voice patterns. Don't get bogged. That's getting bogged down with stuff on the sentence level. Mm. Um, when you're doing dialogue, just make sure that it's got a purpose and that there's kind of meaning and that it changes things when stuff gets said. Do you know what I mean? So think of it not in terms of, hi, how are you? Yes, I'm fine. Oh, it's a sunny day, isn't it? Oh, it is a sunny day. You're right. <laughs> yes. Like, it's got to be. It's the purpose. Um, kind of is... have purpose, have revelation, yeah. be useful, be a way that you can expose the world without doing big fact dumps, you know, like there's a lot you can do. And also telling about character as well, like you can use dialogue. If Dora's having trouble trusting, you know, she could even just say, you know, I've got no reason to trust you. <laughs> why, why should I trust anyone around here? You know, like those yeah. kind of lines will add to character and stuff. So, um, yeah, don't get bogged down on the sentence level stuff for now. And yeah, I'll send you the stuff about dialogue. Mm-hmm. And I'll try and figure out, find some episodes of, uh, different podcasts just to send you that, are that are good. Um, and then, you know, we'll either talk about it or we'll just talk about like we did this time. So, yeah. Yeah. Sounds great. Awesome. Right. So remember, you can follow me on the Twitter. It's at JL Cronshaw. You can also ask Russ some questions if you want by tweeting me or you can email me. It's john at johncronshaw.com. That's J-O-N-C-R-O-N-S-H-A-W. We have a Facebook group. So just look for Stop Booking Around. You can also find the Stop Booking Around book on your favorite ebook platform. It's available as an ebook and paperback. It's called Stop Booking Around, How to Overcome Author Procrastination. And it's basically a lot of the ideas that I've been talking about in this podcast crystallized into <laughs> something. Refined. Into the rambly. <laughs> into the finest crystals. Exactly. Right. So until next time. Cheerio. Bye. I'm John Cronshaw. I'm Russell Evans. Last week I gave Russ the task to carry on with his writing and to listen to some podcasts about show not tell as a skill in writing. And I'm just wondering, first of all, how you found the podcast instructions, you know, kind of teaching you to write on the fly. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed them. They were very informative. We can talk about the, the practical application of what I've learned, um, but all in all, um, that series was a really good series as well, and I would recommend it to anybody. What was it what Was it called again? Is it Writing Excuses? Yeah, I'll send you some selected episodes of Writing Excuses, which maybe, Russ, just go on their website and download all their episodes from episode one <laughs> and listen to them, because I did that binged them all when I was uh, ill last year and it was one of the best things I ever did. So. Oh, okay then. <laughs> yeah, so I listened to them at like one and a half times speed for eight hours while I was in my sick bed so you can imagine how many mm-hmm. episodes of that I got through. I subscribe to that, I listen to it every week and it's just an amazing free resource. So great. Yeah, it's um, really well done, really well broken down and I felt like I could apply what they were talking about. It wasn't some sort of obscure writer's podcast where you had to know all the terminology and such. And they, uh, they created very relevant and sort of easy to understand, uh, examples. So I feel like it's definitely sort of enlightened me a bit in regards to what I'm trying to do. You know, show, not tell. I mean, that's the thing that writers get told. That is like rule number one, show, not tell. Yeah. For writers. And I'm just wondering how listening to those, whether that has made you feel differently about what those terms mean, whether it's kind of made you think differently about the way you're going to present your writing. The term show, don't tell, like you hear it and you go, okay, I understand. You don't want to have to be lectured when you're reading a book. You don't want to have to have like dry descriptions unless you want dry description. 
giving it context and giving example was an important part of it. One of the examples they gave was that, say, if you're trying to show that someone is angry or someone is is happy or so forth and so on, you have to think about the situation they're in and think about how they react to it. So one of the examples they gave was, um, you know, someone walks into a kitchen that's messy. If they're in a bad mood, that's what they'll point out. They'll they'll focus on the fact that they're frustrated that the kitchen is a mess or, and that they have to do the washing up. But somebody in a different mood, in maybe like a happier mood or a more pro- proactive mood, will they'll focus on the fact that they have to do the washing up. You know, like oh, let's just tidy up the kitchen. Let's let's get this done. This is the job for today, so forth and so on. Um, whereas, like you know, when I first heard Show Don't Tell, it my ideas were a bit more basic in regards to it, into how you would sort of put that on a, that on a page and, you know, like the idea of like, oh, it's physically describing things. Um, but it's also not just that. It's really more about the, like what your character shows in each situation. You know, it's not about yeah. necessarily physical interaction or objects or anything like that. It's about what they show to the reader in any given situation and then using that sort of spectrum of situations and that spectrum of reaction to those situations to show your character without having to typically say, oh, this person would normally get angry when things were messy or this and so forth and so on. That can all be seen. It's, you know, it's natural. We don't in real life, most of the time, people don't come up to you and give you like a full rundown of who they are as a person and how they react. And why they're angry about something. It's like, yeah. I mean, this this comes down, you know, we're kind of verging into subtext here, I think, but mm. um, like, you know, if you are having an argument about something with your other half, for example, and it seems really mundane what the argument is, but below that, it's almost yes. like, well, there's actually years of resentment bottled up within this argument and, <laughs> you know, so something little can spiral and whatever. So, yeah, um, yeah so the, the showing, not telling, um I mean, it, this comes down to description of body and description of places and things, whatever. Tone um, and approach. Yeah. And one of, the, one of the things that I really want you to avoid is using adjectives and yes. adverbs when you can. So instead of describing, like always try and describe objects using action. So instead yeah. of saying the building was really big, I mean, I think once you've used the word was, <laughs> that's <laughs> when you know you're kind of making a mistake, you know. Mm. That's when you know. So avoid anything where you're using the word was in a sentence. So when you're describing something, instead of saying the building was tall, you might say the building loomed above, you know, just because looming is doing something. It gives it or, personality as well, yeah, doesn't it? Or it's towering above or, you know, it's actually having an active thing and try and make all of your descriptions, if you can, active in some way. So sort of like, uh, even though they're inanimate objects, how in a way they sort of interact with their surroundings, even though you're sort of uh, attributing them, well, like you said, action. So like, you know, with high buildings, loom, tower, dominate the skyline, things like that. And even though these buildings aren't doing anything, you're attributing attributing them action to give them sort of personality, which then creates sort of yeah. like atmosphere and scene. And one one thing that's really useful to do is having things where you choose descriptions. I mean, it's like getting into really kind of specific details, like little specific details can say a lot. Mm. So you might say like, say you're walking down a street, your character's walking down a street, buildings towered above, the door to a left hung off its hinges, a crack ran through the concrete, you know, just little details like that where you can pick things up, like, yeah, with trees or anything, instead of just saying, you know, it's a big tree or the green leaves hung off the tree, you could say like about the leaves trembling or just actually getting the movement in is it's, really important because that's what you yeah. attach to is movement and sound and the kind of experience of change throughout your scenes. Mm. And I suppose if you're writing from different perspectives, you can also show what characters are like by how maybe they... So say, for instance, someone's walking down a street. and well, Let's go back to buildings again. And, you know, and, and you could say, like, the, the, the buildings, like, towered... You know, or I don't want to say menacing, but you know what I mean? Like the building's towered. You create a scene where you can see that yes. this... You know, once you get into that, this is what I'm saying about ad- adverse adjectives kind of thing. Yeah. Once you get into like, m- menacingly, it's like, well, no, just show us why it's menacing. You know what I mean? It's going to take you a few more words to do. But mm. you could almost say, like, Dora felt small as she wandered through, you know, like, yeah. instead of saying she was menaced, you could say, like, something else. 
Yeah, um, another character might like interpret those buildings or look at those buildings differently, and that will give you like another character might be in awe of how big the buildings are instead of yeah. feeling like small and, in, and intimidated by yeah. them in, in a sense. And like, will... You know, there might be an architect and be snobbish about the, um, you know, the design of the building or, you know, you can yeah. get those little things in. Of, you saw it, it was another one of those mundane structures. I don't know. You could. You yeah, could... So, <laughs> yeah. If we knew anything about architecture, I'm sure we could probably come up with yeah, something. Yeah. I don't know why I use that as an example, to be honest. But, uh... but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, it, it's because everything's subjective, even to your characters. So they can't. I'm starting to realise now that as a writer, I can't write everything or descriptors of things from just my point of view. Like no. everything I write in regards to a character, if it's about, if it, especially if it's in first person, it has to be the words. Third, and, hmm? Person, basically, first and close third. Yeah, you need to have it from. The character's perspective. You can do what's called third omniscient, which is basically the narrator is the overlord, the the god overlooking it. But you're not that good as a writer to do that. I'm not that good. No, as no, a writer I, yeah, 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 yeah. There's so many writers who I've seen who've done it really badly. Like I think recently the only ones I've seen who would do it well is what's her name? Ellen Kushner does it really well, mm-hmm. and uh, Frank Herbert obviously he does it mm-hmm. very well and. Like it used to be the way of telling stories, but now it's very jarring when you get that. It's difficult because you like so you're uh, from like you're saying third is it third person close third omniscient close third, which is basically kind of like first person. You're experiencing it as if it's a camera or whatever on the person's shoulder, yeah. And you're kind of experiencing the world through their eyes, but you're saying what that person is doing, whereas a first person would be that person describing what they're doing as they're doing it. Yes. Whereas an omniscient one would be the, you know, the overlooking God who can see what everyone's doing and can even pass comment on why this is happening like this. And Yeah, I know what you mean. That's, yeah. I mean, I like that idea, but like you said, I'm not, I, I'm not going to fuck with that <laughs> because uh, I think just start basic, do my draft. I'm going to, and then we'll come, we'll come to those ideas later on in, in life. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, I've said about Terry Pratchett and, you know, he yeah. might have started off doing the omniscient thing. I mean, the, the narrator's voice is always there with Pratchett, mm. but I think, you know, you'll look and you'll see that actually it's whatever scene you're in, whatever little section, it'll be focused on one character. So look at the way he writes volumes and look at the way he, he writes the witch's characters. Like the voice, this is going back to the show and not tell thing, like the voice of the descriptions and things like that is different with these people and the, the different, you know, the way that the settings are described, the way that people are described, you know, when volumes is, uh, you've got descriptions of people, it is, they're described from the perspective of someone who is a police officer and what a police officer would be looking for. Whereas the witches will see them in, you know, their links to kind of spirituality or their links to magic or yeah, uh, witchcraft or whatever. So it's very subtle and you'll start noticing now you're aware of it. So. <laughs> So when you're describing things, instead of saying stuff like, she went quickly up the stairs, yeah, you know, having something like, she thundered up the stairs, little things like that where you get more of a image and more of a visceral thing, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Um, so in terms of dialogue then, I mean, I think, I'm just trying to remember what I sent you, I think I sent you a thing from John Scalzi and probably some more just general writing excuses episodes about dialogue. Just wondering what you made of those and whether you learnt anything from them. Dialogue and blocking and scenes and stuff like that. Like the, um, it's this thing of like you should be able to write a scene between two characters. And so if you had a chapter that and the whole chapter was just a conversation, you should be able to go to halfway through that chapter and start reading that, that conversation at some midpoint and know who is saying what. Um, and you, you know, you do that through choice of, like, the choice of the character's words, um, how, like, how verbose they are, or do they speak in short clipped sentences? Do they, you know, do, does their education show through in that? It's, it's all these things that you, um, have to remember about this character. Um, you have to find their voice in your head, um, and, and it not just be some sort of, uh, version of your own, which I've, I uh, found it difficult to sort of know whether, you know, uh, this dialogue I'm writing, is this just, 
is just is this just me um or is this this character and, and i suppose i'm not going to know that as well until i've written more about these characters yeah. or at least i've had them do more so that i can discover more about them as i write them yeah so i mean one one thing that i would say is that they those considerations are second draft stuff they're rewrite mm-hmm. stuff they're the stuff that you you know if you get bogged down with that level of sentence level stuff in your first draft it's going to really slow you down it's yes it's going to drag so just get through even if you change every single word of dialogue like just mm-hmm. get through it and know know your story and know where you're at so um yeah i mean the, di- the dialogue thing is just try and clip out anything that's not useful to the story um so if you're thinking that you're just going to have a conversation where they're having a how's the weather it's like, unless the house of weather is, oh, well, there's a massive storm coming. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's pertinent or mm-hmm. then just get rid of any fluff, you know. Um, yeah. Well, so, dialogue should drive forward always. Yes. Um, yes. It shouldn't just be, and this is a purpose to it, but it shouldn't just be, yeah, like you say, um, stagnant, I suppose. Just dialogue for the sake of dialogue because you need to fill some air. Um, yeah, and this this is the same with description. This is the same with every element of your story. It should always be progressing, always pushing forward, always kind of moving the story on, whatever you're adding. Mm. So. Yes. Um, so that was actually well. You know, you've obviously you've you've been published now, and your books contain several characters. And I was just wondering, how do you, how do you do that? I know you, you're just talking then about, you know, things are supposed to be second draft. But when, yeah. you know, when you're when you're writing even your first draft, what do you bear in mind? Like, what's the maximum level of detail, should we say, that you're willing to go to? Like, just... Okay. Go on. Right, so um, I, I find, actually, character voice is usually what I start with anyway. Yeah. Um, when I'm writing. So I've, I've usually got that. And if you remember back to when we did the episode where... I mean, this was weeks ago now, but I got you to, like, cast your characters. Yes. And you talked about the idea of, you know, this person being based on this actor and this is the voice that I want for them. And it's like, I do that in my head. I when I, I mean, the, the character changed a lot from my original thought, but I wanted the speech patterns of my main character in my Wasteland series to be, like, Mike from Breaking Bad. <laughs> right. So whenever I was kind of doing his character i was performing his character because i was dictating and i was almost doing it in that kind of his voice and that kind of world weary dreary kind of tone yeah um, and then there's just certain little words that he will not use and there are other words that he will use so he if he curses he might say damn it you know he doesn't swear uh-huh. if he does swear which i think he does maybe once or twice in the series it's like because there's a big reason for it, you know what I mean? And then other characters, like I've got a character who is a priestess and her, you know, a lot of what she says is always in relationship to God and the Bible. And Mm. she almost talks to people in a preachy way. She can't help herself. Mm. And she's always like trying to, uh, yeah, preach basically. (laughs) She's a preach person. And I think she drives some of my readers mad because she is, a preachy character, but that's her character. Yeah, that's, that's um, the point of her, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, and then her voice changes as her character progresses as well, because in the third book, she basically loses her home and she's forced into homelessness, and she can't deal with that because she's always had this really good community, Christian community around her, and she pretty much has a breakdown and can't deal with it. So her voice changes, her character changes, and she goes on a bit of a downward arc, and then in the fourth book, that'll kind of, she's going on a bit of a redemptive arc, so. Uh, Okay, yeah, um, a a character change, like your environment has changed, and thus character needs to sort of face this new situation, and, you know, what what does that do to them as a character? How do they grow? Because, you know, entropy is death. If they don't change, it's bad things. If they do change, maybe they've got a chance. That sort of thing. Yeah. So I've started writing these um, epic fantasy series as well. So yeah. I've written the first, I suppose it would be a novelette of that called The Fool. You know, that is, again, very much about the voice. And I've got 
character in that. Like I've got a, um, a courier character who is, you know, is one of the lower class people. And so he talks in a particular way. My main character is a, I suppose a reluctant princess. <laughs> so <laughs> she's in this position where she's just become a woman and does not want to be a woman and does not want all the responsibility that goes with that. And she's also about to have a magical awakening kind of thing. So her voice is not quite as formal as her sister and her mother. Yeah. Because she's also, she, you know, she climbs around the palace and she's spends time with the servants and stuff like that. And then, so her, her voice is not quite formal, not quite. So is she, is she she a bit of a Lyra, um, type character? If you know. Yeah. She's, she's that kind of character. I think it's, you know, it's kind of a bit of a trope character, like the Lyra, the, um, the tomboy princess kind of thing. The exactly. What's the name in Game of Thrones? Um, uh, Arya Stark. Arya, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I really think that's like an interesting kind of character trail to work with. Mm. And I've then got a a waven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a, a, like a magical, you know, little dragon creature who talks, and he's very manipulative, and he kind of talks around things and you know a lot of what he says has kind of meanings where he's trying to lead people into having opinions about things so well that's an yeah, inter- interesting point anyway like um writing from like a non-human point of view as well yeah yeah um like uh, i suppose because as 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 people as hopefully fully functioning human beings <laughs> we we have an understanding of human like motivation and sort of the, the primal things that drive us. But then when you're trying to write from what is an essentially alien point of view, or at least like a non-human point of view, it's sort of, that is interesting. And like, have, did you find that you struggled at all with it or that you had to stop and think of like, well, you know, this character isn't a person. And so what is their sort of motivation and yeah, why they interact with people like this? Yeah. So it was from the motivation. Um, mm. so he's, he's got a, he's a bit of a puppet master <laughs> character and he almost considers himself a bit of a god. Right. We're pulling on the human, like that's never really revealed in the story. Do you mm. know what I mean? But careful readers will, might be able to pick it up. Um, but the main point is, is that we kind of see his manipulations, his machinations. We see things that he suggests and does play out in a way that he seems kind of random at first, but then it all kind of plays into this big kind of picture at the end. Like he's doing all these things that seem irrelevant and yeah. And it'll all kind of have this snowball in the last few books. So, okay. But it's, it's all this guy behind the weird stuff that's going to happen and where the main character is going to be led. So yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. So yeah. Uh, so where I am at the minute, I've just written the um, what is it? I've written what third draft of the prequel, and then I've just written the first draft for the first novella, and just outlined the second. So yeah, yeah I've got twenty one novellas to write. And <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, because take me a while. One of the things I think I'm going to be facing, one of the challenges, is is that I am going to have to eventually start writing from the point of view of people that were essentially human, aren't anymore, and now face eternity with like the, only their own choices. Part of the reason why I really like Frank Herbert's work, because he's... Normally transhumanism is a cyber thing. It's a cyberpunk kind of thing. It's like, oh, I've had my brain um, augmented. Yeah. I've had my arms augmented. But what I always liked in, in Frank Herbert's was that it's through breeding. It's probably somewhat more natural. But then you get the crazy shit with um, Leto, the the second. Oh, the and, God Emperor. Yeah, the God Emperor. And he essentially ends up... For anybody who hasn't read any of Frank Herbert's work, it's dense, interesting stuff that's fucking... <laughs> mental it's like i want to call it a space opera but i don't think that gives it like the right tone it's space fantasy isn't it really? yeah it is it's yeah. it's it's crazy but one of the one of the characters goes from being like a normal boy to sort of in i think maybe the even the next book after that into being like the god emperor of the known galaxy who is like a strange human sandworm hybrid that can see into the future um 
And I know that sounds really odd, but it works amazingly. And it's a great way of sort of, this is a person that was human and has now over time sort of transmuted into something else and has, and because of their, how they find themselves in their physical state, it's altered, it's altered their mental state and how they interact with reality and such and what their motivations are, what their plans are and how they see other people. And I feel like because the world in which I'm writing, there are, characters that have been around for thousands of years it's going to be interesting to try and get that across one of the themes of the book is that like you know uh, inaction equals death and self-actualization is the key to sort of surviving so go on. With, um, maslow's hierarchy of needs yes yes in the maslow hierarchy of needs like when it was first put together I think his top thing was self-actualization. So he worked through all these things of like, okay, you need food, you need shelter, you need yeah. all these things. And then as you go up, self-actualization's like, was the top one. Mm. Um, but before he died, he actually added another layer. I don't know if you're aware of no, this. No, I didn't know. Yeah, so he, he added um, self-transcendence. Oh, as, okay. As the most kind of important, you know, the highest ideal. Um, so I don't, I don't know what that actually well, I would have thought How that could apply to what you're doing. Like, I'm just thinking in terms of what you're doing. Like, maybe self-actualization is, see, you know, it's seen as the highest ideal, but really the one you want is this self-transcendence. Um, yeah. This, yeah. So I don't know. I'm just sort of to think about in terms of like the future of the theories and. Yeah, yeah I really like that. that. Yeah, it's kind of akin to going Super Saiyan. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, I, yeah, it's a great, it's a great and interesting point because then what is that transcendence? Like, where, how do you show that a character has transcended what they were? And it doesn't, I suppose it doesn't, you know, you could look at it in a very tropey way as in like, ah, they've reached the next level of their power. Like, you know, I just said a bit like Super Saiyans, but is it maybe transcending old psychological traps that you, that a character falls into? It's, I think a lot of it might be, Maybe it's being able to transcend the things that, like, we need, even if we still need them, but like being able to transcend their hold on us and make them into choices as opposed to needs. Um, but I, I don't know. Like I said, that's just spitballing. But it's an interesting thing to play with, and especially in regards to what I'm going for with this, in regards to, the, say, say, the themes of, of like, you are the only person that can that drive yourself forward, as seeing as no other external uh, force has that much of an impact on you anymore. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's interesting. <laughs> anyway, um, just thought about that then. But um, so what else is there? Yeah, so tell me about your writing then this week. So how are you getting on with the draft? Slowly but surely still. Uh, I'm I'm just moving forward. Um, I know that these next few weeks, just in terms of my schedule at home, means I'm going to have less time to write. But I, it's like I said on the last episode, I'm, I'm just doing what I can to find those moments to sit down, even if it is the roughest, most basic-ass sketch of what's happening. Um, I did say, and you did kind of admonish me a little bit, that I went back and had a little look at what I'd done. But... It was really because of having listened to those podcasts, it made me stop and think, and it made me stop and think about what I wanted to sort of get across, because the first, this opening scene, it's very much show, don't tell. And there are, are certain things within that scene that I want to get across to be shown, but then not talk about them for quite a while and have them come back up later in the story with a bit more explanation or a bit more of a callback so that the reader... I suppose what I'm trying to say is I love it in books when you read something uh, in a scene and certain details just seem sort of innocuous. But then later on, it's revealed that actually they were probably quite important or they were a signifier of something else. And it's um, I've always enjoyed that. So that's this, the thing I'm trying to go for here is there are a lot of things in this world that the reader won't sort of get or understand straight off the bat without exposition, but I don't want it to just be exposition dumps, which yeah. I felt like it was a bit exposition-y um, at first. So I've, I kind of tore it down a little bit and took out a lot of internal dialogue that uh, Dora was having and sort of tried to bring it more back down to it. It was an experience that she was going through that she couldn't really put into words for instance, that when she transitions over from like being in her dreams and being in a coma to dying and being in the underworld, it's described as 
feeling like you're underwater, then the water just disappears suddenly. And the change of pressure, like the internal pressure versus the external pressure, like opening an airlock or anything like that, she feels as though she feels this psychological strain and everything inside her is trying to be sort of pulled out and into the open space around her. And I wanted to get that across as almost like a, uh, like a grinding physical feeling of exertion. And I do that through little things like her, her physicality and, and her physical actions. There's a point where she sort of goes through a large part of the pressure and it builds and builds and builds. And she's sort of at this point, she's on her hands and knees sort of stressed and strained against what she's doing. And she'll, she raises her fists. And then like at the last moment when the sort of pressure equalizes and it's like a, I know, like a snap, like a moment of like, this is it, this is the breaking point. It's either going to, everything inside is either going to dissipate and you'll be nothing or you're going to retain your form. And she sort of, in her strain, like hits the ground and the ground cracks and splinters underneath her is a sort of visual way of showing that one, she's in a place now where her physical strength is different or at least can be different. And that that is being shown as a, a symptom of what's happening to her. So I, I want these little things that show that this world is different, what, how she interacts with this world is different. Um, but it's just going to be like a taster. It's going to be like, yep, yeah, things are different now. Things are definitely different. Things have changed, but you don't quite know how you don't, you don't, obviously you're not going to know straight away that she's dead and this is what's happened and, and so forth. But I wanted this odd moment that kind of, showed that this world is different and her transition into this world itself was a strain and was a stressful thing and had uh, a both physical and mental effect on her um and when i initially did it there was a lot of like dora felt like this dora felt like that and it's it, it I, I look back through it and i was like oh that's a nice story if i was in primary school you are going to get a snap on the wrist Russ. Oh, okay. <laughs> right don't do that again it's tempting. This is why I've said the thing about like having you seen separate so you don't look over those things and feel tempted to edit them. I mean, what's going to happen throughout this process is I'm going to keep sending you stuff to listen to. Yeah. Um, you know, different podcasts and things and different lessons that you will want to apply, but apply it to the stuff going forward. And then when you do your rewrite, because otherwise you're just going to listen to something and you're going to go, oh, I should have done that. Mm. If you think that, just write it down somewhere, write it down as a little note and just go, right, I know I need to do that, but hey, let's press on forward because yeah. that time you spent tinkering with that, you could have spent doing the next scene or whatever. So <clears throat> try and focus on first draft stuff, always first draft stuff until yeah. you've done the first draft. And that, what you were doing then was second draft stuff. So mm -hmm. just try and Stop it. <laughs> Focus. Yes, Focus. It is a bad habit I have, getting ahead of myself before something's completely done and then yeah. sort of sometimes building a house of cards. So, uh, yes, I'll, I'll do my best to, to not, to not do that. I'll do first draft stuff only. Consider yourself admonished. Okay. I am, I am admonished. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lesson and it is hard. I know it's hard. I have to be really careful with myself. I had the thing the other day with these um, novellas that I'm writing and uh, I thought, well, I could do one a month of these quite handily. And one of the things I was thinking was, right, I will write 5,000 words. And then once I've got to the 5,000 words, I'll edit that. And then I'll do the next 5,000. And I thought, what am I, what am I thinking? I just need to write the first draft of these things. Yeah. And then do the editing afterwards. It's just because I know that it's a big task when you're editing. I think you spend probably about three times longer editing. And you do writing if you're lucky, you know, it's mm. like, this is the easy bit. This is the fast bit. The faster you can kind of power through it. And then that's when the real work begins. So sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've got some things in mind that I'd like to send you, but I'm yeah. just thinking, is there anything where you think, okay, I'm really struggling with this aspect of writing. Is there anything you want me to send you stuff? Um, about? What I'm going to struggle with the most is like I was saying earlier, is individual voices and dialogue. And, you know, I've got, like you said, I've got these character references that I've, I've created. So, you know, I do have an image. Um, and maybe, you know, and tell me if this is the case. Maybe this is second draft stuff again, and maybe I'm getting just too far ahead of myself. But I think as, uh, even if it's just something to keep listening to in the background, you know, as you keep sending me these things, I, I feel like one of my weaknesses is going to be 
dialogue or at least uh, authentic sounding dialogue until I get better at it and have like, had more practice. So, you know, anything you can send me about dialogue, about how it can work or some great examples of dialogue done in interesting ways, just to maybe broaden my horizons in that regard. Like that stuff will always be really helpful to me, I feel. But uh, as we go on, I, I feel like I'm going to identify more and more weaknesses, um, which will be a good thing. Every time I run up against something that I specifically feel like I need help with, I'll make definite like sort of requests for that. This is largely going to be an exercise I know also in identifying my weaknesses, which are going to be plenty, seeing as this is honestly my first proper foray into this. And I, it, it, if anything, this is more about learning how to do this properly. Uh, hence, yeah. these, hence these podcasts, and that is my aim. <laughs> like as much as it's as much as it's uh, as much as it'd be nice to think about having a published book and it being successful, I'm not thinking about that. Um, I just I feel like I can't because it's it's putting the the cart before the horse and really missing the point that this is supposed to be about me learning how to do this, not me just being able to do this on my first go and being great at it. And so I am sort of hungry for lessons and hungry for tips yeah. and tricks, um, technical things. Well, what you can do is just flip open your favourite book and just have a look at how the dialogue works. Mm. One tip that authors give is to basically just go out in the world and listen to how people speak to each other. But if you do that, you're just going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, bad man, yeah, I saw, yeah, bleh. like just nothing, you know. Yeah. Like it, they're not in a story, so they're not moving stuff on. Watch episodes of Frasier, like the dialogue in that is excellent. Mm. Or watch films like Lost in Translation, something like that where it is very much about the dialogue. I mean, Lost in Translation is a masterpiece in dialogue as showing, not telling, and subtext and getting stuff across that is just so kind of below the surface, but mm -hmm. is there, and it's really stark, even though Bill Murray never comes out and goes, I'm really bitter, I'm in this job that I hate, I'm a sellout, or I should be doing this, I know that my soul would be rewarded by this, but I am just after the money and I hate myself because of it. I hate my wife. I hate my life. Like, he never says any of that, but it's so mm. kind of stark, in it? And it's brilliant. And Scarlett Johansson, her role is what she's just going along with life. She doesn't know what she's going to do. She's just, she's bitter as well because she just sees success around her. And it's like, none of this is ever said. None of this yeah. is said blatantly, but it's all there. So study something like that and just look at how it's done because it's really interesting. And, yeah, just listen to dialogue in good films and good TV shows and in good books because you'll learn more from that than me kind of t <laughs> telling you about it. Do you know what I mean? Just yes. get examples, get shown. Do that. That's your homework this week. I'm not going to send you any podcasts, but just when you're watching something, be mindful of the dialogue, listen to it, mm. and how it's kind of having this double duty and revealing details about people without necessarily saying directly what it is, because I think that's that's when you're getting a thing, when you're working on this level of implication and working on this level of suggestion. Yeah. That's when it gets really interesting. This is what separates good writers from bad writers, in my view. It's when the writing is a bit too on the nose. Every aspect of a character should reveal part of who they are, not just what is obvious exposition. So it's the idea of you've got to infuse a character, like every a facet of what a character does in your book with who they are, from from the words they choose to use, from their actions, and that's where you get like subtext. It's where you you know subtext will, would come naturally is what I'm thinking. If you can do show, not tell well, you will just naturally generate subtext for your characters, um, yeah. which is what people like to pick up on. Well, I'm going to see you this weekend anyway. So what I'll do is I'm going to bring you a book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it's got a great name. Um, let me think. It's called Dialogue, right? <laughs> it's by Robert McKee. And it's just masterful in terms of how it goes over this. And it'll probably take you a few weeks to go through. I'll bring that for you. And cool. I'll be at homework for a couple of weeks to kind of really get into this and really get into how dialogue works. He's also done a really good book called Story as well, which is another one you should probably go back to once we've got in the kind of nitty gritty areas. How does that sound? That sounds great. Rock and roll. So remember, you can join our Facebook group. Just search for Stop Booking Around. And you can follow me on Twitter. It's at JL Cronshaw. If you've got questions or comments for Russ, please do 
get in touch, you can do it on Twitter, through the Facebook group, or you can email me. It's john at johncronshaw.com. That's J-O-N-C-R-O-N-S-H-A-W. And you can check out the Stop Booking Around ebook and paperback. So until next time, cheerio. Bye. I'm John Cronshaw. And I'm Russell Evans. So a few weeks ago, Russ, I gave you the homework to listen to a bunch of podcasts that I sent you. There were things like the Creative Writers Tool Belt, and they were basically about showing, not telling. And I'm just wondering, you know, we had time to kind of unpack those now and digest what you've learned. (laughs) Yes, I have. Yeah, we touched on them briefly in in another episode, but um, the one that really sort of stuck a chord with me and I've kind of tried to think about it more and break it down was the um the creative writer's tool belt. Um specifically in the way that he breaks down the idea of show don't tell into sort of five points that each relate to um a different part of how how you would write and how you convey things. So I was thinking like we could go through those and have and have like a bit of a chat about each one and sort of how you use it and just generally what I think of it. So I thought that might be a good idea. You said this five points then I'm taking that that you wrote them down. I did. Like like I actually made notes and everything. I know. It's like so. good, good habits and things. <laughs> so, yeah, tell me then, what was the first one? Use the senses. <laughs> it makes sense. Uh, it's, it's little things, but it can set the scene. Before we start this, I'll preface and say that he gave an example where he gave a scene and he just told it all and didn't show anything. And it took 120 words. And then he did that same scene just trying to show and use these five techniques. And it took like 76 words I think it was and I think that that's a really great point is that if what you write is too long people are just going to start skim reading it just for little nuggets of information the things that sort of set the scene or give them what they need but if you keep it short and descriptive it's more evocative and it's it's quicker to read so it's easier to consume and using the senses instead of you know like saying the room was cold. It could be things like, you know, the character feels the the nip at the end of their nose or on their ears and and so forth. Or like, you know, the hair standing up on the back of their neck or something like that. Yeah, so instead of laying out what is happening, what's going on, you're communicating it through the actions of the person. I think you can get things really interesting with, especially like smell and taste, like you don't get taste enough, but have you ever smelt something so bad that you taste it? Yes. You know I mean? Like if you can get that and you say, you know, she tasted the sewage or, you know, when she walked past, it, it's like that's almost more visceral than saying that it, she smelt it and it was really bad. Or Yeah, when you like when it overpowers more than one sense and it turns up the dial, doesn't it? It makes it more evocative. And just detailing the sounds as well and, you know, not just saying that there was an explosion. You might say something like an explosion rocked the buildings it's like the explosion is doing something. It's not like it's just... Yeah, the it's, of it's how it's interacting with the character, not so much just being observed by the character or mm. by the narrator or so forth and so on. But it's a funny thing about senses anyway because they are our most powerful signifier for memory and experience. And especially things like sound and taste, they actually tend to be the most powerful. Um, but it's like, I think... What's the book? Is it Remembrance of Things Past? That's actually an entire book, an entire story that's written from the point of somebody who I think they eat a piece of cake and the taste brings back this memory of this entire story. And I always thought that was a great example of how our senses sort of inform our our experiences and what we remember and and how they can unlock things that um, we may have forgotten. 
So and I think that's that's a great device as well in stories as well when somebody undergoes a sensory experience as, and it sort of unlocks something within them or they remember something. I've always enjoyed those. Yeah, you could, for example, have you know the smell of strawberries catching the wind or something, and it bringing it back to a childhood memory of something that, that's relevant to the story. You know, little things like that could be an interesting way of dealing with things like exposition and fact dumping that kind of thing. So you yeah. make it as part of she's remembering this right now because of this part of the world or mm. like I suppose it, it has its danger of becoming too like deus ex machina because of the way it can be used but i think that it's a one of the best things to use properly i think a lot of the my favorite books have always made me feel like i feel what the environment is like not that i just know what it is like i think we've mentioned it before Perdido Street Station. Yes. If you, I mean, I think that the descriptions in that are a little bit overdone. Let's they say. are. They are a bit. They're a bit <laughs> overwrought. He, do, he does like like describing his world. Yeah, but you get the feeling that that place is disgusting. It's yeah. Grubby. There's everything sticky, and you know all those like horrible sensual feelings that you get when something's disgusting. Mm. He throws it in there, and you really feel that this world is just a just a horrible, horrible place. Yeah, it feels very tangible because of that, and it really helps buy into what's going on, <laughs> because what's going on is largely unpleasant. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, moving on to the next point. So this one was a bit more kind of nebulous. He didn't elaborate too much on this, which I think maybe might have been a bit of a joke on what it is, and it's imply, hint, and suggest. You definitely have a lot more experience with as like a writer, as someone who is published, and I'm still trying to sort of... I understand the point of it, is that don't give it all away, you know, drop hints, drop suggestions, like foreshadow in ways yeah. that are not obvious, but yet when you see them in retrospect, you go, oh yes, of course. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll give you a really concrete example of this as something I was working on this morning. Um, mm. So I've been editing, so I'm working on this um, novella series of fantasy novellas at the minute, and I was editing the first full book in that, and there's a bit where my character is essentially writing a note to her mother, who is the empress. So she's a princess. She's writing a note to her mother. And she is basically wanting to leave. So she's essentially writing her leaving note. And instead of me saying she wrote her leaving note, which I did in my first draft, mm. I then said, I didn't say what she was writing in the thing. I didn't have the thoughts. But because of the situations that had come before it, because of her mood, you know, I said something like she scratched a note in a flurry or wherever it was. And then, you know, she redrafted it three times and then rewrote it in a formal script. And that was it. I didn't elaborate yeah. on what it was. But if you were paying attention to the story, it's really obvious. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? So yeah. just little things like that where I don't have to go, this is what this is. You should be able to pay attention and get stuff with hints and implications and things. I'm going to get you to read Robert McKee's dialogue. I mentioned it last week, I think. And this book's really good at showing you how to understand subtext. And you can get this in things like, okay, you've got two people, a couple in a kitchen, and they're having an argument about the washing up. And the stuff that's in this argument isn't really about the washing up. There's other things that are underneath that aren't being said but are implied so, you know, you might get someone going, you shouldn't leave the pans out like that. Just wash them up. Oh, you would say that. You know, like little things yeah. where it's it's kind of hinting at a deeper thing, but it's never mentioned. It's and kind yet, of like, like when a relationship goes bad, it's almost like two ideologies start to clash. And so it starts to become more, more abstract. Like, so if one person's a little tidier than the other. Yeah, if they will. They will ultimately end up s sort of starting to sort of nag on them. That little issue the tidiness will then become like a, you know, a stand in for the entire relationship or. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I think, I think you can do this with, especially with fantasy worlds, you know, if you describe everything, it's going to be boring. And I think you can just have little hints and implications. Like, I don't know if you go into a hotel room and you see, okay, there's a shit smear on the wall. Like <laughs> just, like yes, that. it implies a lot. <laughs> it implies a lot, doesn't it? You don't. Yes. You, you, it raises a the lot. Imagination of, goes wild. Exactly, and that's what you should do. Like you, you could go at the hotel room, and you know, you could literally say it was a hotel room. There was a smear of shit on the window, and that's all you need. You don't need to know what the bed looks like. You don't yeah. need anything else. It's like you've got <laughs> the two concrete details. Like that's very specific as well. 
So I think that's the key is like specificity in terms of description and yeah. make them sparse as well. So don't just describe every little detail of something unless mm-hmm. there's a purpose to it. Like I, I was thinking about this the other day and because of the fantasy world that I'm writing in, I've described a door in a lot of detail and I'd be kind of resistant to this, but the door is almost foreshadowing some of the stuff that's coming in the story. Yeah. So that it's about how you know my main character sees the world. So she notices all this kind of symbolism within a door, even though it's somewhere she's been all her life. So she's kind of attracted to these images and these symbols that are all around. So judge it on the context, I suppose, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, no, exactly. That's spot on. Yeah, definitely. So the next point, which is one I'm somewhat dreading to a point because I've not really, you know, I, I know I can do descriptive, but the next point is dialogue. So dialogue should convey the personality of your characters. It's a difficult thing for me because, like I said, I am very noobish at it and right now i am just outlining so the dialogue is very sort of straightforward it's it's just a, a basic play on on what is kind of going to be said really so i haven't had a lot of chance to really sort of dig into it and try and play around with it so again this is really sort of more your sort of okay milieu. so you've got a character in your fantasy world that they're for the first time if you went in and were just like, oh my goodness, look at this. This is amazing. I've never seen anything like this. What? What is it like really kind of hyperactive and going after things? Yeah, That will say a lot more about that particular character than having someone else go, um, okay, um, this is odd, right? Okay. Um, not really sure what to do. You know, so it's like, yeah, yeah you get the personality because – the person will respond in response to it. Like if you understand your character, which I'm sure you do by now, your character's personality will come out because I can't imagine Dora going, Oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever seen. This is awesome. Look Mm. at this. Look at all these crazy things. Look at this. (laughs) Like you're laughing because it's true, isn't it? It's like, yeah. Yeah. And then when you do it, it'll be jarring. So I think that one is one you can overthink. Mm. I think if you've got an understanding of your character's motivations, and what their vulnerabilities are, and what their tone is, which you'll have got through the casting. Yeah. I don't think that's really something you need to worry about, because I don't think you're going to do something that is completely out of character for her, unless there is a reason in the story to do that. Yeah, and I suppose it is an extension of like physical expression, isn't it? So I, I will obviously go in... I, I know the moods of, of my characters. I know how they're going to feel in that situation. So I think as long as I can keep that in mind, I feel yeah, yeah that maybe the dialogue will be a, maybe a bit easier than I thought it was um, or think it will be. But time will tell. And when I actually get to that point when I'm actually having to write genuine interactions between characters it's something we'll be able to talk about in a bit more detail and as well with the physical stuff okay you've got dora going into this world and she's you know wringing her wrists and then another person is like pumping his fist going yeah this is this is a great play you know that those little bits of body language say a lot more Mm. even if you don't have any dialogue than you'll get it i've got no worries about that i think you're right i think you're not going to have dora doing fist pumps and (laughs) Especially with her hand. <laughs> yes, no, yeah. I think it, it'll be a bit more morbid. Um, yeah. Okay, so you touched on this actually earlier when we were talking about imply, hint, and suggest. But, yeah, the fourth point is, I've kind of had to break it down so I understood it a bit better. So it's use details. Uh, it can reveal as much as verbose description. Um, and this resonates with me a lot as well. I think it's got like a macro and a micro kind of scale to it in regards to any kind of creative writing, be it in films or games or in books. Again, exposition can be super boring. And granted, things like the Silmarillion exist, which are like, which are really dry, like history books based in like a fictional world. People love them because they're law and people love law. But I think people love law if you create like a, a hunger for it, a want to know. And if you give everybody everything all up front, there's nothing new to discover in your world or there's very little and it gets kind of meted out in an arbitrary fashion as new things are encountered but the small hints little bits and bobs that uh, maybe stand out Mm. about certain things can do a lot more for the imagination and can inform us of 
they could be leading in a way. You you know, you could have a castle, but if the only thing you describe about it are how many buttresses it has, then you give the impression that it's very strong. Mm. Or if you describe its high, pristine towers, you give the impression that it's a beautiful castle and so forth and so on. Um, yeah. So it, it, it paints the tone as well as provides the all sort of nuggets of interest for people. Like, I think that what Andy's saying in this bit is this thing, which we mentioned earlier, which is the stuff about having little details that are very telling. So, yeah. for example, you could have a sitting room in a sitting room, there's a leather chair, there's horse brasses hung on the fire, there's a deer's head above the fire. Like, you've already got a picture of the rest of that room, probably, based on those little descriptions. And then yeah. if it was to say, there's a sitting room, there's a chair, there's an abstract painting above, a wood-burning stove. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Again, a different type of house. <laughs> and it's like... It informs the person that might live there as well. Exactly, yeah. So a person, I mean, I don't know, a person who's got a deer's head above their fire with horse brasses, okay, maybe they're into hunting or maybe they're into, um, you know, maybe they're in the aristocracy or that kind of thing. Yeah, maybe they value trophies, uh, you know, and it's not about necessarily hunting. It it can say a lot while saying a little as well and it can imply a lot. And again, it it makes you think it's it's good for the imagination. It's rich. Again, with both of these, I've not gone... It was a big leather chair. There was fluffy arms and a cushion. And, you know, you don't need all those things. It's like you can, the less you've got that are very specific. Yeah, I'll keep going back to this. It's specific details. It's like, you know, instead of talking about something being made of metal, you talk about it being made of chrome or iron or copper or brass. Each of those has different connotations, Mm. different looks, and different feels. Same with wood, you know, you you don't go oh, it was a big wooden door, you go, it was a pine door, it was an oak door. There's different feelings, different connotations that come from that. And it's about kind of trying to uh, pull that out in a relevant way to your world and to, to your characters as well. And it's going to be interesting in what I'm writing because of the nature of physical existence there. It's, I'm looking forward to it because it means I'll get to attribute certain properties to certain materials that don't normally sort of exist so i think i'll have fun sort of yeah mashing up those those uh descriptions and creating like dissonance in how the world is sort of experienced by the main character which will kind of hopefully give the reader a bit of a sort of off kilter feeling as well at times yeah that's good yeah again you can kind of play on these expectations as well of the reader Mm. Um, draw them in and then pull the rug from under them. You know, that's that's a nice little thing you can do. But I think if you do that too much, then they're, they're going to feel a bit lost and a bit insecure in the world and kind of trusting the, nar- the narration. So yes, less is more sometimes. Mm. Um, so the, the fifth point, which is the most subjective point, which also makes it the most dangerous point, is include humour. Now, writing comedy is notoriously difficult because of the subjective nature of, of humour and taste and yeah. just generally what tickles people. So it's a funny thing and I hadn't thought about it and really beyond the idea of like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, no, of course the book will be funny. I'm going to write it. So, you know, I, I like to be funny, not that <laughs> I necessarily think I am, yeah. but you know what I mean? Like it, it's part of me, it's part of what I do. Brevity is a way I... Uh, levity and all that stuff wrong words all the time um is part of how i deal with things i make light of situations and such in order to cope with them um and so i naturally would be like well that's going to come through in the book but the more i think about it it might not necessarily and i think it's good that i accept that now and i'm not necessarily going to be trying to make it funny like Okay, there's. I think there's a big difference between being comedic and being humorous. Yeah. I think you can be humorous and be not going for laughs. You can have little moments where mm. things... Okay, it's like gallows humor. Like yeah. almost it being in a really horrible situation and pointing something out about it that is a bit dark and a bit grim can be funny and it can mm. be humorous. So I, th- I think you will be able to do it. I don't think you want to force it. I think you're not going for laughs mm. but if you write any kind of wit or any kind of irony or any kind of sarcasm then you do in humor as you've got a kind of bit of a late teen early 20s woman then the chances are you might have a bit of snark in there or you know a bit of sarcasm a bit of humor at some point and you can also have 
dramatic irony where we know that Dora is going to do something that is going to backfire. Mm. And we, we're almost going along with the thing of, okay, we know this is going to end badly. How is it going to end badly? <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. And that, that, that is humour, even though it's not something you think of as comedic. Once you're playing in those fields of, of irony and things like that, then you're in the realm of humour. You're right. That, I mean, I didn't think about that definition. I didn't really like separate those two words, but humour is a different thing from comedy. I'm not writing the book to make people laugh, mm. but I do hope there are moments in it that would make people laugh. So I suppose that, that is the difference, yeah. really. This is an interesting thing. I always find this in horror, is horror and comedy affect the same part of the body that like really hit you in the diaphragm. Yeah. So sometimes something will scare you and you'll laugh. And that's because it's a kind of, it's a release. And so you can use a little bit of humor, a little scene where it doesn't have to be funny, but it, it's a bit lighter in tone, maybe. Maybe after something really horrible has happened, just to mm. give the reader a bit of breathing space. And so they realize that, okay, pressure's off a bit. Phew, right. Carry on. <laughs> you know, I'm ready now. Yeah. I'm ready. So it's kind of taking your reader on this bit of an emotional up and down. Because if you're all going in the same direction where it's bad, 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 you're just going to be like, oh, this is just terrible. And whereas if you've got bad, 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 good, go, ah, this is hilarious. Oh, man, that's tragic. Or, you know, and you've been thrown around in all these different emotions, then that's going to be a more satisfying read and a more satisfying journey. No, that's great. Yeah, I'll take that to heart and try and keep, bear it in mind. So yeah, but those those points have really resonated with me. So I'm going to keep them close to my brain while I write. And then sort of once I've done my um, the bones of the story and I start sort of editing and, and redrafting, I'll, I think I'll look at each scene or each chapter through the lens of these points um, I'll try not to be too strict because I don't want to be sort of draconian with it, but you know, I think they are really good points for writers and of all stripes. I heard a really good tip by um, Brandon Sanderson, and mm. when he edits his novels, he goes through them with different coloured pens, and he will highlight based on the colour whether it's a, a smell, whether it's a touch, you know, which sense it is going for. And if he if he's got a whole page that is just visual descriptions based on this colour thing, then he'll change stuff up. He'll add sense ones, he'll add hearing ones. He does that all the way through to kind of mix it up. And that's what you need to do. You need to kind of keep adding different things and appealing to different senses all the time. Yeah. Hmm. Right, so, yeah, description then. That's, I think you're going to get a good handle on that. Next week, I think we need to have a bit of a catch-up about where you are at in terms of your story. So I hope you've been writing and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You'll have something to talk about, so that'll be good. So remember, if you're enjoying the show, please do leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. You can get the Stop Booking Around book. It's by J.L. Cronshaw. It's called Stop Booking Around, How to Overcome Author Procrastination. So check that out now. And join the Facebook group, search for Stop Booking Around, and you can follow me on Twitter. It's at J.L. Cronshaw. And if you want to email the show, it's john at johncronshaw.com. That's J-O-N-C-R-O-N-S-H-A-W. So until next time, cheer you. Bye. To the Stop Booking Around podcast. I'm John Cronshaw. And I'm Russell Evans. Last week we looked at describing your world, descriptions, and things like that. Today I just want to have a little bit of a catch up with you about how the writing is going because I think you might be trying to sneak past me the fact that you haven't been writing. <laughs> <laughs> how is it going, Russ? Is it is it all right? Yeah, it's slowly but surely. It's it's the difficult thing about being an adult with another job and small creature to keep alive. But where I can, I've sat down and I've done my best to apply the things we've spoken about. And I know it's only, it's only got to be rough 
so I'm trying to stick to that too and not to be too precious. But I feel like, especially in my last time I, I sat down and wrote, I really felt like I'd managed to get over that want to be too descriptive for what is essentially like the bare bones. And I don't know if that was a little bit of ego or a little bit of, because I just enjoy that sort of thing. I think that's a, I enjoy being descriptive. I enjoy using words or finding new and interesting ways to describe things. But I know I had to dial it down. So I have. Well, that's good then. So you messaged me earlier in the week and said that you changed your idea a bit. Is that like you've rewritten your outline or have you just, what have you done? Well, it's funny because I realized how things have to change. When I came up with the new outline, I changed a specific detail about what happens to Dora. And it's, funny how that's sort of made me have to think about how her and Inigo get introduced to each other. So in my very first, very, very first original idea draft, not even on paper, part of what happened to Dora, how she lost her her hand when she got to the underworld was that she would, you know, appear in the underworld naked, flat grey expanse around her in all directions, which isn't that different. And she would see what looked like a group of people and should approach them. And as she got closer to them, it would turn out that they were zombies. Now, they weren't really zombies. They were another sort of symptom of the underworld. Um, So like the mindless dead, like they, they lost their mind in the transition and all they have left is the want to be near part of something. It's like an abstract desire they have. Um, so she, her reaction to them is just like, oh, no, zombies. Because to her, she's seen it all before in her dreams. So she sort of sits down on a rock and starts to think and gets bored. And the zombies w- wander closer to her and she sees them more of like an annoyance and so forth. And then one gets too close and she goes to slap it sort of, you know, just casually like get away. Uh, and her hand passes through it and comes through the other side without a hand. And at that point, that's when she freaks out, so forth and so on, and ends up meeting Inigo. But because of well, my outline, rechanging things and adding more events to what happens before she actually gets to the city and how she and changing and how she lost her hand and making it part of a bigger story, I had to rethink how she meets Inigo. So it's similar because I still wanted this sense of like panic, her realizing that like things weren't in her control anymore. Now that that maybe something is different. Maybe she isn't dreaming. So she gets into the underworld and there's like a moment where she, I I describe it like she, it's like she was, she was like deep underwater as deep as could be. And then she wasn't. And the, the pressure it's like she has to equalize it between herself and the environment. It's, it's, this is basically like the transition and some people don't make it through it. And it is essentially like your new self, your presence, your mind, and everything having to equalize with the best term I can come up with is pressure or like a spiritual pressure of the underworld where you have to balance your physical form and in a sense become dense so as to sort of balance and not be crushed by it or essentially like liquefied by it. None of this is explained. It's all just shown like what she physically goes through. She manages to sort of do it and stabilize herself, but then her arm starts to turn to like stone. So she manages to solidify herself enough, make herself dense enough, but it goes too far. None of this is explained. She doesn't even know this, but basically what happens is that she starts to harden too much and the abstract idea of that and how it all works is that so her arm starts to slowly turn to stone and creep up towards her neck and eventually she will completely turn to stone. So she sort of panics and starts running and she just runs and runs and runs and like part of it is that like I note that she's got she doesn't get out of breath she doesn't feel her heartbeat it feels like she's not exerting anything and so it doesn't feel like she's getting anywhere and everything around her is still flat and gray and it's hard to tell the sky from the land because it's all the same tone and um, until she comes upon what she thinks looks like a forest and as she gets closer like she's drawn to it and as she gets closer the the, the forest is made out of like craggy humanoid figures this is this thing where she's getting tired and she's starting to feel the pressure and the stone is sort of building up through her chest and into her neck. And she starts to think like, well, this must be what's happened. Like she starts to accept her situation. She understands that this has happened to other people here. And she thinks like, again, she starts to let go of control and and her own fate. And 
she starts to decide that maybe this wouldn't be so bad to just, you know, let it go here and just be done with it. And then she sort of looks closer at some of the statues and she sees they've still got eyes. They've still got human eyes that are moving and looking at her and they're sort of seeping like a gray milk. It, obviously she flinches and she realizes these, whatever these things are, they're not actually dead. They're still conscious. And it's, she sort of looks at her arm and tries to move her fingers. And as she moves her fingers, like this gray, like milk cracks out from between the cracks and she starts to panic and flail and she starts knocking these things over. And as they split open, this milk comes out from inside, but then freezes with like upon instant contact with the air and she starts to hear uh, an accordion and all of the statues like turn their heads, even if some of them fall off to the direction of it. Cause she can't pick up where it's coming from, but because they all turn their heads, she like runs towards it. And as, as she runs towards it, it, it seems like the statues are trying to move to stop her going and she starts breaking off arms and her arms start sm- getting smashed and it starts seeping and so forth and so on until she, she finally gets to like it's like a, a gypsy caravan and um there's a figure on top of it sitting down playing the accordion and singing uh in spanish like all the statues stop sort of moving and she gets there and like the figure and she collapses in front of it and the figure jumps down and it's in Diego. He doesn't introduce himself but he i can't remember the line but he basically says it really bluntly it's like don't worry you're dead now to just sort of really hammer home what's happening but she will wake up and her arm will be fine and everything will be okay. And I just like, I kind of like that, that I'm going to foreshadow her actually losing her arm properly. And it's funny how that all sort of came about because of just changing one detail, which is just moving the point at which and how she loses her hand. This will happen and, and go with it. Unless it makes something worse than your outline. Then. <laughs> yeah. And just go, you know, just go with it because... This is the thing that uh, I've got you to outline. I want you to outline. I want you to try and stick to it. But mm. you've got to go with your imagination as well. And yeah. you're in a process now where you're thinking in a probably a very different way to how you've thought about your story before. So instead of thinking about it in terms of this would be cool if this would happen, now you're thinking about how would this fit within the story. And you mentioned foreshadowing. You kind of thought symbolically, you know, there's different ways you're thinking about things now because you've got the outline and that's really good. So, yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's fun. It's now that I'm starting to be able to use like the the tools um, that you've been sort of helping to provide and so forth. I can actually sort of see the examples of me using them. And it, it, you know, it gives you confidence. I'm not saying that what I'm writing is, is amazing, but I know that it is actually following certain techniques. And because of that, I feel like I'm more able to objectively judge its worth and it, maybe its need within the story. And it's nice to feel that, to feel like if I need to, I can just cut something off if it's if it's vestigial and you never know you know keep your ideas maybe i can use them later in the story or in a different story elsewhere you know don't throw it away completely exactly exactly and i i will just say not wanting you to even think you're going to produce anything that's good remember Mm -hmm. you are writing a shitty first draft so (laughs) please please keep that in mind (laughs) at all times for next week's homework then just keep on doing what you're doing keep writing your book is there anything that you think that you're struggling with or you want to ask me about or that you think we should open a can of worms on and uh, delve more into in another episode? Well, yeah. It's lore, L-O-R-E, a.k.a. world building. And, like, the the temptations therein, I think that it's something that is important as a writer, but I think it's also quite relevant right now in media other than writing and um it would be interesting to talk about it so i think that's something we can dig into oh, well let's do that then next week then we'll we'll have a think about world building and <laughs> delve into that kind of worm so that'll be fun and exciting i think remember if you're enjoying the show please do leave us a review that would be awesome you can also help support the show financially by checking out the stop booking around book it's by jl cronshaw it's called stop booking around how to overcome author procrastination. We've got a Facebook group. Search for Stop Booking Around. You can follow me on Twitter at JL Cronshaw. You should also check out my other podcast, which is called Otaku on Writing, which is O-T-A-K-U on Writing, which is basically where me and a couple of author friends deconstruct classic anime and try and use it to write some stories. 
So until next time, cheerio. Bye. Stop booking around. I'm John Cronshaw. And I'm Russell Evans. Last week, Russ, you mentioned the fact that you want to talk about world building and law and all those things that have nothing really to do with your story. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get a bit dry, I think, if we don't talk about some abstract things beyond my old boring bullshit. So, yeah, law. It's like three main things about it, really, is sort of how it's handled, how it's absorbed by consumers and the temptations of it to like because it can be such a fun thing to write yeah i want to talk about a very specific example of law and world building and while it's not necessarily to do with books it is really done largely through writing and it's in the game series of dark souls now i don't know have you have you played dark souls much do you know much about how the law is handled no i don't no so you're dropped into a world, and all you know is that you are undead, which means you can't die. It's, you don't turn into, you're not like a zombie mindless thing, but when you die, you dissipate, and then you sort of reappear at what is known as like a bonfire. And it is literally a bonfire, but um, they're like your save points, your checkpoints, so forth and so on. And this world is huge and ancient and multifaceted and full of weird, strange things, terrible things that you have absolutely no fucking clue about. You're just like, right, okay, I'm just, just dealing with this now, okay. The way Dark Souls handles its lore is largely through description on its items. So whenever you pick something up, there's always a, a description, and it's not necessarily about that item. Sometimes it's about what that item is associated with, be it a group, a person, an event. And through these tiny little snippets, people have managed to construct the actual law, like yeah. what is actually going on. And this law is huge, and there's so much of it. And because it's delivered this way, it's made people want to go after it. It's made yeah. people want to understand what's happened. And, and it's an interesting and compelling story about pride and the inability to allow the natural cycle to continue and what it's done to the world. And it's just so well done because it doesn't ruin anything for itself because it doesn't go into too much detail it leaves just enough so that people can agree on certain things but so they can also have their own thoughts about what else may happen or may have happened and that for me although you know i say it's done through the medium of a video game so it's a different interaction it is a different um, interaction but it is also something that you should be doing with the world building this is exactly what writing is you know mm. you do not write everything you do not give all the details a lot of the stuff is you filling in the gaps with your imagination and abstracting from what you read and the implications and things like that. So that does sound fascinating, to be honest, the idea of building up a world through these little fragments. But, I mean, that's what you do anyway in writing. Mm. This is the fascinating thing is like, okay, world building is bigger than story because it allows you to tell stories in a lot of different ways and through a lot of different mediums especially with games you know video games board games that kind of thing you can use a world to kind of dictate the rules and yeah. that's, that's essentially what it's there for it is okay these are the rules this is how things work and all the other stuff on top is basically a, a nice pretty paint job um that's you know maybe interesting like um what was that game we used to play when I was a kid and you paint the little figures, the little Warhammer? That was it. Yes. <laughs> so Warhammer 40,000, there we go. That was basically a desktop battle game and you could just have it as that. But mm. then there were short stories. There was a whole mythology about the, what was it, the Horus Heresy and um, stuff about 
I think they were called the Dark Angels that were these groups of space marines that had turned to the dark side, but not quite. It's it's a huge, massive, convoluted thing. I mean, like there are full yeah. books about it now, but like back then when like when it started, yeah, it was it was just like here's a board game, here's a kind of story of this board game go for it and then you'd get your codexes that showed you what the different the little stories for each unit and their stats and things like that so yeah very much so it, it was a, a world that uh, was built piecemeal bit by bit by bit like that is a fascinating way of doing it if you're thinking about it in terms of story as mm. okay this is a history but you're almost seeing it through okay you've seen bits of it through this perspective so i, I mean i used to collect i think it was the space wolves so you know i was really into their history and their lore and then i started collecting i think it was space orcs yeah <laughs> so I learned about them and how they're different and yeah it's just a, a really kind of interesting way of doing it when you can kind of use the world to do these things like games and have something else for it then okay that's great but i think when you're getting into the realms of you're writing a story primarily. Mm. I think once you start kind of straying away from that, it's almost a distraction. And I know you do need, obviously, especially with fantasy, science fiction, that kind of thing, you need a fantasy world and you need it to make sense. Yeah. But you can also do a lot of that on the fly, which is what I do. And the way I keep my world consistent in my Ravenglass Chronicles, which is going to be a 22 novella series by the time I'm finished, is every time I put a description of a person an object, an item. When I'm going through my third draft, I will cut and paste it into a hyper document and I will have it done with headings and I can link to them and things like that. So I have the descriptions and all the world being built as I'm writing it and then I can refer back to it, share it with my editor, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's really useful and that's a kind of world building as I need it. But I think there's a lot of it that I've already kind of thought about in my mind I mean, when I started doing it, I mean, I've been, this is the thing, I've been thinking about this story for so long, but I knew I wasn't ready. Mm. (laughs) And I did have a full start because I didn't plan, didn't outline or anything like that. But I started off by drawing a map because isn't that what you do with fantasy, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I drew a map and then I made up some names. And when I first started writing it, the names were literally important port town big city <laughs> little things like that so i wasn't kind of getting bogged down in the language of it yeah you sort of identified their function first yeah and then i would messed up a bit of the drawing because i was trying to draw this like peninsula at the end of the thing and it ended up looking a bit skew with and i thought actually that could be a tidal causeway instead of a thing so then i had this idea for a an island that was what's the word kind of blocked off most yeah. of the time because of the tide But I was thinking of that in terms of like, okay, I could get some really cool storytelling elements from this because Tidal Causeway, it's blocked off at certain times of the day. You know, there's the kind of trapped element. There's not being able to get to it if you need to. So instead of thinking about it in terms of how is this going to look pretty or what cool history can I do? It was always, always in service of how can this influence a story? Mm. Yeah, I I think that's... That's spot on. Yeah, it's, everything has to, suppose, have a function. Well, not everything, but, you know, if something can have a function, then it's not just vestigial. It's not just there for, for window dressing. And it, it makes it important. And it, I think it makes it stand out more to, like, a reader. Um, and, again, it's good for foreshadowing as well. If you can describe a thing and its characteristics, and at that time those characteristics don't stand out as anything important, but later on they come into play, I think that's, like, a really useful technique to use there's some stories where the world is a character in itself yeah i mean <laughs> we keep going back to it but like Perdido street station by china melville or um gene wolf's book of the new sun mm. which is tremendous and i would recommend it to everyone one of the great things about the book of the new sun is you read it the first time and i think it's probably about i don't know halfway through the second book where you realize okay this isn't a medieval fantasy <laughs> mm. you, you realize that this is actually a far future thing and these things that were being described as citadels are actually old spaceships and these people he describes a bit like knights are actually robots and it's like this whole world kind of appears to you because of the way it's described and it's described in this really kind of convoluted way yeah and when the world does reveal itself to you it is like a massive 
eye opener. So yeah. well, that's something you can really only do in books as well, which is the sort of one of the beauties of the medium, isn't it? Um, is that sort of what you hide from the reader? I mean, I think it was a few weeks ago we talked about video games like Fallout Three, where the world is the vault yes. for that person, and then something happens and boom, okay, you are in a tiny little bit of the world and the world is massive and there's loads of different things that you've never seen before. So, yeah, there's different ways you can... Yeah, there's different reveals, I suppose, yeah. I didn't think yeah. about that. Yeah. Your first point, wasn't it? You said something about how is it handled. Yeah, and that, handled world building. Yeah, and I think... Like, different ways of doing it, which really sort of I'm going to go looking for, really, to try and get, like, a, a breadth of, of experience and ideas. Yeah. It's this thing of how far do you go? Because you can just do that and never write, which is why I, I do endorse this idea of world building on the fly and doing almost the minimum you need to get going with the story. You know, you can start adding cool stuff. So I started writing this novella series and all I've known is, okay, I've got this country called Bite, which is where I've got the, you know, the t- island with the tidal causeway and things like that. That's not even the country that my story is set, but <laughs> will be because she'll go across the sea to that country so far, it's set in a city. I've just come up with a name for it. Even though I've been writing, you know, on 30,000 words in, I've got a name for it now. All I knew is I've got a palace. Mm. And in that palace, I wanted a stables because she's got a horse and that's going to play into the story. And there's kennels because that plays into the story. And there's a forge and there's a chapel. And they're the only things that I kind of thought about. That was the extent of my details when I drew my little map. Mm. And then I'm doing little descriptions of things as i'm going around and then i've got this garden and in the garden you've got statues of dragons and griffins and all these kind of mythical creatures that have been destroyed by old emperors and things like that and then i figured oh well okay she's having this kind of ritual thing so okay you'll have maybe a private small ritual in a chapel but then you need a kind of equivalent of a cathedral and I wanted it to be set in a port town and, you know, she's going to be leaving on a boat at some point. So I wanted to get in the port. So I had the thing of the parade through the city. And so I had to kind of just, you know, identify little things as she was being led through the city. Mm. And I was literally making it up as I was going along (laughs) and then dropping it on a map. So I was going, you know, she she passed, uh, what was it, like the Scribes Guild and big building of the livery company and the tax house was you know, made out of this material and like, you know, all these little things and little details like the Scribes Guild hanging out banners with calligraphy kind of shown off on them, little things like that. And then going through the harbour and then thinking like what things would be in the harbour. Okay, you'd have ships and what kind of ships? Well, the you know, big galleons and they'd be out further yeah. and there'd be smaller boats in and people unloading stuff. And then because she's going to this kind of cathedral thing, I figured, well, have it as a hill because it's coastal on a on the headland. So you've got this temple on a hill that's overlooking the sea. And because I'm kind of brainstorming each story on a tarot card, I've used the symbolism of the tarot throughout and things like that. So it's literally as I'm going, I'm coming up with the stuff and then kind of pouring it down as like, this is the law, this is the world. <laughs> and it's it's kind of bears on kind of what we spoke about a couple of weeks ago in terms of what details you use sort of so as you know like you say you're making that up on the fly you're not describing every single thing that she passes in that parade it's the little details that stand out to her about these things i would imagine from what from what you're saying yeah so Um, you know i've got like a little detail like a um you know there's a, a kid throwing out some pie towards a princess from a rooftop and it landed in the crowd and it's like you know i didn't go there was a big crowd it's like yeah all that little details just giving a big impression about what this seems like and saying you know gods line the streets with their shields to kind of stop the crowds from surging on the princess and stuff like that so i'm giving an impression of this kind of tyrannical empire just through all these little details really and mm. um you know i'm working through an outline but all the time i'm imagining this world and walking through it at the same time my character is and just kind of picking out things in my head so the other thing i wanted to talk about which i think is something that's quite relevant now again in other media largely but i feel it relates because of the idea of creating law and world building is that when a fan base grows so large it's like they they get fed so i'm going to go with star wars as an example 
the Star Wars fan base is decades old now. And so over time, they've been drip fed, you know, bits and bobs. Here's some books. Here's some games. Here's like a TV series. Here's a cartoon. And it's created this strange conflict amongst the fan base in sort of what is the right law, what is canon, what isn't. Yeah. 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 And especially with Disney taking over and them going, well, okay, the Timothy's on books don't really count anymore and yeah. books don't count and okay is film is canon the video games ignore them but <laughs> then it create this like the, the the fandom you know this is the same with a lot of fandoms you know to different degrees also the fandom feels a sense of ownership because the fandom is like well if it wasn't for us you wouldn't be creating these things so we have maintained it ourselves and we have some sense of ownership about it now this is a very general thing but this is for me sort of citing the worst examples i've seen of the attitudes in regard to this and so you get to the point now where you get the latest film where people are up in arms because certain plot threads that were left open at the end of the force awakens were just disregarded in the last jedi personally i don't have a problem with it I think things need to change and be dynamic. I think it's good to shake up things, stops them being stale, stops being the same thing, allows them to appeal to a broader audience. I think those are all good, positive things. But the problem is, is that if you've got a fan base that feels like they get to decide how things should be, because they've absorbed so much lore and they've they've chosen what they believe to be canon, it causes real problems and it stifles creativity obviously don't go mental don't disregard every piece of thing that's ever been written before have your callbacks have your references you know create that sense of history and continuity but you should be able to just go no this has changed now this is different what you thought was one thing is not because it's all subjective and it's all pliable and none of it's real which is the most important (laughs) thing to remember it's all a load of bollocks we all enjoy absorbing and, and making real in our hearts and in our heads I mean, I agree with that to some extent, but I also think that there is a case to be made for being consistent and respectful to your audience. Yes. Um, And it would be like if George R.R. Martin in the next Song of Ice and Fire book decided that, okay, Daenerys actually has superpowers. (laughs) (laughs) You know, he doesn't need the dragons to fly. And maybe Jon Snow gets a car. It's mm. like, you could just, <laughs> yeah, and then there's, and then the, you know, the people from Star Wars arrive, and like, I mean, I, I would actually love to see a, a good fantasy series where you had invaders of some variety, where it was like a, um, alien invasion almost kind of story. I'd love to read that. Mm. You know, that'd be quite interesting to do in this medieval setting or whatever. But you've basically told people, okay, this is what things are like this is why things work the way they do. And this was why I think there was a lot of kickback at the, you know, the, the prequel. Oh yeah. That was because of the midichlorians. <laughs> Which are not mentioned at all in these new ones. Also, this recently came out that um, George Lucas gave an interview and he said, well, you know, I understand that this is what people want, but those, these aren't the films that I would have made. And apparently he was going to continue to make episode seven, eight and nine more about midichlorians and about there's a secret, <laughs> secret like uh. microverse inhabited by these creatures called the will that are right. sort of control using the force for their own. Me- it's just like, Oh my God. And people like, what I hope is that people hear that and go, all right, then we didn't do too bad because we could have had that instead. I don't know. It's, it's a difficult one because it is such a big world and so many people have written in it. And, yeah. you know, Chewbacca, I, I seem to remember him once getting killed by a moon in one of the Star Wars books I read years ago. Yes. You know? Yeah, in um, <laughs> the act, the original children of Han Solo and, and Leia. Yeah, yeah, and like they have twins, don't they? And, you yeah, know, yeah, there's it's... all the different storylines that exist that aren't canon anymore. Um, you just call them alternate universes. There yeah. you go. That's the way to fix everything. Just alternate universes. And that's fine, you know. I don't, I don't mind that, but it's, it's also you've got to kind of be clear. I think, yeah. I think, you know, I don't mind a reboot. I like the fact that there's loads of different Batman origin stories and things like that. You know, it, it's interesting. I like it, yeah. and I think you can do that with certain things. But yeah, it is just kind of having respect for the fact that people have invested this time and a respect for the world. Yeah. And you don't want to end up with something like Lost, 
like when that first started, I was so intrigued by the mm, world. So was I. And by the characters and by what was going on. And by the end of it, I was just, it wasn't, I was confused. I had a lot of theories about it and it, a lot of them came to be, but it just seemed to meander and there was a lot of inconsistencies. And Lost was a great example of lots of great ideas, no closure. Yeah. Um, I think that writing it, they must have had a wonderful time thinking of all sorts of bizarre things to happen on this island and where it could all go. But ultimately, I, they just couldn't tie it all together in a, in a way that was satisfying or made sense or didn't at least in some way take the sort of wind out of you based on what the characters have been through and what you'd been through as a watcher. Which leads me up to the the third part of what I wanted to talk about, which is the temptation of law. Honestly, most of my writing experience comes from things like Dungeons and Dragons. And when you're writing a story for Dungeons and Dragons, you're you're not just writing a story, you are definitely writing a world because your characters have got a mind of their own because they are your players. So you have to create a world that is fleshed out enough for them to be able to convincingly interact with in improvised ways. So I've written whole law books about worlds and maps and down to like the tiniest things in terms of like how some economies work and things like that. And I found a great deal of satisfaction in that because yeah. it was really fun to, to, to build a world like from the minutiae up something that could compensate for even the most like aggressively adventurous or improvisational player. And you were building it for a purpose. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know I mean, you were yeah. building it for, for a particular reason and that was to fit the game. Hmm. And that's the same with world building for a story. You need to build it to fit the story. I know. I felt that way coming into it because my first draft, my first ideas, it was the same things I did before. I wrote down character descriptions as if they were Dungeons and Dragons characters, which I think is a good idea. But it's how far do I take it? So I've had to, you know, I looked through all my old notes and I made all the notebooks are filled up about this world I was building for this story. And a lot of it, I'm just going to have to disregard because it's not actually that important. It's not the most pertinent thing. A lot of it is, by definition, sort of mundane or banal because it is but, just like the cogs. Still, still, when you are doing your descriptions, you can throw those little things in because they'll be there yeah. in your mind. You'll, you'll remember them. And It's more getting out of the habit, you see, is the thing. That's what I mean by like the temptation of law because it's my temptation to enjoy yeah. being like essentially too <laughs> verbose about yeah. certain things going too into the minutiae, doing things that I don't feel I'm capable of doing while still writing an engaging story, things that like Frank Herbert does, things that um, George R. R. Martin does, things that Tolkien did. Their worlds are huge and super detailed. And George R. R. Martin has said in interviews that he will build on the fly. Yeah. <laughs> and he has, he has someone else kind of keeping him in check with <laughs> the wiki and stuff. You know, he, he builds it as he's writing. Mm. because he says he won't he wouldn't be able to write it otherwise so yeah. so i'm um, what i'm saying is a, uh, that is a present thought in my mind of again this thing of show don't tell so if there's an interesting machine that does a thing i don't have to necessarily sit there and have somebody who built that machine explain how it works a lot well, of, as you know bob <laughs> yeah it's, that's the thing it's like uh, I don't want to necessarily do the Star Trek thing where somebody says something complicated and then somebody breaks it down with a simple analogy. Um, I want some things to be mysterious and interesting and just, you know, sometimes when you break stuff down, you need to for your, like, for your reader. But sometimes it's better to just leave it as a contraption that looks bizarre and does a certain thing. Yeah, and you can see the results and the reader will know what that does. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. And hopefully it'll be towards a plot point or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is why, you know, I didn't tell you about writing. I haven't told, you know, I've not really discussed writing on a sentence level yet with you, and we'll do that at a later date. But we've discussed story first, story first, story first. And that is what resonates. World building, fine, but story first. And <laughs> just, yeah. that that's it. Just write your story, finish it, and then we can add in the details if you want. Yeah. That's the plan. Awesome. So remember, you can get the Stop Booking Around book. It's by me. So look for Stop Booking Around, How to Overcome Author Procrastination by J.L. Cronshaw. 
If you want to leave a review on iTunes for the podcast, that would be really helpful. Share it with a friend, that kind of thing. If you want to ask me a question, it's at JL Cronshaw, or you can go into the Facebook group and join us there. And finally, if you want to email the show, it's john at johncronshaw.com. That's J-O-N-C-R-O-N-S-H-A-W. So until next time, cheerio. Bye. I'm John Cronshaw. And I'm Russell Evans. Russ, you texted me this week and we were talking a little bit about, you know, in Dungeons and Dragons, you've got the character alignment sheets. And I was thinking that you can use these really effectively with writing when you're in the kind of character development phase of thinking about where your character lies. Now, if you're not familiar with the character alignment sheet, you basically have two poles. These go from good to evil and lawful to chaotic. So you have lawful good, neutral good, chaotic good, true neutral, lawful Lawful neutral, neutral. chaotic neutral, and then same with the evil. So you've got basically these nine blocks. You have to break down like just a little bit further because you have to look at lawful neutral and chaotic. So let's look at good, yeah? yeah? So lawful good is likely to be, I mean, the word there is lawful. So they are following a law, an idea. They are choosing to be good. They are choosing a path, and that is their conscious decision. But then you could also have, like, neutral good, which could be like a unicorn, (laughs) where it is a, a benevolent animal by nature of what it is. You know, it's magical, it helps people, so forth and so on. But it doesn't do it because it's like, I need to follow these rules. It does it because that's what it is. And then you can have chaotic good, which is the sort of, I've always felt is a good person who deep down is good, but they, they haven't chosen a set way of being that thing. So their end goal is the same, but they may not go about it in the, in the most strict, straightforward and typical manner. Yeah, it's almost like, screw the rules, I know what's right. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is very much like that, yeah neutral again it's the same thing so you've got the neutral kind of spectrum as well and then the evil spectrum Mm. i think you do get into some really interesting stuff especially like lawful evil like how can they kind of match so i think darth vader for example is your archetypical lawful evil character i mean it might be useful just as a a thing i mean you you know game of thrones don't you Um, yes i know game of thrones yeah so (laughs) i mean (laughs) i was was just trying to think then of like a, a show with a or a story with a big cast. I mean, you could probably mm. do this with like Harry Potter or something as well, where there's lots of characters who fall into these different things. I mean, lawful good in Game of Thrones will be someone like, I don't know, Ned Stark or Brienne. Brienne of Tarth, Tarth yeah. Yeah, who were very much like, we are good moral people. We have oaths. We obey the laws. We do what is right and lawful. Yeah, lawful good tends to be reassured by consensus as well so they follow the rules because those are the rules because they they believe that those are the right rules to follow and that idea of say honor or goodness has been reinforced you know over time by whatever society they live in so they are subscribing to the what they consider to be the the best version of what a person can be within that society yeah and i think what's interesting about both of those characters is they often do things that are to their personal detriment and especially with spoiler alert ned stark (laughs) yes Um, like you know because of his honor you know he can't get past his honor and so it ends up killing him in the end well it's more Um, than just that it's because of his honor he starts everything like everything that comes after his actions in the first book or series depending on how you've sort of consumed it is because of his lawful nature which is a good thing you can do with lawful characters which is like they are lawful to a fault and in a way they're quite small minded because they don't understand the ramifications beyond their actions yeah so going on to like neutral good then i think you've got characters like john snow yes. and rob stark people like that who are i don't know the kind of no they... i think rob's more like his dad whereas because john John never felt the same Rob, kinship. Rob Stark, the guy who wanted to start a revolution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's well, he, but he did it 
to be like his father to an extent. Yeah. Because of what happened to his father, who's followed, f- carrying on his father's ideas and ideals. Whereas, and you know, the, the story sets them up. You can see it, it puts them in these positions. So you've got Rob, the first son, who must follow the father. But then you've also got John, who, because he's a bastard, because he's shunned, he is still grown up in a good, positive environment where good morals are promoted but he cannot be a symbol of that so in order for him to do good he has to go to the wall yeah where he still is doing good but he doesn't interact with the world so it's a very sort of stationary static idea of good like so he's not forcing his beliefs on anybody he's simply maintaining a position in which he does not move which essentially you know, met- metaphorically and, you know, physically, um, which makes him like neutral in this regard, or at least in, in terms of the story for the, let's like, say, shall we say the first two thirds of it. Okay. So then you've got chaotic good characters. Now I, I would say people like Daenerys and Daria Stark fall into this. See, I would have thought Tyrion is the best chaotic good. No, um, I think Tyrion's true neutral. I would put him, <laughs> but right he's always middle. had, he's always had the best intentions though, because he, he sees how, awful his father is he doesn't want to be his father and in being in opposition to his father he ultimately chooses to do good he's the best of all in in terms of morally speaking he's the best of all of the the lannisters but don't Um, you think he's more because i i've always seen Tyrion as a, a a force for balance if that makes sense i do yeah i know what you mean but he still he still operates between the Lannisters yeah. and between, you know, he's, he's almost like the um, emissary kind of character, isn't he? He's, That's he's true, like but he's not forced into those positions. Mm. And so through those positions, he does as good as he can. Like when he's yeah. in charge of King's Landing, he he makes l- masses and masses of, of good, positive changes um, despite what everybody thinks of him. So again, it's this idea of this character who... He doesn't follow the rules and he doesn't need to be approved of morally, but his actions are still always actually for the greater good. Yeah. So, yeah. (laughs) And what I like about this is, uh, you know, we're coming up with these... uh, Let's get down to it. Let's fucking do it. (laughs) It's a bit of debate. You will not find a lot of true neutral characters throughout books. Oh, apart from maybe... I don't know. I was thinking we, we we had a little talk about it last night, and I will always go back to the June books because they've got so much brilliant things in them. But Leto Atreides the second, because he knows what's coming, he strives for the best outcome, the best balance, and so he will do what he thinks is a good idea at the time in order to strive for something larger than him. And he doesn't care if people think he's good. He doesn't care if you think he's bad. He doesn't care if his actions hurt people on the individual level or like what the morality of it is or anything like that. He has a very set goal, which is neither essentially good or bad. It's about creating functionality for the universe, really, or the galaxy, at least. I can't remember how large the Dune books span Mm, but then again, I don't know. Again, this is the thing. Like, it's. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't really matter in a way. No, like, no. It's, all, it's... all this stuff. All this stuff is is kind of useful to think about as little pegs to kind of start weaving your characters around. I think that's mm. kind of what I'm Ooh. trying to get at. So there is, and I'm, I'm, here's me saying all this: that's really difficult to write a true neutral character. Um, there is a character in my book that is true neutral at least for a while. And that's because their actions and their position are not dictated by themselves, but by an aggregate of that society. So they are essentially almost a figurehead. They are the the center point of everything, metaphorically speaking. They do come away from that eventually. But yes, they start off as, again, an avatar of something instead of someone with their own anima and their own impetus. And I think that is really what a true neutral character is. Like I say, it's a character that is an avatar of a larger perspective that doesn't concern itself with morality. Because when we talk about evil and good, we are talking about a subjective idea of morality. But when you remove yourself from it and become larger than it, you, in a sense, do become neutral. Okay, chaotic good then, Daenerys. Like, I think maybe in the first few series, definitely chaotic good. I think she... 
the her arc kind of drifts maybe towards being a bit of a despot so yeah um, well, but i, I would mean, start with her being chaotic good i think i might have started her, she has she has probably the most growth out of any character so i'd have started her as chaotic neutral yeah. because she's caught in the middle of all of this stuff and has no real control over her life so she cannot really be good or evil to anybody really i think the yeah. turning point of that is when her brother dies and i think that at that point she starts to sort of self-actuate she starts to make her own decisions when all of the men in her life that essentially have power over her disappear and mm. she starts to make her own decisions she then starts to move towards good and i think that she goes through chaotic good into maybe lawful good nearly by mm by the end of it because of she starts it stops being about just her getting her throne back because when she realizes that actually she's quite close to doing that mm. she starts to become right well i'm actually going to be a ruler which means i need to be lawful good because that's the definition of yeah. a good ruler yeah because like the chaotic good stuff i'm thinking of really is her going against all the stuff on slavers bay and fle- you know freeing all the slaves going against the and crucifying the slavers themselves which would not be seen as a morally good act yeah but it is done to promote a greater good a greater good yeah yeah a greater so. good <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah so they're, they're in, and obviously i think aria stark as well you know she's just a really interesting character in terms of the way her character develops, I think she starts off as chaotic good and maybe goes into chaotic neutral just because of yes um, the her well, character arc, which is really interesting. Like this is a point we need to kind of keep going to is I think once you get into the moving a character onto the neutral field, I think you're almost in the anti-hero territory. Heroic characters are all at this top level, you know, the good in some way, yeah. And then your neutral characters, you know, they could be your you know your anti-heroes, people like Han Solo. They will start off as like what chaotic neutral maybe, and then by the end moving into what I'd say neutral good or something. I think another thing we should probably just point out is that when it refers to chaotic, it, it essentially means that they oscillate between sort of lawful and neutral. If they happen to fall in with the law, great. And if not, it's almost like it doesn't matter to them. Yeah. So we've got the the neutral level next. Like when I think about characters, I actually find the neutral characters the most interesting. Uh, yes. Maybe that just says more about me because, okay, chaotic good. I like that. I think chaotic good is you get some interesting characters with that. But I don't know. Lawful neutral is what you get. Varys and Stannis Baratheon. Like they're both really great, interesting characters. Especially Stannis, like he's just a really, really well, strange character. Here's here's an interesting. Like the best example I can give in the in the series of lawful neutral is you say it's a character, but it does have representatives. Is the Iron Bank? Yeah, yeah. They are yeah. lawful neutral by very strict reasons. They don't interfere, but they will offer help. I say help. You know, money, resources to those who come to them with the correct criteria. Mm. So it's not about a choice they're making based on who that person is or what they want to do, simply based on just do they have the collateral to back up any loans that they require. True neutral then. I mean, this this is, um, I mean, I I still think Tyrion, but there we go. Um, Jagan Jagan Hadar, maybe. Um, I don't Um, know. This is a difficult one, actually. <laughs> I see. Again, Jack and Hadar, I'd say, is chaotic neutral because he lets Arya go. He, you can see that he has his own reasons and his own philosophy. So that's why he's got no problem doing, Im- you know, committing immoral acts. Yeah. But ultimately, he enables Arya to actually not be a faceless person and lets her take the things that she's learnt that should not go further than that, so should we say, order, of that well, religious order or order of belief. And he knows that she's going to take what she learned and do very non-neutral things with it. She's going to affect the future of the realm because of her actions. So he's more chaotic neutral. True neutral is the hardest alignment to put on someone. Normally, true neutral is reserved for entities that are not necessarily of our world and are more observant and non-interfering. They just don't get involved at all. They are simply there. Like the Watcher in Marvel comics and things like that. And I was thinking maybe the Three-Eyed Raven um, is a good example of true neutral, but he kind of helps against the encroaching 
White Walkers, he gets Bran to come to him so that Bran can have his abilities and and help. So again, like you say, True Neutral is a very, very difficult character to create because they're almost not a character because they are so non-interactive or their neutrality is just purely what defines them. And it's always very, very difficult to find characters or at least very good characters written in that sense. What's his name? Though he becomes Reek. He might be. <laughs> but then, I don't know. He's a bit like when he's Reek, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a, um, I don't know. It's, like, like I say, it's a really difficult alignment to peg on someone because most characters, most human or say hum, humane or human-like characters, any mm. character with any kind of moral or social uh, mores or philosophies, it's incredibly difficult to make them true neutral. They almost have to be in some ways a non-entity. Just had a look up some of this now, and <laughs> I've just seen like two different articles saying Tyrion. <laughs> ah, yeah, well, yeah, the internet we backs you up, so you must be right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay, what's this? Uh, Daenerys neutral good. Okay, so yeah, oh, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose yeah, because they are moving, aren't they? Uh, yeah. But, but, but. Okay, so next we got chaotic neutral. Now I think that'll be people like Cold Drogo, and yes. I don't know. Uh, um the hound the hound yeah and the hound very good yeah the um, Carl Drogo doesn't really get much of a an arc because he's kind of like a story device in a way he never changes from the point at which you see him to the point at which he well no he changes a bit he gets a bit softer he gets a bit more like he's not so dothraki with her yeah. you know what i mean because it talks about the first time they have sex where it's basically him just raping her and then by the end of it like they are actually having consensual fully engaged emotional sex so yeah he does get some, he gains some humanity or he can say humanity or you can say he she manipulates him to an extent to gain more morality or a softer side oh who was the other one you said the hound. Uh, oh the hound yeah, yeah the hound he definitely starts off as chaotic neutral definitely i mean he's going more towards chaotic good now but yeah chaotic neutral definitely because he kills Arya's friend the little boy yeah but then he also tries to protect sansa in, in his yeah. own way yeah, so yeah. you can see that his decisions are his own Again, which is a good, which is one of the defining factors of a chaotic character. Yeah, definitely. So then we get the evil ones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So I think lawful evil. I think you get people like obviously Tywin Lannister. Yeah. Um, Roose Bolton. Yeah. Um, oof, like Tywin Lannister, who is just evil, isn't he? But he he's does lawful. evil things for reasons. He 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 has his very very sort of set idea of what he wants his family to be, what the the realm should be, who should run it, the way it should be run. And he will do anything terrible to maintain that. Like, he's evil because of an idea beyond himself. Like, even the way he treats his children, Tyrion, in, uh, like, it specifically, all of the justifications Tywin ever really gives for the way he treats Tyrion is because Tyrion is a disgrace to the family. He kind of disassociates it from his own reasons and his own choices and says, like, no, this is why. And in some ways, that's one of the interesting points about lawful characters is that they're actually not really acting based on their own impetus. It's a somewhat, their actions are somewhat hollow in some ways. Much like with Ned, mm. he was all about honour, but there were lots of things that went on in Ned's life, different choices he could have made, but he didn't. He didn't make them for himself. So he's somewhat disassociated from these things. Yeah. I mean, w one of the earlier scenes in Game of Thrones is when there's the bloke who escapes from the Night's Watch because of uh, seeing the undead. Yes. And he has to kill him. And it's like, well, I know what he's seen is horrible, but this is the law. Yeah. <laughs> but then he does have the thing of like, you know, if I'm going to en enact the law, then I need to do it with my own hand. Yeah. So he's, yeah. Uh, he's, yeah, he doesn't shrink from it and he's not a hypocrite. He, like I say, he's lawful. He actually sticks to the tenants for good or for, like I say, for good or for bad or for however it turns out. He's at least uh, consistent and has that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Integrity. Like mm. you can, like, for instance, like Tywin has integrity. 
Oh yeah, um, yeah. Whereas like um, to an extent, Tyrion doesn't have integrity. You know, he has some integrity, but he's not uh, doesn't have the same integrity that his father did. And when you break it down, integrity is simply just about how consistent something is. Yeah. So and then you've got neutral evil, which again so, these are these, these are always interesting. See, neutral aren't they? evil for me is um, Littlefinger. Yeah, Peter Baelish, uh, Craster, uh, Cersei Lannister is, yeah. I think, a great example of a neutral evil character. It's just like all that matters is me. It's like the ultimate selfish character, isn't it? And to hell with everyone else, you know, it's just like horrible characters are usually the uh, neutral evil. Because with chaotic, the idea is they kind of maybe can't decide or they just change their minds. Whereas neutral is just like, nope, this is just me. I am a flat line. And it's not because anyone's telling me to be this way or because I can't, yeah. or because I'm kind of conflicted. It's just like, no, this is about me and what I want to do. And it's not about anybody else. Um, I know to a degree, she sort of carries her father's philosophies in terms of talking about the family and this, but ultimately she just makes all of her decisions are selfish. She essentially destroys all of her children's lives based on her own feelings, not theirs. Um, and what she does to Jamie, or what she puts Jamie through and things like that. Yeah, I'm trying to think, who else is a good neutral evil character? There's the, um, I can't remember the name of the, the city, but when Daenerys gets to the merchant city, she ends up locking him in his own vault. Yeah. Like that guy, because that guy's all for self. And because he's all for self, he ends up trying to betray her, but it's not actually about betraying her or anything like that. And it's not for laws. I mean, he, he spouts about Marine. That's it. He spouts about the laws of Marine and this and that, but he, it's obvious that he doesn't really believe in that. He's actually, again, all for self. Um, so that's what he bases his decisions on. And that's why he ends up being sort of evil and, and betraying and so forth and so on. Yeah. And then you get chaotic evil, which is Joffrey <laughs> and, and like, uh, what's his yeah. name? The um, Bolton Bolton. bastard, what's he called? Ramsey. Ramsey, yeah, Ramsey yeah. Snow, there you go. Yeah, chaotic evil. So they're just like unpredictable. They're, Almost um, every act they commit is heinous, but their reasons yeah. just differ for it. Like they've got their own justifications for why they are what they are and they constantly change. I mean, this is like the Joker or someone like that, isn't it? It's just like a, yeah. a character who's unpredictable who just does bad things because, hey, it's a laugh. Uh, so, like, yeah, like the Bolton, you know, he just enjoys hunting women with dogs and mm. Joffrey ends up killing ends up, prostitutes yes, and torturing yeah. people and relishing in the horror of life, really. So mm-hmm. with all of these things, when you look at someone like Jamie Lannister, this is why these things aren't set. Characters can shift and can move. And it's all about... <laughs> A more of an interesting character when yeah, you do well, move. Jamie has remained chaotic throughout everything, but he's gone from evil to neutral, and now he's approaching good. Yeah, I find him the most interesting character because his arc has just been so compelling. Well, when, when um, he first pushes Bran out the window at the beginning, you're like, you are an evil son of a bitch. But then you get all the stuff with Brienne when he, you know, he yeah. loses his hand and he learns. His hand gets humbled and, yeah. Well, what, what his idea of honour is changes. And then the, the acts he commits in order to curb Cersei's bloodlust. Mm. And then his, the, big, the first decision he's made that points him towards being chaotic good is he leaves Cersei, doesn't he? He leaves the south to head to the north to try and help because that's what yeah. his conscience says. When I was coming up with the fantasy series that I'm working on at the minute, mm. it's like I knew that I wanted almost my character to go from she's a princess, but she's kind of reluctant. So she's falling from the neutral good. And then I almost want her to go on this negative arc. And so it's like going from neutral good to chaotic good and then almost to, yeah, it's like almost chaotic evil you know kind of almost at that level and then kind of going back so using this as a way to kind of think about the development of your characters and their arcs can be really useful i think there's a lot of food for thought there Mm -hmm. and remember you can check us out on twitter it's at jl cronshaw if you've not done so already you can support this podcast by checking out the stop booking around book it's available as a ebook a paper book a paper book. One <laughs> of those available... fancy paper books that I've heard so much about that I had in the past. <laughs> it's, uh, it's available in digital and analog formats. So you can buy it as a ebook, a paperback, or an audio book. 
so it's called Stop Booking Around, How to Overcome Author Procrastination, and it's got a lot of the stuff we talk about in this podcast in a more crystallized way. Join the Facebook group. We're on there. If you've got any questions, please do email me. It's john at johncronshaw.com. So until next time, cheerio. Bye. And I'm Russell Evans. Today, I think we need to have a mini celebration. I don't know if you've got your party poppers and those funny <laughs> little uh, blower things that go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're called, but uh, basically, Russ has completed the first draft of his first novella, which is awesome. Well done, you. <laughs> thank you, for, thank you very much. Well, I don't know. Well, even when we were just talking to it prior to recording, I think I feel like you were the one that's like the most excited, and I was kind of like, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's a thing, isn't it?" I did that. Yes, that is done now. <laughs> um, now it it is a massive achievement, Russ. How many first drafts have you completed of anything ever? Um, none. Well, one. Oh, now. Okay, one. yeah, yeah, you did that. You did that. <laughs> prologue story oh yeah. Story, yeah i didn't yeah. see for me that was just practice that's just like revving up to sort of get into what it takes to yeah. write now that you've pointed it out and i do feel a certain i suppose sense of um accomplishment based on the fact that i've that never ever managed to complete anything literally uh, literacy wise before and it had always been just full starts and such so yeah it is it is actually nice once i take a moment and take stock and it, it fills me with a certain confidence that by breaking it down into sort of piecemeal it's a well, lot more achievable i'll be honest i was very confused <laughs> when you called me the other day and you were telling me about how you need to hey you, you've come to a bit of a stop and you need to do this outline about the city and i thought that was like the end of the story and then it's just dawned on me this morning that actually you have finished i got it out of you <laughs> you finished this thing so i can't believe that you didn't realize that but no that's that's good and it's a bit like graduation day you know what i mean yeah you're at the top of your game you've done your first draft and now it's time to get into the real world because it's hard and it sucks and this is where it gets difficult so yeah <laughs> sorry yeah. i'm just knocking you down straight away <laughs> yes, that's all right don't worry <laughs> now this is this is actually the fun bit to be honest now what you need to do i mean maybe do an outline of your second book yeah kind of shelve this for a week or two just to kind of you know you've obviously had it so packed in your head for a while just let it rest now let Mm. it simmer a little bit um so yeah spend a little bit of time working on your outline for book two and then we'll go back to book one have a read through it and what you'll realize is that you've written something really terrible (laughs) this is rubbish it's a shitty first draft what did you expect? You know, of course yeah. it is. But now you have something to work on. And this is brilliant because every chapter, every line, every sentence, you can improve. You can add to. You can add more dimensions. You can add subtext. Now, I see it in a little bit of a way as your first draft is you telling the story. Your second mm. draft is you telling your story how you wanted to tell the story. And your third draft is telling your story in a nice way that sounds nice and reads well on a page and all that good stuff. So the second draft is, I mean, it depends on how you work, really. For me, I literally just sit there. I go from the start and I just, I almost rewrite every line. You know, I go through it like that. Some people do it in a different kind of way. Some people use spreadsheets and, you know, note down all the plot points and the value shifts in terms of whether it's, going in a positive or negative direction. You know, there's Mm. different levels of depth and analysis you can do on your draft. Yeah. And it's about finding the level that's comfortable for you. What it brings to mind in terms of the way I think about it is, you know, um, there's older books and and, and a lot of times some modern authors do it as well for effect. It's like chapter four, in which the hero, blah, 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 you know, discovers something about themselves. And, you know, that I've kind of had to think about it like that to keep it consistent uh yeah. flowing like 
through each sort of part. It doesn't have actually defined chapters. Um, it's more more Pratchett esque in that it's like here's a separation. And then we move on to the next bit. I don't know if that will work in the long run, but while I was roughing it out, it just helped because I just wrote continuously more in sort of um, tr- train of thought than sort of going, right, I've reached a point now where I know this has happened. So I know you said not to go back and read stuff. The difference is it, it wasn't like I'd written something that I thought was like, ah, this is what I want. This is exactly what I want to write. And then I go back and go, well, maybe it's not because it was so rough. And so bare bones, it was kind of like going back and looking through a plan and adjusting it at places. So it was easier for me to just sort of go, here's this section, page break, here's this section. It allowed me to just sort of identify those things and mark them out in my brain as to kind of, I don't know, the themes and ideas or or just like the little which cog in the story this is like what happens and what's important in this section like what does the character get out of it what does the reader get out of it in a way like we were saying about this whole first draft is the idea of the misdirection of the size of the world or the the nature of the world so i kept that in mind that and in each part i had to work to not play my hand too much and give away too much I tried to work it like that. I'd go back and have a look and go, right, yeah, no, that makes sense. It's not giving away too much, but it's it's drip feeding. And in this scene, we get to see that Dora's sort of a little bit more of her personality. So that's what this part is for. This tells you a bit more about Dora. And then this tells you a little bit more about sort of the other characters that she's now encountered in this scenario and, and what they sort of reflect and what they know. And, you know, because the, the reader only knows so, as much as the characters really so a lot of the people she's around are as almost as ignorant as her. And the only difference is the time they've spent there, which in some ways has made them more ignorant because they've lost that sort of questioning nature that someone as new to the underworld as Dora has still has. Yeah. So, I mean, with the next book, then you've got to really push home the magnitude of the city. Mm. And I think that's going to be a really important bit of your first chapter. So I don't know, there's, couple of good examples of this that i'm thinking of now i'm going to refer you back to our old favorite of padita street station yeah where the intro to that is the guy he's on the boat he's going into the city and you just get the feeling of just filth being thrown at you all the way through and all the details of that and then you've got something like i don't know if you've seen the film zootopia yes yes yeah that's a that's an amazing film for in terms of like scale isn't it yeah the first act of that is about a little rabbit in her village who goes to the big city and my god is it a big city when she enters and there's just a really cool set piece of her traveling on a train into the city and you just get the sheer size and scale of this thing and it's it's almost sublime you know it's just a real massive beyond her Mm. all these imaginings and Almost having that sense of awe is going to be what I think you need to capture in the next thing. Well, there's a thing, the, the way I think about it is a, um, it's a bit of a joke that uh, in sort of, in a certain artist community that I like, because I like giant robots. I love giant robots. I will always love giant robots. And so I, in, I like a lot of artists who, who draw mech and such. And one of the, the, one of the kind of things that's become, I suppose it's become a bit of a meme, is that you have to have birds for scale. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah how big is your giant robot put some birds in your picture and you'll know exactly how big your giant robot is <laughs> so yeah I, I know exactly what you mean and I'm trying to trying to figure out what those birds are in the sort of in this new part of the story because the, the this first novella which feels weird to say now it doesn't really have any birds it's very intimate in a way and enclosed even the setting where she ends up is in a forest it's in a grove it's it's intimate in nature it's it's secluded on purpose um and so then yeah i want to just like literally burn the forest down now and the idea of the city is that it is as big as a country Mm. or maybe bigger at this point that's not the physics but the the rules are put in place for the world is that because it's all run on this form of energy and matter, the idea I'd had is that every time a person comes to the underworld, the the land mass on which it's all based grows ever so incrementally. And the city has been there obviously since like the dawn of people and wondering if there was an afterlife 
it is grown over the, so hundreds of thousands of years and each time it's grown larger and larger and larger like the like the rings in a tree so i'm, I'm i've got these ideas of like i don't want it to be too hackneyed but like some of the first ideas i had were like you know if say warring japanese clans who all may have like may have ended up here they still have struggles and they still have battles but hmm. they can do that within the city because there are parts of the city that are like nations unto themselves. And it, I think it's going to be things like that that will help add the the birds. Yeah. Um, and of course, I will go back to this point again and again. Just remember, story, story, story. Yeah. Yes. You've got to get the balance in this one of your world building and your story and characterization. And remember that no matter how big and or inspiring your world is, it's got to be from the perspective of your characters. Yes. And it's it got to be in service of the story. They have to be experienced, like, through her. Like, so that's the thing. I don't, it's not going to just be sort of exposition. Like, she, she goes, oh, how big is this place? And then like, it, <laughs> it go, goes, well, it's blah, 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 so many miles across and blah, blah. It's, I would write, you know, when I say about that sort of, like, the idea of, of warlords, you know, it, it's the idea of that, like maybe she gets embroiled in something like that. You could literally have a moment where, because we've got to know Dora and she's got this kind of almost flat personality and doesn't react to stuff. If she goes in and just goes, wow, you know, that is actually going to say more just so it's like, it is almost like, okay, she's even awed by this, you know, once you've done a kind of vague outline then of this next book, figured out where your story's going with it. Have a look back because we. I'm just trying. To, yeah, we looked at the save the cat, wasn't it? So it was. Yeah. Have a look back at the save the cat, the beats, along with your outline, and just see whether you know you're still hitting those beats. If you're not, you know, you might have to write an extra scene here and there just to kind of make sure that things flow. I hear from writers who say they only like writing first drafts and everything else is just a chore. Yeah. And I think if you get into that mindset, it is going to be a chore. I think it's the opposite with me. You know, I it's love the details. Yeah, I, I love the details. I love the minutia. I love the geeky shit that I can kind of feel, honestly, a bit clever about having thought up. Yeah, and then it's the structure that, like, I'm like, ah, yeah, just, fuck, ah, just, uh, just kind of just not have a cool thing. Yeah. <laughs> just write little snippets of cool stuff. Um, but again, yeah. I think this is a symptom from writing D and D campaigns where your characters provide dialogue. Like your, the other players, you know, like, I don't have to do that. I don't have to give them personality. They've got their own personalities. Mm. I just have to give them cool vignettes and things to sort of bounce off. And that's, I think that's why this, like these drafts have been a struggle because of, if anything, I've, I'll like, I'll have a cool idea and I'll be like, Oh, and I'll go, no, stop. <laughs> just, just, just create the framework in which that will exist and then move on because. Yeah. 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 And you can start injecting this, this cool stuff, but. Again, always try and think of it in terms of how does this relate to the story. I mean, yeah, throw you can you can throw surprises in. There's nothing wrong with that. But I still want you to have this structure going through where it moves like a story. E- yeah, even if you throw in random stuff and random surprises, it's still going to follow this story now because you've got the foundations of it. So that's a good place to be. But yeah, the second draft is all about just really fleshing it out. Again, sentence level stuff don't worry about it okay mm. we're still not worried about the writing as an aesthetic thing we're still concerned with getting the story getting the world bringing up the emotion the things like patterns in dialogue and whether this pet sentence should be structured like this or that that's later on yeah now it's just about really fleshing this out getting all the little details in getting all the fun stuff we remember characters, we we remember emotion, we come away with feelings because the characters have felt stuff. So bring all that out, make it dramatic without being melodramatic, if that makes sense. So yes. don't do it over the top in terms of the drama, but you do need drama, you do need the reactions to be, let's say, a little less than as subtle as it'd be in real life. Okay, mm-hmm. so, yeah. you know, And remember, your reader, always go back to your reader as well. So we know this is going to be a young adult audience. How are things dealt with in something like a Philip Pullman? That's a good place to kind of look. I mean, maybe even in this time between revisiting your first and second draft, maybe read a classic in the genre 
So maybe read a Philip Pullman, maybe read his Dark Materials again, or, you know, another high fantasy, not to nick from, but to kind of get that feeling, get in that mindset again. So when you do revisit it, you can kind of draw on that as a bit of an inspiration. Yeah, I, yeah, I get you. Because I've stopped and started and stopped and started this process so many times, I had that first part of the story pretty well cemented in my head, or at least what its beats were, like what Dora's journey would be before she got to the city. And then after that, it was very much just the broad strokes. I think this part here is probably where I'm going to struggle because it's not going to be this thing I like to do, which is lots of cool moments and, and reveals. Cause that's, you know, a lot of the time the, the start of the story is sort of all about that, isn't it? Is the, the slow build up to the, the big reveal and, you know, you get little, little hints about what the world is and such. But now I've got to sort of throw her into this world that is so big that maybe I am as the person writing it, I'm still not, a hundred percent about like how much stuff is in this world and the the depth and breadth of it because of in a way i've like i've decided i don't know if it's ambitious or or if if that's the word for it but i'm trying to create a a city the size of a country remember our discussion about world building a few weeks back yeah we talked about there's a lot of stuff you can give the impression that you've invented and <laughs> yeah do you know what i mean you don't have to come up with a city you're not designing the city the city can be as big as you want it you can design a planet but you are going to get the impression of the size just by vague descriptions you can have a line that gives an idea about the size of the place and then you just focus in the area <coughs> that you're in this next section is about her deciding to become a ferryman so this next novella is I suppose in a way more personal to Dora, really more about her thought process because this first one is more about her sort of banging up against this world and her her reactions. Now it's all about she's going to have to think for herself and make some choices. And so I don't necessarily want it to be too much about having her decisions forced in a way the first novella was. This is more more about her experiencing the world coming up with her own thoughts about it and there will still be maybe an event or a, a couple of smaller events that sort of move her and her thinking in a certain direction or sort of make her realize the because one of the big things is self-actualization in this world is that you will exist for as long as you can self-actualize and make your own decisions and it's about her starting to learn that and i don't know whether it's going to be about she or maybe it's a mixture of like she understands starts to understand what the consequences are of not self actualizing. Um, yeah, well, she'll have learned that from the first book, so there will be a shift. It doesn't have to be a major shift, but her character in book two is going to be slightly different. Yes, she'll have learned from the experience of losing a hand. So, whereas in the first book she might have reacted in 20 situations in the same way, in this one one of those situations, she'll have to respond in a different way than she would have done just to kind of show well, that she's learnt or changed or something well, like yeah, that. Well, yeah, it's going to be more of a, I suppose, a fear in a way. Like, it's, but a, oh, no, I'm trying to, it's the thing, I suppose, in the first, in the first novella, she's, she's a stranger in a strange land and all she kind of really has, in a way, is primal fear and wariness of, of her surroundings and all she does is react. She doesn't really act upon that stuff. These things happen to her, and they elicit these emotions from her. But now going into second novella, she already she's experienced that, and she so she still has the residuals of these emotions. And it's going to be up to her to decide whether are those the things that are going to de- define her here. So you know she's still going to be a bit shell-shocked from her experience you know she lost a hand she's not just going to be okay with that she's going to realize that this is a world of consequences despite its weird dreamy nature and the fact that it seems like a lot of things are possible a lot of those things are also essentially just oblivion and losing yourself and i think that's what will drive her forward is how do i avoid that then like and what forms does that take in this world like it's it's not just a simple matter of like 
you vanish like is there something worse than just being dead or just not being around anymore like the idea of having your personality subsumed and such and i think that the more i thought about this cult that essentially this this guy had created i think that in a way that's sort of in a very pratchett-esque way it's like that's an unsanctioned cult and is sort of exiled from the city for a reason. But inside the city, there are cults that are legal and maybe just as bad or worse. But because of the nature of the city and, you know, every, everything has everything that runs and involves people has bureaucracy and rules. And as we well know, um, if you're smart enough or you know the right people, you can still create and maintain nefarious organizations that aren't necessarily good for their members those organizations cults whatever you want to call them can still function within a what is not an ostensibly say moral or ordered society so it's this idea like she might have she might have a brush with another similar thing and she might look at it and go well what's the difference because she's new and it's i wanted to this is where she starts questioning it really and making her own decisions and and as those and as she's becomes more aware within this this second novella like i say instead of being just buffeted along by these events and sort of bouncing off them she's starting to make her own decisions and her own ideas about them and and whether she agrees with them and mm. and and things like that and i i want really thinking about it now it's kind of crystallizing in my head is that i i want her to start to have stronger reactions to things that are her own and That's- that's good. Yeah, I think that's that's the key then because you're showing character development then. She's reacting stronger. She's more emotionally connected to her situation. And if she wasn't that in the first bit, then, yeah, that's really good because we always want this movement. We want the development of the character. The Dora of book one isn't going to be the same Dora. She's going to be different and the same as you go through. Mm-hmm. So, I think it all sort of give uh, give rise to a, um, although a, like a naivety, like in, I think in the first novella, she doesn't seem, she seems cynical and she doesn't seem naive because she doesn't have enough of her own ideas to be naive. But now being introduced to this larger world, I feel that almost like a rookie cop type thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like I'm coming to this yeah. world and I don't agree with this and I don't agree with that. And Fish out water story. Yeah. yeah, and like, oh, if I want to change it, I still have to be part of it. So I have to, I have to learn more about it off my own back and and think about what I can do. And that's sort of the ultimate, ultimately, her path to becoming a ferryman. Obviously, that will the path will be suggested to her, and it will be suggested to her as a form of sort of responsibility and so forth and so on. And obviously, she would normally she would normally shirk responsibility, but when she can picture it in her own way in her own almost sort of selfish ego driven way she's starting to grow more of an ego now and more of a sense of self i think that's what will make her gravitate towards being a ferryman and obviously that will still be part of a manipulation by inigo because that's what he wants for her but i feel like she's going to need to experience the sort of the good and the bad of the city in this next novella and then by the end of it make her final decision yeah yeah no i think i think that's good so i think your next step then is to do this next outline Mm. get this crystallized over the next week and then once you've done that and you're happy with it you need to start going back to your first book and redraft i think that's your next bit of homework (laughs) so yeah that'll be good i was thinking about our you know i really enjoyed our discussion we had last week about Game of Thrones and then the world building stuff the week before. I thought that was cool. Mm. Um, I'm just wondering if there are any other subjects like that you think we should discuss over the coming weeks while you're doing this? Or also uh, something I've always and not that it, my the my story isn't going to involve this because I don't think I'm actually good enough or skilled enough to involve it in a good way. But I've always really loved prophecy and prescience in in stories when they're done very well um, and they, they're they used not just as a crutch for the writer but as a, a means to subvert expectation. Cool. Um, 
So yeah, I'd really love to sort of go into a bit of that, and obviously I'll end up talking about June again. But um... <laughs> is there any prophecy for Dido Street Station? Should we go back to that as well? Um, I don't think there is, but you can also, I mean, prophecy and prescience is also can be the. I think the basics that are involved in it and the idea of subversion can also be applied to stories that involve time travel and when yeah. people are messing around with timelines. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I thought that when I think of prescience, I think of like Doc Brown when he comes in there. He, he comes at the end of Back to the Future and says, we need to go to 2015 to go and sort out your family because obviously he knows what's going on in the future. So, hmm. yeah, I think we can certainly have a good discussion about that next week. The other thing I just want to say is following our discussion on world building, we were on about Warhammer 40,000. Yes. And you mentioned the Horace Heresy books. Yeah. I've, I've read the first five. <laughs> <laughs> so 